character, known as the Baskerville family's hound, Bakir Van Baskerville, who was wrongly framed by his family and father even though he was loyal to them, was sentenced to death by guillotine. Bakir, at the moment of his death, thought to himself that if he were to ever live again, he would hunt down his prey no longer as a hound again. An unsettling scene is introduced to Vakir as he tries to make sense of his surroundings. Feeling that his body was heavy and in an unknown setting to him. He thought that he was in hell. In the grand estate of the Baskerville family, babies are seen in their cribs, crying and making noises. A man is introduced as the patriarch of the Baskerville family. He comments that the babies were insignificant. He walks through the room, commenting that the babies gathered this time were trash. As he walks he notices Vakir being silent as compared to the other babies. He orders the servants to bring the babies to the cradle of swords. The servants obey. Vakir recognizes the man as the main culprit behind his death in his previous life. Hugo Le Baskerville Seeing Hugo's younger appearance, the MC concludes that he had regressed to back when he was a baby. Recalling his past life, he was a hound, born from an illegitimate family, while receiving training in a poor environment. Hounds must be devoted to missions that include assassination, intelligence, ambush, and others. A hound simply takes care of dirty work. This was so that the Baskerville could remain the best amongst the seven families. The MC remained loyal because he wanted to be acknowledged by the family and Hugo. However, ten years after the gate to the demonic gate was opened, even with the victory of the humans against the demons, the reward our MC was given. Was being put down like a simple dog. The main reason behind his execution was that he knew too much. MC clenches his fist, swearing to never live that life again. MC wanted to take revenge immediately but was unable due to his baby's body. He rolls around angrily. He realizes that he needs to become stronger and that the Cradle of Swords was the perfect opportunity. The Cradle of Swords was a trial that every child in the Baskerville family must go through. Children are thrown into a maze of swords, where they need to reach the Styx River to be assessed for their talent. The Styx River was a legendary river that turns children's bodies into iron but is limited to the number of children it can affect. The MC recalls that the fastest route to the river was a straight path out of the helix-shaped wall of blades. The MC crawls past the swords, remembering that in his past life, he could not receive the effect of the river, making sure that this time was different. For men are watching, as the MC dunks himself into the river, wanting to keep it all to himself as long as possible. The MC begins to sink into the river. The water seeps into his wounds, being first had its advantages. The MC covers his mouth to endure as long as he can regardless of the pain. Two servants are shouting to the MC to come up of the water else he dies. Hugo simply laughs. He asks Barrymore, the head butler, how much time has passed. Barrymore replied that around seven minutes have passed. Hugo is amused at the fact stating that the MC might die since seven minutes have passed. Hugo calls out to the MC, asking him to come out. The MC ignores his calls and continues to absorb the power of the river with all his might. He loses control, and with his eyes gone white, he continues to endure the pain before blacking out. Hugo holds the MC by the foot, stating that staying in the river was enough for the baby and that he even drank its water. Hugo notices that the MC had already grown his teeth. Hugo asks Barrymore what the child's name was. Vakir Van Baskerville Barrymore replied. Hugo with a smile on his face speaks the MC's name Vakir stating a very greedy son had been born. While being upside down, the MC continues to plot his revenge against Hugo. Waiting to sharpen his canines for the time when he can rip his head off. Making the Baskerville family disappear into history. 
Vikir van Baskerville was known to be a genius at the age of eight but was considered normal in his family. At twenty years old, he took on the assassination, espionage, and conquest-type missions. At twenty-nine years old, he felt the limits of his swordsmanship compared to the others in the direct lineage of the family. At thirty years old, the demonic realm gate was opened. Marking the beginning of the demon's clan invasion. At thirty-five years old, he endured the era of destruction, slaughtering monsters left and right. At thirty-nine years old, the war came to an end with human victory. At forty years old, Bakir was finally rewarded for his loyalty. The reward is defamation, false accusation, and the guillotine's blade. Vikir opens his eyes, looking at the ceiling, realizing it was a nursery. He flips over in excitement as this meant that he had successfully absorbed the power of the Styx River. A servant approaches and places a box in the crib of Vikir saying why the madam would give such a thing. Vikir notices and wonders why anyone would give him a gift. The box opens slowly, Vikir is taken back, as a long dark figure slithers out of the box. The Vikir recognizes it as vipers called Bloody Mambas, thinking that the Madam sent those here to kill him. Knowing who Madam was as few were called that in the family. The vipers hissed at the Vikir. Vikir quickly grabs both vipers by the throat while smiling widely like a blood-driven hound as he expected such treatment from the Baskervilles. He strangles the vipers with force thinking to bring down the family with his own two hands. Blood stains are seen on the bedsheet of the crib. The next day, the servants are shocked, seeing the Vikir sleeping soundly whilst surrounded by the dead bodies of the vipers. Orders were given to execute the nannies after being tortured, who was on shift the night the vipers came but the reason for their appearance remained unknown. Only Vikir knew the truth. Eight years later, Vikir is sitting in class, listening to a lecture. The teacher talks about the different levels of swordsmanship. Sword beginners are those unable to use mana. Sword experts were those who could use even a little bit of mana. Sword graduators were those that could emit mana in a liquid-like aura form. The final level where aura is solid and its form freely changeable is called the Sword Master. He noted that the strongest member of the Baskervilles, Sir Hugo was at the Sword Master level. The children are in awe of this fact. Vikir thought to himself that he needed to regain his strength just like in his previous life before his coming of age ceremony. The teacher notices Vikir being lost in thoughts and highlights his achievements. Having a strong body due to diving in the Styx River for seven minutes. And that teaching him one thing would lead him to understand one hundred things being more talented than the others, knowing the patriarch would be happy with this. While Vikir thought of how long it would take to kill Hugo at the age of eight, a set of triplets grins widely as they stare at him. A hand shoves Vikir as he is called Garbage Van. It was the triplets. Having heard the weird rumors about Vikir being in the river for seven minutes and strangling two vipers when he was a baby, they approached him. Vikir remains silent as he recalls his memories of these three. Knowing that they were the ones to stab him when he was running away due to the defamation in his previous life. They were called the Hugo Le Baskerville Trident. We'll simply call them high, middle, and low. They shouted at Vikir to stop lying. Stating that they didn't like him. Knowing they'll be troublesome in the future, Vikir decides to put them in their place now. High points a knife at Vikir stating that his body was like steel since he was in the river for so long, making him immune to injuries from blades. High asked if he could test it. High calls low. Low covers Vikir's mouth to stop him from breathing, stating he would eat his hand if Vikir endures for three minutes. Vikir decides to play along with their scheme. One minute passes, as High and Middle believe that the rumor was fake. Three minutes pass, and they realize Vikir was good. Ten minutes passes, and they were too stunned to speak. They decide to let Vikir go. A crunching sound is heard as Lo looks at his hand, 
and blood appears. Vikir spits as low screams in pain. High and middle shout at Vikir asking what he was doing. Vikir, with bright red eyes, as he wiped the blood off his smile repeated that they said they would eat their hand. High and middle refute back by saying they weren't scared of Vikir but Lo was afraid as he held his bleeding hand. High and middle stare at Lo in disbelief. They attempt to leave to find a priest to fix Lo's hand but the Vikir stops them. In anger, High stabs Vikir in the stomach. Stating they were older than him. To his surprise, the knife didn't cut him. Vikir reminds them that being in Baskerville meant that power and talent are greater than age. High screams in pain, as Vikir twists his hand. Vikir, in hound mode, grins widely and tells them to play till the end with him. High, in pain, shouts that the rumors were true as Vikir lets go of his hand. Giving him a punch straight to the face. Middle and Low are shocked as High falls to the ground with his teeth broken and nose bleeding. Middle attempts to fight but Vikir simply kicks him to the side with no effort. Get wrecked son. Low stumbles onto the ground, shocked at what had happened. Vikir tells him to not be afraid as he'll get better in no time once treated. But warns him as he picks the knife off the floor, that he won't be leaving the room and that they had to live with the discomfort of their own bodies at this rate. Vikir offers one of them a chance to leave the room, as he stares at the knife in his hand. Lo asks which of them could leave, as the other two brothers hold their wounds. The knife is tossed to them as Vikir tells them to decide amongst themselves. Vikir slowly exits the room and mentions he can't wait too long and that it should be decided quickly. With blood-red eyes and a grin on his face, Bakir turns to them as the door closes saying at least one of them should live. As the door closes, the triplets are left in shocked, but soon stared at one another. Sounds of fighting and yelling could be heard behind the doors as Bakir stands to listen while smiling. The Trident of Baskerville have began to split. Barrymore reports to Hugo that another bloody situation have occurred with the Morgue clan in regards to the ruby mines. With the Morgue clan stating that it was theirs. Hugo says an opportunity in the future will allow them to discuss it properly and wonders what else was there to report. Barrymore reports that Vakir had scored the highest in the Titan exam. Hugo smiles happily at that fact and wonders when the practical exam will happen. In five days, guardian knights have left to prepare Barrymore replies, making the fortress vacant now. Barrymore further reports about the fight between the young masters. Stating that there were no deaths but that High's teeth were completely damaged, Middle's jaw was smashed in and Lowe's left index finger was amputated. They had recovered from their physical injuries but their mental state was damaged. Hugo is surprised to hear that the triplets were fighting amongst themselves as they were close with one another. Barrymore states that Vikir was involved, causing Hugo to be alarmed. Vikir is seen standing before Hugo and Barrymore. He greets Hugo as the patriarch. Hugo tells Vikir about how he disabled the triplets. Vikir replies that they had received the proper medical treatment since then. Hugo states that their hearts were disabled. The triplets were no longer eating or talking together anymore, making their combination technique completely torn apart. Vikir smiles in silent. Hugo asks if it was wrong that Vikir turned his brothers into a total mess. Vikir replies he was simply stronger and wonders if the stronger person is ever wrong. Hugo shares that his brothers had came before and forgiven him. Vikir recalls a past memory, where the youngest daughter of the family that Baskerville ruined paid Hugo a visit. She had become a nun and told Hugo she forgave him and offered him a mass. Hugo's response was as Vikir speaks it out loud that forgiveness is just an excuse made by the weak who cannot seek revenge due to their lack of strength. Vikir's eyes glow red as he spoke those words. Hugo is elated at what was said as he smiles widely. Hugo recites the family motto, only the strong will reign supreme, 
weakness is a sin. Hugo rewards Vakir by allowing him to take any snack from the food storage. Just enough for him to carry. Vakir is happy and asks for chocolate as he thanks the patriarch for the reward. As he turns to leave, Hugo calls him his son and to do well on the interim evaluation, not to lose to direct descendants. Vikir is disgusted at what he hears but replies yes my lord anyways. Barrymore introduces the infamous chocolate enjoyed by the Germans of the Morgue clan. Saying it's the highest quality which was hard to get. Vikir declines it, saying he needs cacao beans that have a rich aroma. Barrymore and the chefs were confused at the request. Cacao beans colored purple called bloody beans were given to Vikir. Each bean being able to produce 100 liters of chocolate. Vikir tastes them and is appalled by their taste. Barrymore wonders to himself, that Vikir must really like chocolate to each such bitter beans on their own and that he was brilliant for finding a way to get chocolate even with the restrictions placed by the patriarch. The chef asks if he wants to process the beans, Vikir declines and takes them as is. Barrymore wonders if Vikir had such peculiar taste. However, Vikir did not get the chocolate to eat but to use them in the practical exam five days later. Up in the mountains, Vikir stands, grinning widely knowing that a huge catastrophe would occur that has never happened in the clan before. Children of the Baskerville family are put through strenuous events and early education from a young age. Being able to take their first steps meant they had to run up a steep mountain. Never allowed to lie down or be on their stomachs. Time to sleep is only ever with a monster corpse to adjust to tough environments. When completed, they turn eight years old, starting their deadly evaluation. Bringing us to the practical evaluation which is a survival exam. The young masters are gathered in a territory far end of the Lo Rouge et Le Noir mountain. Pavlov, the instructor of the exam, instructs the masters on what needs to be done. Survive for one month while hunting large and strong monsters. Ten points were given for surviving. Thirty if they survive without being disabled. Failing others and surviving 50 points. Surviving after beating a monster, 70 points. If all conditions mentioned were done, 90 points. Stealing badges from others make their points yours. Dying results in 0 points. 100 points do not exist. Pavlov reminds them of Hugo's lesson that a swordsman dies when they become arrogant. He advises them not to leave the designated area as the mountain contains many undiscovered things. During the exam, shadow dogs will hide and grade them. Gossip spreads amongst the candidates as they talk of the rumors about Vakir. Wondering if he was going to be good at the practical as well. Vakir smiles as he remembers the mountain. The triplets avoid looking at him. Pavlov rings the bell, marking the start of the exam and praying for their fortune. The young masters instantly vanished, each with a plan of their own. The triplets argue with one another. The killing was not prohibited as it resulted in deducting points. Pavlov smokes a cigarette knowing that the shadow dogs will keep casualties to a minimum. A shadow dog is seen following Vikir. Wondering where he was going, looking forward to Vikir's skills due to his previous achievements since young. Vikir arrives at a huge tree, noting that the soft ground is best. He decides to live and take a break here as the shadow dog watches him. Shadow dog is shocked at him taking a break. Vikir gathers wood and is building things like in Minecraft as the others fight amongst themselves. The shadow dog is in disbelief as Vakir simply was gathering resources and wonders if he plans to just hide here. He decides to leave. Vakir takes note that he had left while reminiscing about the past. Before, a subordinate had told Vakir that cacao beans make fish less smelly and that bloody beans were the best. Vakir stares into flames and smoke knowing he had finished preparing. Deciding to start hunting as pits of spears are seen surrounding him. 
A few days have gone by as Vakir walks into the restricted area. Back when he was a scout, he could walk around here causally. He notes a burning smell and finds burning poop. Yes, poop is on fire in this world. Meaning only one monster has that kind of poop in this area. Vikir is happy to find what he was looking for. A beast with flames in its mouth stands above Vikir. It was a hellhound. The hellhound was a beast that swallowed the hellfires of the oil world. Causing its body to become one with flames. Vikir was barely able to defeat one at the age of 18 in his past life. Being eight years old now, it was impossible for him to defeat it now. However, Vikir thanks to his past life, he knew a way to beat it. He dashes towards the hellhound. Knowing that one of its weaknesses was moving in straight lines only, making it hard to change directions but easy to dodge. The hellhound is stunned that Vikir dodged. Vikir opens a bottle with water, spraying it across the ground as it was another weakness for hellhounds. They could not step across any volume of volume. This causes the hellhound to avoid the water on the ground as it runs towards Vakir. Thanks to the water, it exposes another weakness that all canines have, opening its mouth while running. Vakir takes a step back as the hellhound lunges at him with its mouth open, the exact moment Vakir waited for. Vakir flicks something into its mouth, and causally dodges the hellhound as it tries to circle back to Vakir. However, the hellhound feels something was wrong and stumbles to the ground whimpering. Vikir reveals that chocolate was poisoned to canines and since one bloody bean could make 100 liters of chocolate, it was the ultimate poison for it. The hellhound lays on the ground whimpering, unable to move. Vikir walks towards it drawing his sword, looking for where the ribs aren't present to target its kidney. The hellhound whimpers in pain as the sword pierces its body. Vikir does the final blow and a blue essence forms from the body. It was called XP or Karma, created when you catch monsters after energy accumulates in their body making them stronger. Vikir absorbs it, making the short sword he wields lighter. Vikir is happy as he'll be able to catch up to his regression state before he is of age. He wonders what Hugo's face would make when finding out that an eight-year-old, brought back a monster whose rate is B+. With this monster, Bakir secures first place in the practical test and has decided on what reward to get. The reward is a book that only he knew its true worth. Bakir proceeds to decapitate the head of the hellhound but senses a presence behind him. He turns to see four more hellhounds. He wonders if they came because of its cries and that they wanted to avenge it. Vikir chops off the head of the dead hellhound, excited at the thought of fighting more of the hellhounds as he had more beans left. However, a bigger presence is felt by the hellhounds, and Vikir notices. Believing the hellhounds to be afraid of his bloodthirst, the hellhounds bow their heads in fear. But hellhounds never submit even if they were to die. Vikir realizes something and turns around to see a three-headed figure. A Cerberus. Vikir is alarmed as it has a rating of A+, but it was supposed to be at the seventh ridge. Why was it here Vikir thought. Vikir notices wounds and blood dripping from its body. Multiple arrows with other injuries were inflicted upon the beast upon closer inspection. Vikir concluded that it was because of the barbarian tribes across the mountain as it was their territory and that it came all this way because of being chased by them. Vikir saw the chance of a lifetime. To hunt an injured A-plus beast. He must kill it no matter what. Vikir had been hiding his power, having mastered the third Baskerville technique and being at a high level as a sword expert. But he had already reached a level that no other hounds have reached when they had become adults. Vikir covers his blade in aura and dashes to the injured Cerberus. He attempts to slice one of its heads but was interfered with by its other head. He slices it in reaction. Upon slicing it, he realizes that killing it was possible. 
Due to the war with demons, Bakir was able to polish his swordsmanship and there was no sign of unnecessary movements to his techniques. Add on his strengthened body from the river sticks. All weapons Bakir worked against the Cerberus. But that was what he thought. Reality hits him hard, as the Cerberus lands a deadly blow on Vikir, smashing his sword to bits. Vikir lets his guard down for a moment, resulting in a deadly blow from its claws. Vikir is flung straight into a tree. He coughs blood as his eyes turn white from the impact, he suddenly awakens, thinking if he had lost consciousness after the direct hit that was dealt to him by the Cerberus as it walks towards him. He feels the pain in his left arm, making him think that his arm had been ripped out. He checks to see and is surprised to see his arm still intact. He thanks the river Styx effect for keeping his arm. The Cerberus readies for another attack. It dashes toward him, smashing the tree that was behind into bits, Bakir leaps out of the way before it could harm him. He thought to himself, even though his arm was still there, the damage still remained and that wouldn't be able to take a second hit. The Cerberus turns around. With the odds against him, he thought of the situation as a journey that every experienced hunter must find a way out of. He thinks of the best possible action to take and decides to simply just run away as fast as possible. The Cerberus was alarmed seeing him running away. It chases after him. Vikir thinks that he was lucky that the Cerberus was injured else he would have been torn apart by now as he continues to run away from it. He just has to make it past the iron fence, making him exit the restricted area. Vikir leaps over the iron face and readies himself to reach the place he had prepared beforehand as the Cerberus reaches the iron fence as well. If he was caught before reaching that place, it would be the end for him. The Cerberus rips apart the iron fence with its face, roaring loudly as it continues its chase. Dashing through the trees he looks around to spot the area. He notices a pile of wood in front of the tree, making it the area where he was supposed to be. He runs with all his might, just a little bit further he thought to himself. A bit more. He screams as the Cerberus chases right behind him. Realizing it was the perfect moment, he leaps into the air just as the Cerberus opens its mouth to attack. A single step forward onto a marking causes it to sink into the ground. Vikir lands on his back, safe from its attack, breathing heavily. While the Cerberus was met with many spears hidden in the ground below. He welcomes it to the cradle of swords. Wiping the sweat off his face, he was happy that the traps he made for hellhounds, were useful against the Cerberus. Bloody beans were spread onto the spears that were in the ground, being the same species as the hellhounds, the Cerberus was poisoned easily as its two heads cough vomit and are in pain. Its middle head notices Vakir, growling at him. As he holds a spear aimed at it and throws it with all his might. The spear bounces off its body as it growls loudly toward Vakir. Vakir starts to count down from seven. With each step the Cerberus took, a second passed. It slowly reaches Vakir, as the countdown approaches zero. Once it reached zero, it simply fell to the ground. Vakir lets out a sigh of relief as the Cerberus falls to the ground just before him. Happy to know that the rumors were true about the seven steps. He explains that the spear he threw was different. That it was laced with the poison of the bloody mamba's venomous fong from when he was a baby. He goes on to absorb the mana from the Cerberus, meaning that it was fully dead this time. He stares at its corpse, thinking about how he should bring it back. But before that, he had something else to do. He knew that the presence of a Cerberus meant one thing, dungeon. Since its gatekeeper was dead, the dungeon was free to be explored. Vikir proceeds to cover himself in dried soil, rotten leaves, and moist roots. Looking at its footprints and drools, he backtracks it. He walks to an opening, saying he found it. He enters the cave, recalling that the cave was meant to be discovered in a few years' time. He stares deep into the cave, 
feeling its mana underneath the rotten surface knowing that it has not been discovered yet. No light was given out, making the cave seem deeper than he thought. He smiles happily, excited at what treasures are laid within the dungeon as he slowly enters. As he walks further deep into the dungeon, Bakir notices red veins of ruby minerals throughout the area. Feeling that they were connected to the Red All Mountain. He notices light appearing before him, indicating that it was the entrance to the dungeon. The light shines brightly at him, making him cover his face with his hand. He enters a large room, and at the center of it was a floating red stone. Realizing that the dungeon's interior was bright due to the mana imbued into the ruby as he approaches the floating ruby. He notices something behind it, a skeleton with a note. Showing that someone had been here before him. He inspects the skeleton, seeing its injuries caused by stabbings and that there were dried brown bloodstains as he picks up the note on the ground. A long time has passed for the skeleton. Vikir reads the note and recognizes it as a Baskerville member's writing. The note reads that the writer did not want to reveal his name, and asks to be called Cain. The reason behind the note was to prevent other generations from doing what he did. Further explaining that the stone chamber was talked about in the family as a legend. His brother, Abel, and he had coincidentally came across this place, raiding the dungeon and its countless trials. They had killed many monsters before arriving at the chamber, to find the final assignment to the place. The final assignment tied their feet here for a very long time. Three years to be exact. Vikir can't believe that they stayed for three years, hinting that the brothers really wanted the treasure and that the final assignment was somewhere in the chamber. He looks at the stand of the floating ruby and sees some writing. When entering its one, but once inside its two when leaving its one was the riddle written on the stand. The note continues, with the brothers contemplating the ominous text forever until they came to a conclusion. The fact that they were twins meant that they were once one in their mother's womb, but when given birth they became two. Meaning to get the treasure they had to become one again and only one of them could leave with the treasure. After a fierce battle, Cain killed his brother and there was only one left in the stone chamber. But there was no change at all. Cain wonders why the treasure did not appear even after killing his own brother. He wonders why screaming. He decides to leave, wanting to tell others that found this place to leave immediately and that there was nothing to obtain in this devil's den that only serves to taunt humans. Vikir concludes that the brothers had done all sorts of things, only to leave empty-handed. Knowing that he had no twin, Vikir believes that the brothers had misinterpreted the text as he looks at the ruby. Thinking of the riddle once again. He thinks hard knowing that no dungeon cannot be beaten. Upon looking at the skeleton again, an idea comes to mind. Vikir figured it out. Stating that the brothers were unlucky due to being twins and that idea had they fixed to it. He mentions that the answer lies in the dungeon as he reaches for the ruby. Saying that when he entered the dungeon, he was one. But as soon as the ruby light was cast upon him, he was two due to his shadow. He smashes the ruby into pieces knowing that without its light, darkness re-enters, making the stone chamber open its final stage. The riddle answer was shadow. Pieces of the ruby that fell to the ground started to rise up, and energy from the rubies opens the passageway in front of Vikir. Vikir smiles happily as the final stage opens. Revealing a sword the relic of this devil's den, the cause of the brother's death. The sword glows red with an evil aura. The text below it states that only those with Baskerville's blood can wield Beelzebub. He was shocked to find that the sword was Beelzebub as he stands in front of it. He recalls reading a picture book during his childhood about the gluttonous fly, Beelzebub. Who was an unprecedented great monster had invaded the lands in the old legends as part of the devil's holy constellation called the Seven Calamities. To stand up against the seven calamities, the heads of each of the seven families took one each. The first patriarch of the Baskerville fought against Beelzebub. 
remnants of Beelzebub were stored in the lands of the Baskerville. Its demonic energy was said to lure monsters, an old legend that no one believes now. But the legend was true as the sword was taken by the demon clans resulting in countless deaths among the humans on the battlefield. Vikir grabs the sword in excitement saying that it won't happen again as the sword was now his. As he holds on to the sword, it lets out a ferocious energy as if it was howling. He grunts loudly as the sword seems to be absorbed by his hand. The sword places itself into Vikir's hand before appearing as a blade from his arm. He mentions that he was lucky to have a blade made from a devil's holy constellation as the blade exudes a murderous aura. His red eyes glow similar to the blade as he raises it to his face wondering how much stronger he'll be in this life. Looking around, he realizes that there was nothing else for him to take and prepares to leave. But he feels something was wrong with his body. He stumbles onto the ground, wondering what was wrong. Was he dizzy? No, he was hungry. The blade makes noise and Vikir wonders if it wants to eat something. He leaves the dungeon, holding his stomach in hunger. Hunger was ringing inside his stomach. Noting that his sense of smell had improved as he smelled something delicious. The sword pulls him along, much to his surprise wondering if there was something to eat in the direction it was pulling him to. He reaches the corpse of the hellhound he had killed before. The blade shoots out a tube into the corpse. As it absorbs the blood, Bakir feels his inside were getting back to normal, guessing he was starving for a long time. He hoped that the mountain's dried condition was not due to the sword's hunger and wondered how long it takes to feed it. Beelzebub makes a happy sound as it had eaten well and has absorbed the hellhound's ability, hemorrhage. Vikir wonders if this was Beelzebub's inherent ability. Beelzebub was the glutton of files and was said to possess the power to absorb its enemy's skills as its own. Since its absorption amount was close to infinite, many people lost their abilities and became obsolete. But due to its hazard, Bakir could absorb three skills only for now. He describes the Hellhound's ability as a skill that constantly pumps out the blood of its opponent even through its smallest wounds. Realizing he could steal abilities, he looks at the Cerberus corpse. Beelzebub grows excited at the thought of feeding on it, Bakir is alarmed and asks it to wait. He explains to it that it can't eat all of it as if it was too damaged, he couldn't explain it during the autopsy. He thinks silently as Beelzebub makes constant noises as it consumes the corpse. He slaps Beelzebub saying he had enough. Beelzebub was upset but had gotten two new skills. He had even absorbed the power of the sewer rat underneath the Cerberus. Vikir picks up the rat, happy that he had absorbed many powerful skills this time. He decides to wait at the practical exam site as he was done preparing the monster. The young hounds had gathered back together, each covered in various injuries. They would receive a shield sword or necklace as their reward based on the parts produced from the monsters they hunted during the practical exam as monster parts are laid on the table. The senior members are astonished at what Bakir had hunted. Hugo is alarmed to hear the news. Barrymore reports that Bakir during the practical exam had accidentally crossed over to the restricted area, allowing him to hunt an A-plus Cerberus. He further reports that it was wounded by the barbarian clan and that Vikir had applied poison to his wooden spear as Hugo mentions that a Cerberus was something that even the family's guardians would avoid. Hugo further asks what kind of poison could kill a Cerberus and where Vikir had gotten it. Barrymore mentions that the report did not include such details and wanted to ask Vikir, but Vikir had returned to the dorm as he was too tired. Hugo compliments Vakir saying he was so sly already and that information was power, and that power is your worth. Barrymore was shocked that a master named Van and not Lu or La was this talented. Hugo replies that he was unlike the previous leaders, he didn't discriminate against a hound based on its bloodline when raising them as long as it had enough talent and spite. Adding on that there were mutts that came from the royal bloodlines, asking if Barrymore understood him. 
Barrymore is concerned as he ponders whether Hugo was thinking about his second son who was preparing for isolation training as he apologizes to Hugo. Hugo says it's all right and asks for Vakir to be summoned. Vakir stands in front of them with a smile on his face. Hugo asks how he caught the Cerberus during the exam. Vakir says that he placed the chocolate on his wooden spear, saying that it was lethal to canine monsters. Hugo asks if that was the reason why he asked for chocolate before and Vakir says yes. Barrymore thought to himself if this is how fathers and sons usually talked to one another as they didn't greet each other. Hugo further questions Vakir on why he did not respond and the butler asked him about the hunt. He wasn't my master Vakir replied. Who is your master Hugo asks. The master of the clan since he belonged to the clan Vakir responds. Hugo is happy with the reply. He rewards Vakir with the corpse of the monster and grants him a wish. Vakir wishes to be granted access to the 10,000 Epistle Library. The 10,000 Epistle Library was one of the largest libraries in the empire and resided deep within the heart of the Baskerville clan. Hugo ponders, asking if he knew that only the Patriarch and Second in Command along with their direct descendants were allowed to enter. Vakir says that if it was not permitted, he would give up on it thinking that he needs to sneak in instead. Hugo grants him access, much to Vakir's surprise. He asks him to read the sixth technique of the family located within the sixth restricted zone deep inside the library. Vakir is stunned as he was just given permission to learn a technique that an illegitimate child was not allowed to. Recalling that Hugo's current level was the seventh technique and that in his past life, Hugo had reached the ninth. Remembering the discrimination he faced in his past life, Bakir promises that in this life, he will surpass Hugo. As he will obtain the greatest essence of Baskerville, a textbook containing the teachings of the first patriarch who subjugated the seven great disasters. Hugo stares at Bakir, looking forwards to his progress, and wishes him luck. He bows his head thanking Hugo and saying he'll surpass his expectations. Two guards stand in front of a large door. Vikir enters the room, leading to the library. He stands there saying it was the first time he came in person. He searches through the books, seeing the names of the books that he had wanted to learn in his past life. Knowing that any illegitimate child could not learn any of the advanced techniques to ensure that they do not bare their teeth towards their master, this was a defense mechanism the Baskerville family had created. A book is locked with a chain and he wonders if this was the book. Vikir takes out a key, not believing that Hugo would offer him the book on the sixth technique, an opportunity that was never given in his previous life. As he turns the key in the lock, he wonders if Hugo thought that he couldn't memorize the technique in a day. As he reads the book, Bakir recalls that due to his past life, he had memorized the theory behind the first or fourth techniques till he was sick of it. He did it so that he could deduce and speculate the theory behind the fifth technique. Believing that he needed to stop the flow of mana after drawing the fourth tooth, he wonders if that was the reason he could not make the fifth tooth. According to the Baskerville swordsmanship, one tooth represents the first technique and the second tooth represents the second technique, and so on. When drawing a tooth, a red sword energy appears. Vakir flips through the book, stating he didn't care about the sixth technique and that the real reason he came here was different. He returns to the guards, who were surprised to see him come out of the library already. They asked him if he had left something outside and that they were getting it for him as well as that there were more books about swordsmanship deep within the library. He tells them that he had finished what he came here for. The guard asks if he wants to stay longer but he declines and wants to read other books and that they should do what they need to do in the meantime. As Vakir walks to the spiral staircase, the guards whisper to each other saying that the place he was going to only had miscellaneous books and that if they were Vakir they would be busy reading the books deep within the library. They wonder if Vakir didn't know the worth of the books, but Vakir chooses to leave them to their thoughts. Knowing that they did not realize the true value of the books in the miscellaneous section. 
He reaches the next floor and looks around the books, noticing one that stood out. He found it, the book called A Lurking Ambush. Vikir is happy to find it. He opens it to see a ripped page and that due to it, it became a useless miscellaneous book. He grins widely as he was the only one that knew its true worth. Recalling a memory from before his regression, Bakir belonged to a squad that had found a strange relic in the dungeon that was on the border of the Lur Rouge Etilunwar mountain. It contained a page from a swordsmanship book. A single ripped page. Written with Baskerville handwriting, only Hugo found this remarkable, ordering everyone to search through the whole library to find the book that matched the page. The book was a lurking ambush. The same one that Vakir was holding. The book contained the tenth technique that the ancestors had written. Further recalling that Hugo had gone crazy for the tenth technique and released the hounds to find the remaining six pages that contained the technique. Hugo realized that the pages were hidden in the seven great families, declaring war on them and sending hounds to those that refused. After sacrificing many hounds, all pages were given to Hugo. The reward for doing so was Vikir's death. Vikir grew angry as he recalled those unpleasant memories as he holds the book, knowing that once Hugo achieved the ninth technique it resulted in piles of hound corpses and blood. He makes sure that it won't happen in this life. The pages that Hugo got, were all given by Vikir, allowing him to remember the content that was written on each page and that the reason he could not go past the fourth technique was the lack of access to the original book. Vikir reads the book, realizing that without the other pages, the book made no sense but the moment you had all the pages, the book would turn into a masterpiece. He reminds himself of his past strengths as he reads the book, knowing that before he turned fifteen he had to reclaim the power he had before his regression. Night turns to day as Vakir immerses himself in reading the book. He closes the book, having read enough. Wondering if he had read the whole day, but thanks to that he was able to memorize the book's contents from start to finish. He looks around and does not feel the presence of the guardian knights. He closes his eyes and imagines a figure standing before him. His arm glows with a red aura. He opens his eyes and strikes the figure before him using the first technique. Continuing the strikes and moving on from the first to the second technique and more. He grits his teeth as he thinks of his past self as pathetic. He worked hard to reach the highest level of graduator aura but was unsuitable to learn a proper sword technique making the direct bloodline hostile to him. The main reason was that he was an illegitimate child. He dashes to the side of the figure once again, asking if they thought he would live the same way again. As he approaches the figure, it transforms into the older version of Hugo. Vikir slices Hugo relentlessly and exits the imaginary space. Breathing hard, he looks at his hand, thinking he was still weak and if he actually drew out the fifth tooth. He clenches both his fists in victory at the feat he had just done and felt happy to the point that he almost cried. He continues to look around, wondering if a sword was nearby to test the fifth technique again. Breaking records in Baskerville history, a young hound's canine teeth bared towards his master were growing. Finally succeeding in drawing the fifth tooth, Vakir believes that he could reach the level he was at as long as his mana could support it. Smiling happily, he notes that his mana capacity had increased and reached another level. A red liquid aura covers his hand, showing signs of a graduator. Vakir had gone from a high-class sword expert to a low-class graduator. A point that had taken him thirty years to reach, but he reached it at eight years old now. Graduators are on a whole different level compared to sword experts as their aura turns from solid to liquid, density increases, and allows for it to be used more freely. Knowing his swordsmanship was better now and that he could reach the tenth technique, meant endless possibilities. Piercing Fong was what he learned before, which was able to make him stronger in a short period of time but had limitations. However, the lurking ambush was the perfect sword technique that could transition between offense and defense with no growth limitations. 
Bakir places the book near the window, thinking that he could challenge a mid-class graduator and has a 100% chance of assassination and about 50% if they faced head-on. The only problem he had now was how much to show Hugo. He couldn't show too much or too little of his strength as he takes out an object from his pocket. He places it in front of the book, using the sunlight to make a small fire on the book itself. Vakir grins to himself at what he just did. The book is set aflame as he makes it impossible for other to reach the tenth technique and that he was the only one that knew how this time. The guardian knights appear behind him, asking what the smell was. They question Vakir, and he replied that he accidentally left the magnifying glass around and burnt the book. The guards are relieved to hear that only a useless book was damaged. Vikir asks the guards if they should bother with such a small thing since there were bigger problems to handle. The guards agree to keep it a secret if Vikir agrees. Vikir agrees and proceeds to leave. The guards are happy and think of him as a nice person deserving their respect as he walks away with a smile. Vikir appears before Hugo and Barrymore once again. Hugo asks if he had reached enlightenment. He replies sort of. Hugo asks what he had learned, and Vakir mentions that he felt something warm and sharp yet soft and viscous. Both Barrymore and Hugo are alarmed at hearing this. Barrymore wonders if it was an aura. Aura was something that only fifteen-year-olds could obtain after years of training. Hugo thinks to himself about why he was getting excited for over an eight-year-old and asks Vakir to show him. He accepts happily. An arena is showcased. Many young masters are confused as Vakir is seen standing with a sword. Barrymore asks Hugo how he intends to test his skills. Hugo replies that a monster will be released. The gate opens and a huge orc exits with chains all over its body. It growls loudly with menacing red eyes. Other young masters in the stand are shocked to see it as they wonder if an eight-year-old could take on an orc by himself. Vikir and the orc are standing face to face. Hugo waves his hand, signaling to the knight to remove the orc's chains. It screams out powerfully and rushes towards Vikir. Vikir takes a prepared stance as it comes towards him. With a calm expression, he slices the orc's arm off with a single swing. Everyone was shocked at what happened. The orc is stunned at its wound. Vikir wastes no time and dashes low to swing at its leg. He slices it off in one strike again, causing the orc to fall to the ground. The orc remains confused at what happened to it. Vikir looks back, thinking that the orc was confused about why it was bleeding for the first time and that its regenerative skill won't activate. It was due to the skill of the bloodhound. It overpowered the orc's ability. People in the stands are wondering how he was that strong. Hugo stares, thinking deeply. Vikir looks at him, knowing he was trying to determine what he learned in the library, and proceeds to show him what he wants. Hugo and Barrymore looked alarmed. Vikir had revealed Aura Blade as his sword is covered in a strong red aura. The orc tries to get up. But senses a red presence approaching it. Its head was smashed to bits as Vakir slashes through it like butter with a quick dash and his sword was covered in the aura. Hugo is shocked from his seat from seeing that red aura from Vakir. Barrymore congratulates Hugo on witnessing the birth of a genius, making Hugo wonder if that was it. Barrymore further states he had not seen this kind of talent from the other families, Hugo stops him noting that something was wrong with the orc. Seeing its blood not stopping even though orcs were famous for its regeneration. He pushes Vakir's victory as a result of the orc being weakened while Barrymore wonders why he can't express his happiness. Vakir calls out to his father and asks if there was anything stronger with a smile on his face. Surprising Hugo. He tells his father to wait asking with a smile if there was anything stronger than an orc. This shocks the crowd. He thinks that it would be better to show off his power to a certain degree, hoping that his progress will allow him to be separated from Hugo. 
Hugo agrees with Vakir and asks for a creature that they captured from the barbarian raid to be released. The beast was starving since then. The crowd is shocked once again. But Vakir looks happy. A troll was his new opponent. It growls at him. Vakir asks Hugo if he could start right away, Hugo says he may. He rushes to the troll. The troll attacks Vakir with a mighty punch. He dodges and is annoyed. And decides to back away from the troll. The crowd is confused by his actions as it was the perfect moment to attack. Hugo agrees with his actions and that it was the right move due to the troll's regan powers. Vakir continues to dodge its attacks. The troll begins to breath heavy. The crowd calls Vakir a genius at eight years old and that his plan was to tire the troll out first. Vakir thinks that it's too slow and that he needed to act but is unable to unleash his full power as it would make it troublesome for him. Instead, he decides to use the troll's power against itself as he slices its arm. The troll falls to the ground, holding its bleeding shoulder. The crowd praises Vakir for what he has done. Vakir thinks that the first technique was not enough to slice the troll thick skin. Hugo asks him to stop as it could become dangerous but Vakir tells him he was almost done. He realized that he was getting an epiphany and that he'll give up if he can't kill it in the next attack. The troll growls in anger. He releases his red aura, preparing for an attack. The troll yells at him as he stood still. But it realizes something from him. A deadly aura and image was seen as from Vakir. In the next moment, the troll was sliced in half by Vakir as he unleashed the hound's aura. Everyone is stunned at what happened. Even Vakir was shocked at what he just did. He laughs saying he did it. Hugo and everyone in the arena could not believe what they just saw. A week later in the dining room. Vakir is upset over the food. He turns to look around, realizing that everyone has been avoiding him since the day of the arena battle. But he was happy to see Hugo's stunned face. And that he had only shown a small part of his power to them but was actually more powerful. He had also gained the super speed regeneration skill from the troll. He thinks about the fact that he has been eating more with Beelzebub as the triplets appeared behind him. He readies himself. Vakir asks the triplets if last time was not enough but them claim it was not what he was thinking. They wanted to tell him he was cool when he defeated the monsters, causing Vakir to spit out his food. The triplets ask if he was okay as Vakir thinks it was some sort of scheme. Just as he was feeling goosebumps at what they said, Butler Barrymore appears. Telling him he needs to go to the Patriarch Room. Back at the mansion of the Baskerville family. Hugo is seen chatting with the Morg clan patriarch, Adolf Morg. They talk about the annual training event between the families, hoping no accidents would happen. Hugo tells Adolf that it was just a scratch and that the Morg's children were dramatic, Adolf said it was because they were noble and dignified. The Rion Mage clan, the Morgs, and the Iron Blooded Sword clan, the Baskervilles. They were not always on bad terms, the Emperor said that magic and swords were a pair. Because of those words, the two families would have annual joint trainings as a sign of good faith between them. However, a ruby mine between the two families' land was discovered, causing a problem of who owns it. Adolf asks if there was a supernova in the Baskerville family that was born with great blessings and skill and Hugo brushes it off saying it's not a big deal. Adolf is surprised to see Hugo reacting to a compilment of a child. He then tells him that the Morg family also had a genius, he calls for Camus to come in. The doors open and a little girl walks in. Hugo looks at her. Adolf introduces her as his sister's Respinese daughter, Camus. He tells her to greet Hugo but she remains silent. Instead of greeting, she calls him a thief that stole the ruby mine and that he should give it back. Hugo was angry to hear the word thief. Adolf is surprised at her words and she told him that it was what he said in the carriage and that the annoying chin beard stole the ruby mine. The words annoying chin beard further annoys Hugo. Adolf says it was a misunderstanding and Hugo agrees saying it she was just a child. But Camus shouts at Hugo to give back the rubies as she doesn't have enough to do research. Enough! Hugo says as he holds back his anger. 
Adolf holds Camus tightly asking what Hugo plans to do to the child as Hugo states that the morgues didn't teach manners at all. Adolf asks if he was threatening an eight-year-old girl. I guess the morgues didn't teach their children to not envy what is others. Said by Vakir as he enters the room. Adolf wonders if Vakir was the supernova and realizes that Camus was missing. Camus appears in front of Vakir asking what he just said. Vakir hears her name and recalls her as the morgue's clan iron-blooded empress, Camus Morgue. She was known as the genius among the genius even in the morgue clan that raised countless mages, at her peak she killed all monsters and barbarians in the Lunoir mountain by herself, burning them to death on spears creating her legend. Vakir also remembered that her beauty was captivating. Camus yells at him, saying that the ruby mines were hers and not his. You sure came a long way just to throw a tantrum, Vakir replies. The leaders notice something. Flames erupt from Camus due to the word tantrum. She tells him that he'll explain why the ruby mines belong to her so that a stupid dog could understand. Vakir simply smiles saying that would be fun. A replica of ice is made. Everyone in the room was surprised by this. Camus says she'll explain it. Vakir was upset as he expected them to fight. She explains that the ruby mine was located in the area between the morgue and Baskerville called Joint Security Area and that the problem was that the entrance was located in the morgue area but the mine runs underneath the Baskerville area. Adolf was happy while Hugo became upset due to the explanation. Vakir adds on saying that the Baskerville doesn't need to mine the rubies as they were meant for magic ingredients. But he calls her an idiot as no one would allow someone to enter their lands based on a few pennies. Hearing this made Camu angry, she points to the sculpture pointing to which side belongs to each family. She moved her arm across both areas, asking whose arm is this then? Vakir repeats her question back to her and grabs her arm. Mine of course Vakir says, making Camu blush. She stutters wondering why she was his. Vakir tells her who said your mind much to her surprise. He grabs the knife. Shocking Adolf and Barrymore. He smiles while showing the knife saying that only her arm belongs to him. Both Hugo and Camus are shocked at what he said. Vakir holds her arm high, ready to cut it with the knife. Camus tears up and screams for her uncle to help. Adolf appears behind Vakir in an angry state, telling him to get away from his niece now. He lets go of her arm allowing her to run to her uncle and hug him. Adolf yells at Hugo saying what the hell is this matter, Hugo remains silent and turns to Vakir. He tells him that he has gone too far with his joke, Vakir apologizes saying it was a common joke in the family and that the knife was fake. Adolf was shocked to see that toy knives were given to children as Vakir bows down to him, saying he was sorry. Hugo tells Adolf that he was getting too involved in the children's play and that he had some ideas regarding to the ruby mines that he should hear. He tells them that they should compete in friendly duels first as Camus tells Vakir that he better watch out and she won't forget this. Vakir simply smiles and nods. The friendly duels between the Baskervilles and Morgues had begun. It was an occasion where children ages 8 to 15 gather and battle it out. However, everyone's attention was headed somewhere else this year. It was the Morgues clan Camus Morgue against the Baskerville clan Vakir Van Baskerville. Using practical training rules was to showcase the duel between the two geniuses of the clans. The bells rings announcing the start of the duel. Camus tells him she won't hold back and begins to cast a spell. Everyone was stunned at this. She was doing quadra casting. Adolf smiles at Hugo as the crowd were amazed that Camus was doing something that was difficult for a 15 year old. Camus unleashes her attacks but Vakir dodges them with ease. He tells her she should focus on one spell but she calls him an idiot who doesn't understand magic. She summons a stone wall just as Vakir reaches her. He simply smashes through the wall. Camus was shocked to see this wondering if this was the power of the Baskerville basked in the river sticks. She closes her eyes and opens them again. And sees Vakir with his hand out. He flicks her straight in the head, sending her flying. Adolf was surprised to see a flick while Hugo chuckles. Camus asks him why he flicked her and wonders if he was going easy on her. He points to his forehead saying hers might hurt. 
and that they should end things before it gets out of hand, but she ignores him and summons two stone walls. She laughs at him behind the two walls as the cure wonders if he should just go around it. He decides to play along and smashes through the wall with just his bare hands. Camus is startled to see his hand come from the wall. The cure now asks her whose arm it was that crossed the wall. And tells her as he flicks her forehead, the stronger individual. He smiles as Camus falls down again from the flick. With a huge red bump on her forehead, Camus holds it and growls at him. She yells at him saying she'll kill him as Vakir dodges the fire spell and wonders that dealing with children is much harder. He continues to dodge her attacks, wondering what he should do to calm her down. Vakir looks behind, wondering if he should let others handle the problem. Another duel was happening right behind them. It was a pair of idiots that keeps casting fire magic and a swordsman that slices magic. He believes that they might be useful as Camus shouts out why he wasn't getting hit. She walks to him asking him not to turn away and to face her. The idiot mage behind begins chanting a magic spell. Giving Vakir the perfect moment. He calls out to Camus. Telling her that she better have a defensive spell ready as a huge fireball appears behind him. Kemu couldn't believe what was in front of her. Adolf shouts no. As a huge explosion is seen, everyone gathers around the scene of the explosion. They all call out to Kemu, shouting her name. Kemu hears her uncle's voice in the dust and smoke. She thinks about what to do as she managed to defend against the attack, but something else had happened. The flame spell had burned all her clothes. She knows that everyone can't see her because of the smoke but once it clears up, she'll be the laughing stock of everyone. She calls out in her mind for someone to help her, and soon a jacket lands on top of her head. Camus was surprised to see Vakir as he tells her to put on his jacket. Covering herself with the jacket, she asks him why he wants to help her, Vakir says he just wants to. She thinks to herself why this idiot would help but notices something. Vakir had been cut by the idiot swordsman attack which still have some ore on it. The people enter the smoke and notices something. Vakir and Camus were together. Adolf was relieved that Camus was fine while Hugo remained silent. The crowd realizes that Camus was on the floor, while Vakir was bleeding. And that he was extremely fit based on the muscles on his body which shows the amount of training he had done. Adolf hugs Camus as she remains silent as she stares at him. Back at the mansion, Hugo asks Vakir how the battle was against the Lady of the Morgue clan. He tells him that he had understood the reason behind the event once again while Hugo tells him that a battle between a mage and swordsman are different. He further asks why he didn't go for a clear blow but Vakir tells him that he had no idea on how to deal with a lady. Hugo tells him that he had let his guard down and that the wound on his arm was a lesson. Vakir was shocked to hear that Hugo was worried about him. He remembered from his past that Hugo was so cold, so strict, and so brutal because he had lost his first wife and eldest daughter. But he thinks it's not his problem as Hugo asks him what they should do with the ruby mines, he tells him that they should give it away, Hugo asks why. Vakir explains that the main purpose of the Baskerville clan was to grow its territories and that the monsters and barbarians near the ruby mines are a problem and that they should utilize the Morgue clan well to deal with those problems which helps to minimize their losses with the expansion into that region. Hugo tells him that he was right. Vakir further explains that once the Morgue clan claims the ruby mines, all they need was to push the monsters and barbarians into that region, allowing for them to take care of all the problems at once. Hugo likes the idea that the rubies will be bathed in the blood of their enemies and that the Morgue clan will think twice before entering their area. He rubs Vakir's head telling him that his idea was 90% aligned with his as Vakir thought to himself that the idea was originally Hugo's idea from the past. Vakir tells him that they needed to keep an eye on the morgue's movement, Hugo tells him he had increased the number of hounds scouting the area. As they walk further, they encounter Adolf and Camus waiting for them. Adolf asks if they could talk once again before they return. As Camus blushes while hiding behind Adolf. Back at the room. Hugo asks what they wanted to talk about, Adolf tells him he needs to mention one thing. He wanted to discuss other ways to resolve the issues of the ruby mines other than paying for it. Adolf suggests an engagement. An engagement between the Morgue and Baskerville clan, 
Hugo asks which child did he have in mind. Adolf proposes the eldest son of the Baskerville and the eldest daughter of the Moore clan, Camus, he praises her saying she was the best. Hugo tells him that the eldest son was 25 and about the age gap. Adolf tells him the 17-year gap is not too big of an issue, but Camus speaks out saying she will not marry anyone weaker than her mother. Adolf tells her that she might remain single all her life due to her condition but she remains absolute about it, Hugo tells her that this wasn't a buffet of her choosing. She tells him firmly that she has no intention of playing around either and looks in a certain direction. Both Hugo and Adolf look in the same direction. It was the cure. Adolf couldn't believe what he was seeing. He whispers to Camus, telling her not to think about Vakir as he was just a small fish in a big pond and only had the van surname. Hugo hears it and is slightly pissed off. He speaks out saying that an engagement should involve the people's thinking, asking Vakir what he thought. Vakir and Camus simply stared at each other in silence. He opens his mouth slowly and tells them that he accepts. Adolf is confused and angry at the bastard, the cure. Camus is happy to hear that the engagement was not rejected. Hugo tells Adolf that just because the cure did not have the name Lou, he assures him that he was a talented child. Adolf stands in front of the cure, judging him. The cure recounts his memories of Adolf Morg, he was a six circle master and one of the strongest in the Morg clan and a great supporter of his niece. Adolf tells Vakir that not just anyone can be the husband of Camus. He grabs Vakir's shoulder wondering why he wasn't responding and why his body was so sturdy. Vakir tells him that he wasn't listening to what Adolf had said. This surprises Camus and made Hugo chuckle lightly. Adolf laughs and asks Hugo if he could have a deeper conversation with Vakir. Hugo wonders if the mage of the empire was gonna scold an eight-year-old child. Adolf replies that this was a request as an uncle while Camus tells him he doesn't have to do this. He gave a bombastic side-eye to Camus, telling her she better stay still and that this was bound to happen to someone else eventually. He then asks Hugo for the chance and Hugo agrees. Back at the training arena. Hugo and Camus are standing at the side while Adolf and Vakir are in the arena, Adolf tells him that they will be testing Vakir and wants to see everything he's capable of. Vakir agrees while thinking if he did show everything, Adolf might faint. Adolf casts a spell telling Vakir he will give him a handicap. A pot was being created from a combination of spells. This amazes Camus as Adolf was casting fire earth and water magic perfectly. He tells Vakir that they would duel with a pot of water on his head, and that if a single drop falls, it would be his victory. Vakir remains silent thinking that this chance was a great way to experience the power of Adolf and what he's capable of. He looks at Hugo, knowing what he thought was the same reason why Hugo accepted this. Adolf calls out to Vakir to start the duel. Making Vakir rush out. He closes into Adolf, ready to strike with his sword. Camus is surprised at his action. And yells out that he can't run straight towards his uncle as a bright light appears on his face. A shield was casted to block the swing of his sword. Adolf calls out to his niece asking why she told him that and that shield magic was best used against swordsmen. Vakir steps back annoyed. Fireballs are created in the air behind Adolf as he prepares to go on the offense. He sends out the flame magic towards Vakir, making him leap back. Kemu calls tells him that it was unfair he didn't use that magic against her in their duels, while Adolf wonders which side she was on. Hugo thinks of the attack as not something impossible to dodge and decides not to stop them. Vakir thinks that by using his past knowledge and skills, he may cause Adolf to let his guard down. And that he might even be able to kill him. He strikes hard once again against the shield magic. And continuous hits it again and again. Adolf tells him that it'll be the same no matter how many times he hits it as his sword will never pierce through his shield. But Vakir ignores his words striking the same place over and over again. Cracks begins to form, making Adolf realize that Vakir's swordsmanship and machine-like movement was impressive. But his sword was chipping away as well. A final swing causes the sword to shatter into pieces. Adolf reminds him that he should have considered the durability of his sword and his shield. And that it's good to focus on a single goal but that depends on the opponent, 
While those words were said, Hugo and Camus were shocked by something. Adolf continues to say that Vakir was too weak, but before he could finish the sentence, he notices something as well. A piece of the sword has pierced the pot on his head, causing water to flow down everywhere. Adolf was stunned to see a piece of the sword. Vakir flexes on the old man in his in fashion. Camus falls for Vakir even harder. She wonders if the victory against his uncle meant their marriage. Hugo was happy to see that Vakir had one. He looks at Vakir van Baskerville. Wondering if he had raised a stronger hound than he thought. Seven years later at the Baskerville training grounds. A huge furry beast with horns is growling loudly. It roars out loud, shaking the air around it. But the hound stood still, unafraid of it. It rushes towards them. Making the hounds leap in the air, striking the monster. The hounds surround the beast, as the beast strikes all of them. Staffordshire Baskerville was the shadow hound looking upon them. He shouts out commands and tips on how to kill the beast. When all of a sudden, three hounds dash forward past everyone. It was the triplets, they strike the beast easily. They smile happily at what they did. The intruder was amazed at their skills and dark crimson aura which was suited to the Baskerville family as the monster stood in a daze from their attacks. The hounds see the chance and prepare to kill it. Blood is splattered all over the ground. The instructor praises them, telling them that they had become low-rank sword experts and that this marks the end of their seven-year training. He warns that while this monster was caged, even he cannot handle the older ones that were more tenacious and that the monster they face today will be incomparable to the ones they will face in real life, and that death occurs much more easily than they think. He gives them one final advice, they either use your bloodline to overcome it or build experience to survive. He salutes them, congratulating them on their graduation and wishes them good luck in the future. The graduates discuss amongst themselves on which order of the Baskerville they wanted to join, as the family had seven. Each of the order represented a different job from watching, searching, guarding, assassinating, suppressing, all-out warfare and others but they soon wonder about a certain someone and what he would join. It was Vakir van Baskerville. Vakir notices that others were looking at him, hearing the rumors that he had killed a larger ox bear than the one they faced and that he was already a high-rank sword expert. He ignores the gossip and thinks that it took longer than he thought. H.I.'s current level was at intermediate rank at the 5th Baskerville technique, but only considering swordsmanship, he had surpassed his past self but he still thinks his progress was too slow, as Barrymore appears telling him that the Patriarch was looking for him. Barrymore tell him that his assignment had been decided. Back at Hugo's room, the cure greets him. He asks how he had been. The cure notices a scar on his nose and asks what had happened. Hugo tells him he got it from subjugating the barbarians on the mountains and that one of the archers got the better of him. The cure asks if he had captured them but Hugo tells him no. Instead he gave a similar scar her face. Hugo congratulates Vakir as he wonders if he was going to talk about the assignment. He recalls his past life that there was part of the Pitbull Order and was sent away for twenty-one months on the Lenoir Mountain, constantly in battle. And that children in the family were split apart, expendable ones were sent to die in battle, while the important one were taught about politics and administration. That was why the fifth technique exists it allows for the elite members to catch up to the expendable ones in terms of swordsmanship. Hugo calls out to Vakir telling him to try the lower house of parliament which surprises him. Hugo explains that the lower house was to teach him about the politics and business of the Baskerville family, Vakir couldn't believe that Hugo wanted him to take the elite course. He praises Vakir for his achievements and that he was a genius and that his position will be the deputy consul of the underdog city as both consul and deputy consul positions were vacant. He asks if Vakir will accept, he accepts but says he has to mention one thing. Vakir talks about the incident with the Moore clan over the ruby mines. And so he requests to borrow something as part of his reward, this shocks Barrymore. He tells Hugo if that his request was too much, he could deny it. But Hugo allows his was saying he trusts him and that he would not do anything foolish. Vakir tells him he won't do anything to worry him, still not comfortable with him calling Vakir a son. As Barrymore and Vakir leave the room, 
Barrymore tells something to Vakir. That Hugo treasures him deeply and that was why he did not dispatch him into battle immediately and that this was a form of kinship between them. But Vakir tells him that only happens if he does a good job. He recalls his past memories, where he was betrayed and killed by Hugo, feeling the sensation of when his head had rolled off the guillotine. With deep hatred in his eyes, Vakir promises that Hugo will experience the same sensation in this life. At the Baskerville territory called Underdog. We arrive at a beautiful mansion. A bald man is telling a pair of servants that the mansion and area has to be squeaky clean by tomorrow as the new deputy consult from the Baskerville family will be coming. A servant wonders what kind of person the new deputy would be and hopes that the person would be experienced in business. The servants continue to talk as Vakir walks by, catching their attention. The servant grabs Vakir's shoulder wondering whose kid this belongs to while telling Vakir this was a place you can't just enter. Vakir looks at him and tells him to remove his hand in an instant. He reveals a piece of paper to the servants. Making them realize that he was the new deputy, Vakir tells them to prepare women and drinks to have a party right now as he enters the building. The servants looked at him confused about the party. Drinks and food are seen along with various people drinking and laughing. A man is staring at this scene in disbelief, his name is Chihuahua Baskerville. He was the general secretary of the city of the underdog and was very upset right now. He stares out the window wondering how ridiculous the cure was to drink and party on the first day of his assigned job. This was because of the previous deputy who caused him to have a hard time due to the bribes and now he's holding a party at the workplace. He finally shouts out that Vakir was a troublemaker and that only once the city was in ruins he will get it together. But Vakir appears behind him, asking if he was the general secretary. Chihuahua wonders when Vakir entered the room as they both introduced themselves to one another. Vakir notices something about Chihuahua's name that he had no middle name. Chihuahua was stunned as he knows that a lack of middle name signifies that he was outside from the family and he was discriminated against because of this. But Vakir tells him that it was nice. This confuses him. Vakir tells him that he had researched him beforehand and knew that he came from Underdog, making him know all the ins and outs of the city. He tells Chihuahua that he knows how hard people like him had worked and that he wouldn't interfere in his work and trust him to do a good job. Chihuahua wonders if this was a new form of harassment. And why Vakir was here when he had asked for a party. Vakir closes the book, stating that the personal loss had no issue but the Judy Cal system had a lot of flaws. This shocked Chihuahua as Vakir read the book extremely fast. He speaks out about the problem was that Underdog had many illegal business owners who were successful, making the underground hold power above the law. But stopping the illegal businesses itself won't solve the problem, heads of the underground businesses needs to be removed. Hearing this Chihuahua just remained silent. Vakir continues on as he stares out the window, saying that the job of the deputy consul is to make laws and execute them and that he respects the laws already in place but wanted to add a new law. Chihuahua asks him why he needed a new law and Vakir replies that he will destroy the underground economy in a week and needed a cause to make and execute this law. Since he was still young and a newly appointed deputy consul, he needs a certain type of performance to make it more convincing. To put it differently, I will lay out the poop for the flies. Chihuahua stares at him wondering what he plans to do in the city. The next day at the underdog's downtown Dortsmile Street. A crowd was gathered. As the cure stands in front of them dressed well. The servants and Chihuahua stand behind him, wondering what the cure was planning to do as he had been standing there since the crack of dawn. The cure announces himself to the crowd as the newly appointed deputy consul as the crowd wonders what a cute young kid can do. He tells them about the notice behind him and that the laws have been in place for a while and that even if the deputy changes, the laws will continue to be upheld. The crowd doesn't believe him, thinking that the higher-ups won't do anything and that he was going to be lobbied pretty soon. Chihuahua yells out at them to mind their manners as Vakir was from the main Baskerville family. Vakir remains silent as the crowd continues to mock him. He grips the stick hard in his hand and raises it up high, grabbing the attention of the crowd. He slams the stick straight into the ground with tremendous power. Everyone around couldn't believe what they saw. 
he lets go of the stick and announces a special with the authority of the deputy consul. The Cure Special Law Section 1 Clause 1, he will reward 100 million hold to whoever removes the stick. Everyone around was still too stunned to speak. They all shout what? Into the air. As the stick remains in the ground. The new law that the cure had created. Chihuahua and the servants remained silent, where else the crowd was talking about the reward. The cure calls out to them asking if there was no one that wants to get the money. But still no one came out. So he increased the money amount. He tells them of the increased amount of reward, but someone laughs as he speaks. A man from the crowd calls it ridiculous and that Vakir wanted to make fun of them. The crowd agrees with the man and tells Vakir to stop messing around and go to sleep. Chihuahua wonder why they were the ones embarrassed instead as Vakir remains silent at their remarks. He asks them if there was still no one. And then decides to increase the amount of reward once again telling them that whoever pulls out the stick, they will get the new reward. He looks at them wondering if there is still no one. The crowd wonders what the hell was going on and if this was a joke. They talk amongst themselves wondering if they should do it. But they see a sword on Vakir's waist and wonder if they would get executed if he thinks they were being too greedy. They continue to wonder about the stick, if it was too heavy or if there was trick. Vakir is disappointed that there was still no one while Chihuahua whispers to him that the city didn't have that amount of money. A hand was raised in the crowd. A little girl with snot on her nose carrying a basket of flowers asks if she could try. A man tells her not to do it as she could be killed but she tells him that her mother was sick and that she had to try something. She laughs and smiles, telling the crowd that if something happens to her, they should take good care of her mother. The old man had no words to say. She stands in front of Vakir in the stick. She thinks that Vakir might not kill her and that they would reward her with a few coins as she was volunteering to make herself a fool. Vakir tells her to pull it out as she hopes to be paid for a basket full of flowers. She bends down and holds the stick tightly, pulling with all her might. A surprised look came to her face as the stick came out. The crowd was surprised to see that it was done. The little girl holds the stick and looks up wondering why she pulled it out easily. As Vakir releases a red aura and appears to be reaching for his sword, she tears up and closes her eyes, thinking that she would be executed, wondering what the reason was for her execution and who was gonna look after her mother. But a bag appears in front of her. Vakir kneels in front of her and tells her to take the bag of reward money. She holds the bag of money confused and so was the crowd. He looks back at Chihuahua while asking her where her home was and that the rest of the money will be sent along with a guard to protect it. He rubs her head while saying that the law must always be obeyed. Everyone was once again shocked to see this. As the bag reveals a bunch of gold coins. Knowing that the laws will be upholded with the new deputy, the citizens were happy. Even crime rates were halved. The cure praises the handwriting of Chihuahuas as he wrote the Eastern language. Chihuahua tells him that he has never been touched since the past twenty years that he had worked here, as Vakir tells him that the stick was the idea to grab the attention of the citizens and to leave a lasting impression. Chihuahua vows to follow Vakir for the rest of his days as Vakir tells him to calm down. But the truth was, Camus was supposed to do this act in the future but because of fear the citizens never liked her. He rolls out a map saying that the problems are only just the beginning and since they used up their money for the reward, they needed a way to get it back. He marks out spots that held illegal groups and where they might hide in the future so as to confiscate their dirty money. Chihuahua looks at the map wondering how he knew where the criminal businesses was. Vakir tells him that he could smell it but it was acutely because of his regression. Chihuahua thinks of him as a flawless man for investigating this much already as a man opens the door. The man informs them that the Young Autonomy Association has requested a meeting which was what Vakir had expected. Chihuahua explained to Vakir that the group was made up of several clans but was just a social club that the young masters were above the law and had something to say about the Vakir special law. Vakir tells them that the dung flies have started to smell the shit. He shows a grin and tells them if they should start to annihilate the pests that are eating away at the city. 
a club that was located within the High End Hotel in the underdog city called Burning Suspension, there was a party. The people in the club were the seven crucial members of the Youth Autonomy Association. They were the second and third generation of the seven families located within the Baskerville territory. The blonde guy tells the servant to like the drinks spilled on the table and they thank him for being able to enjoy this precious drink. He tells the others that the no matter how much they spend, the money will keep replenishing thanks to the Baskervilles. A man raises a glass, saying it was easy to kidnap barbarians to sell as the demand for slaves continues to grow as the Baskerville only cared about territorial expansion. They talk about how this club was better than the ones in the capital and that even the Baskervilles were protecting them as their personal hunting dogs. The blonde man calls the Baskervilles as idiots with swords as they had caused them to take the blame as they destroyed a loyal clan called the Mesamadunaro clan. And thanks to that incident, there were only seven clans now. They continue to talk about the new deputy. The blonde man asks if they had heard of his name before and that he had caused a scene when he first arrived at the age of 15. He thinks they should have some fun and teach Vakir a lesson. They think about bringing Vakir here and making a huge and expensive party and once it's over, make him pay for everything. But say it was a joke so he won't bother them ever again. A servant appears in the room bringing out the female escorts. But one of them notices Vakir and wonders if someone had ordered a male escort. The servant grabs his hair asking him what he thinks he was doing here, as Vakir looks at him with murder in his eyes. A loud snapping sound was heard in the room. The servant was confused as his arm was in a weird shape. He screams in pain as the members wonder what happened. Vakir introduces himself to them, and they realize who he was. They asked what the deputy was doing here and Vakir tells them they called him here. They greeted him in a nervous manner. As they whisper to each other, wondering if they should do the plan now. Vakir places his hand on the table telling them to stop the pointless chatter. He releases a red aura, grabbing the attention of the members. Glasses shake all around. The tower of drinks vibrate. And finally exploded. They realize that he used mana manipulation to force the champagne tower to explode by touching the table, making him a graduator class. They continue to whisper among themselves shocked to find out that he was graduator class at 15 years old. Vakir calls out to one of them and grabs his shoulder as he tells Vakir that they were gonna pay for the drinks. But Vakir leans into him telling him that they should pay for their drinks and wonder if they were planning to force him to pay for it. The rest of them tries to calm Vakir down saying they wouldn't make him do such a thing. And that they were just testing him as the city was a corrupt place. But Vakir strikes them in the stomach. With his fingers deep inside the body as it bleeds, he tells them that a dog should never trust their owner no matter the situation. And that they act this way because they have never seen something truly frightening before. As he throws the guy onto the floor, he steps on his face, asking the others if they knew why he did this to him. And they tell him that they knew why he did this. But Vakir continues to step on his head and tells him that they would understand what he wants to do next as he smashes the guy's head to pieces. They all stand up asking Vakir if he thinks that he will get away from this while calling him a bastard. Vakir leans face to face to another guy as he knew they wouldn't understand. He lists out their crimes, abduction, kidnapping, illegal slave trafficking, insulting Baskerville and a bunch of other crimes. He smacks the guy in the face, saying that animals don't learn until you teach them. He looks at them with a sadistic smile as his eyes glow telling them that they were gonna see what he can do to teach a disobedient creature a lesson. Deep in the underground dungeon, Vakir and Chihuahua are looking at something in disgust. A hand is seen on the bars, telling Vakir if he thinks he would survive after pulling such a stunt, and that he would tell his father everything. It was the blonde man, he tells Vakir that he will get out of here and kill him. Chihuahua asks Vakir why he had them beaten so much. Vakir asks him if he thinks this was too much, Chihuahua said that he can't turn people into a meat bag, but Vakir tells him that he hasn't even started yet. He walks towards telling explaining that the village hall was to manage wicked people, but they had turned it into a hideous organization, and based on their arrogant expressions, they still lack proper education. Vakir tells them that once the sun set, he will execute all of them, shocking the blonde man. 
Chihuahua asks Vakir if he was serious, and Vakir said he will bury those that associate with them, hearing this Chihuahua advises him not to do it as their family will fight back. But Vakir tells him not to worry as their crimes are tied to the criminals of Underdog City and that he had his ways, this confuses Chihuahua. Vakir looks at them, and informs them of their charges. Human trafficking, kidnapping, bribery, blackmail, threatening, assault and murder. The blonde man tells him that they didn't do those crimes, so Vakir asks if they would accept punishment if there was evidence. Looking at them hard, he tell them they look like they did the crime but have no proof. This causes the man to stutter. Vakir thinks deeply what to do, as a man enters carrying a bag. The bag was covered in blood and had a knife sticking out. The man tells Vakir that his custom order was ready. Vakir tells him great timing and good job. The bag revealed a bunch of tools covered in blood. The man asks Vakir where he got the ideas for the tools because for the past 30 years, he had never seen such scary tool. Vakir tells him they were common tools from where he came from. The man asks if Vakir came from hell, but Vakir asks if he wanted to learn, but the man declines, saying he would vomit when he sees the work with those tools. Vakir looks at the tools, remembering that he learnt these tools from torturing demons during the Era of Destruction. He removes his jacket, frightening the blowed man. He asks them as they stare at him, where's that expression of yours that said you won't admit to anything no matter what? Vakir rolls up his sleeves telling them not to say anything. So he could relieve his cherished memories of his past for once. Rumors spread throughout the town of the seven members' arrest. The people discuss about the arrest, thinking that the deputy would let them go. Some think that he was going to execute them, but others believe that he would not as it would cause trouble. They believe that the situation was just a political play between the new and native politicians. As the citizens predicted, the seven families sent an apology to the new deputy consul. The local powerhouses had bent their will, making it possible for the prisoners to be released and the new deputy to be punished by the patriarch. But something else happened. The seven heads were hung in the middle of the center square. The heads were preserved with salt, displaying expressions of agony as if they experienced excruciating pain until their last breaths. A notice was hung behind the heads, explaining the crimes of the heads and their execution details. The citizens were speechless upon seeing the heads. Vakir tells Chihuahua that this was expected because of the laws, and now new change will come to the city. Seeing this will soon cause a bloodbath in the underdog city, Vakir tells Chihuahua to brace himself. Chihuahua was confused on how he would play a part. As he was now wearing a mask, he turns around, whispering if this was the right strategy. A figure asks if he didn't trust him. But he still wondered if this was the right plan. As the deputy consul was trapped in the cage, with people in masks all around the place and people in chains, and that that he was going to be sold as a slave for the strategy. They were somewhere on the outskirts of the underdog city. The slave auction was being conducted, which was an unlawful event that had not been reported. A man welcomes everyone to the circus. He was surprised to see people from the Mont Blanc clan. Reading the note, he sees that they were sellers and Chihuahua assures him that they were selling. He questions Chihuahua if he was not happy with the slaves from before, as the Mont Blanc clan always bought large amounts of slaves. But seeing Vakir's red eyes and black hair, he assures Chihuahua that he will take responsibility and sell him at a good price. He hopes that Chihuahua has a good time at the circus. The auction begins in the main tent as night falls. The people discuss about the slaves that were popular and what they wanted to buy, as the clown man tells them that an item was secretly embezzled by the Baskerville family's knights. It was an A-rank monster that is said to have nineteen hearts, the Merciel. From its leather meat bones and intestines nothing goes to waste, the price starts at 100 million gold. The price increases till the prize was sold for 250 million gold. The auction continues as the people bid and buy things. A man approaches Clown Mask, as he was surprised they were gonna sell something this time. He announces to everyone that something special has arrived and was found deep within the jungle. It was the barbarian of Balak from the warrior tribe in the Lorange mountain jungles. 
he tells them they would get a different feeling when they tame a wild slave and it would be the perfect chance to test their slave training techniques, but he wonders why they had decided to sell this thing. He calls out for a bid, but no one responses, he then decides to lower the bid from 5 to 1 million. But still the people were not interested. He tells the huge man to get rid of it as no one wanted it. But the warrior struggles to free itself. So the huge man punches her hard, making her unconscious. He apologies for the disturbance as they bring her to the back. As an apology he decides to bring out the best product they had today. Vakir walks in. Catching the attention of everyone. He was wearing long hair as a disguise. The clown mask introduces him as a rare item with black hair and red eyes and looks for a high price. The people bid heavily amongst themselves, starting from 600 million gold, which surpassed what the clown mask was looking for. They argue among themselves as the bid kept on increasing to 900 million. But a single number raised the bid to 6 billion. This amount stuns everyone in the room. They see the man as Baron Gambino from the granary and that he had taken over the underground allowing for him to gain immense wealth and power. The lady asks him if he was spending too much, but he tells her he can sell him at a higher price in the capital, but she tells him that six billion was too much, and he tells her to be quiet. He scolds her for talking back and to try arrogantly bite the hand that feeds her so she remains silent. The masked clown asked if there was anyone else that wanted, but no one replied, hence the cure went to Gambino. Gambino looks at Vakir thinking that he looked better up close. He tells him not to be nervous as he wasn't a bad man. As he pants heavily, telling him that he has thought of many ways to play with Vakir. Vakir raised his arms and pulls the chain hard. Breaking the chains in a swift manner, shocking the lady and Gambino. He lifts his foot up. And smashes the ground to the point Gambino flew up like a little bitch. He lands hard onto the ground. Vakir grabs his back asking if he wanted to play shield and spear. Squeezing hard till he bleeds, Vakir tells him that he should be the shield to see if he can endure. Gambino screams in pain, telling Cindy to get the security. But more blood gushed out, stunning her. Vakir made him faint. As he removes his fake wig, Cindy realizes who he was. He was Vakir Van Baskerville, seeing him shocked everyone in the crowd. Vakir tells him that the name Circus fits this place. And tells everyone that they won't return in one piece. Vakir reveals himself to everyone attending the circus. Clown Mask couldn't believe that he was here. He tells the guards to kill him as he had no weapon with him. But Vakir had Belzebub's skill. He cuts down the guards easily. Clown Mask notices the red and horrific aura as the huge man swings a weapon as Vakir rushes towards him. The weapon comes close to Vakir's face, but he simply smiles at it. The guard is surprised at this as blood is seen. Vakir cuts through the weapon and the huge man, as he was a graduator. The huge man wonders how someone at that age was a graduator level. The clown mask knew that the graduators were the ultimate weapons and that they had no chance. Chihuahua was also surprised at Vakir's strength but he notices something. Clown Mask shouts at Vakir to look over here. He tells Vakir to drop his weapon and to surrender so that Chihuahua does not lose his life. But Vakir remains silent, so Clown Mask asks him if he could not understand what he was saying. Chihuahua struggles but yells out to Vakir that he was alright and to look after himself. Clown Mask tells him to stop struggling but Chihuahua continues to speak out telling Vakir that things like injustice and compromise does not exist for him, and that he would rather die than be a burden to his superior. Vakir laughs at this, saying his loyalty was great. He tells him not to worry because he had received a trump card from the patriarch, showing them a whistle. Vakir takes a deep breath in, and blows hard into the whistle. The sound of the whistle stuns everyone in the room due to the sharp and loud noise. Vakir stops blowing and stares at them. Clown Mask soon chuckles nervously as nothing had happened. He tells him that even a graduator can't do anything here but something enters his throat as he looks down. A figure appears behind him. As he falls, Chihuahua screams as the man sheets his blade. 
a man asks who the figure was as he tries to attack him. But the figure slices the man in three like pie. Blood flies everywhere as the crowd screams, but Vakir simply smiles. Soon a bunch of men enters the room. Wearing hoods and swords, their very presence silence the room. They stare with an intense look. The guards and Cindy see them, and slowly began to realize who they were. The Empire's most brutal night order known as the Annihilation Experts who were all graduators. Cindy knew them as the Baskerville clan's Pitbull Night Order, just as one of them came from behind her. She turns and sees him, thinking that she can't die in a place like this. But Vakir appears telling the man to leave her alone. He obeys and leaps back to Neil, as Vakir tells them to rip the rest to shreds and kill the ones not lying down obediently. The man obeys Vakir's command and disappears. Vakir recalls that Hugo was sensitive about military power and was relief he could use the pitbulls without trouble. The pitbulls continue to slaughter the people as one of them thinks to get on the floor and run away once it quietens down, but a pitbull sees him. He tells the pitbull he would wear the handcuffs but the pit bull tells him that they don't carry handcuffs. Instead they sliced off the legs of those they capture. A cigar is lit as the man says that those who are to be executed won't need their legs, as a man wearing sunglasses appear beside Vakir, he asks Vakir how it felt to command the pit bull knights. The man was the commander of the pit bull knights, Boston Terrier Lou Baskerville. He looks at Vakir and sees why his brother Hugo was so interested in him as Vakir was already fierce and cruel at the age of fifteen, so he rubs his head, telling him to come to the Pitbull Knights so he can raise him properly, Vakir tells him he would think about it. Vakir shrugs him off, telling him he had something urgent to attend, this makes Boston want Vakir even more and Vakir thinks of him as burdensome. Vakir enters a room filled with various cages, thinking that what he wanted was around here. He looks at a safe knowing that it contained the money that the nobles were paid with, which will be given to the city hall to be taxed, and soon notices a certain cage. He pulls out the cover and sees something. A voice for moaning in pain. It was the female barbarian that was being auctioned. She moans in pain as tears fall from her face. The cure took a closer look at the barbarian girl. Seeing that she was tormented before being dragged here, making him angry. He tells her she was lucky as he reveals a red and blue potion on his waist, and that he was giving it to her out of kindness. She drinks the potion and its effects are seen on her body. All of a sudden, she awakens. And dashed to the back of the cage, as the cure asked her why she was so surprised. She looks at him in wonder as all her wounds have healed. The cure tells her to go in her language. She slowly comes out the cage, as the cure points to the exit while still telling her to run away in her language as he knew the basics of her language from fighting the barbarians countless times in the past. But she yells out a bunch of words that Vakir couldn't understand as he was not that fluent. But before she left the place, she turns to Vakir and spoke something in her language. Vakir believes that she was thanking her. And began to look for what he came here for and found it. It was the Mercy Elle's corpse that was being auctioned before. Beelzebub suddenly became active. It screams out loudly, as it has been a while that it had feasted on an A-rank monster, so Vakir tells it to quickly consume the corpse before the Pitbull order arrives. Beelzebub was happy. Soon, rumors of what happened at the circus spreads in the town, and that nobles and participants were taken to the underdog city prison with their limbs torn off. And that day, the building burned and the entire club of burning suspension burnt down and disappeared. With the heads of the club's VIPs were put on display, which created more awareness towards criminal acts. The seven families who lost their children, sent letters of protests to the administrative office. But the reply they received was firm, that the death penalty was given to the criminals involved with the Imperial's family most forbidden act, illegal slave trading and that the bank drafts, ledger books and other evidence were found by the Baskerville family and will be reported to the Imperial family. Soon, the patriarchs of each of the seven families came, they kneeled down and apologized which was unprecedented as they were begging their enemy who killed their sons. However, the Kier's reply was simply, that due to the investigation, the seven families' assets will be confiscated. And on the charge of treason, three generations will be destroyed. 
Soon, the floor of the execution ground were filled with the dirty blood of the city's corrupt vermin. This resulted in love from the citizens as crime and employment rates were lowered making the welfare of Underdog City restored. The next day, Chihuahua tells Vakir he had brought him coffee with a smile on his face. Vakir tells him to do his job and not bring coffee, but Chihuahua tells him that it was a sign of thanks for saving him from Clown Mask. Vakir tells him he was being stingy by bringing him just coffee, but Chihuahua assures him he also placed two spoons of sugar, creamer, and a little bit of water. He then asks Vakir how his transcribing training was going, so Vakir asks him to check his progress. Chihuahua was impressed with Vakir's writing as he was very good, but Vakir tells him that he still has a long way to catch up. Thinking deeply, Chihuahua was amazed by Vakir's acts of being able to create new laws from the words he learned, and was able to comprehend knowledge of law easily. He thinks that if Vakir stayed here, Underdog City will develop even more. Night arrives, as the moonlight reaches between the bars. A person is handcuffed. Vakir tells Cindy that he was sorry for not visiting her sooner as he was busy with things lately. He asks her if her real name was Cindy when Eason rose, but she asks him why he let her live. He removes the blindfold, telling her that he wants to ask her a few questions. She stares at him asking if questions were why he let her live. Vakir turns away, asking her if she was the reason why Baron Gambino was able to grow his power so quickly, but she remains silent. He pulls out a chair telling her that her ability to earn money was impressive, and had she grow her talent in other places, she would have become a great merchant or banker, then he promises her that once she answers his questions, he will let her go. But if she doesn't, she will regret her actions today. She agrees to answer his answer, so Vakir asks her if she thinks he has been enforcing the law well. He tells her to answer seriously or he won't keep his promise, this makes her upset. She tells him that he was doing well. The reply makes Vakir grin widely. He walks over to her slowly, grabbing her attention. As he slowly raises his hand towards her. Lifting her face close to his as he looks her straight in the eyes, and asked her what the reason was. Vakir was staring intensely. She trembled with fear as sweat drips down her face as he slowly lets go of her face. He walks back to the chair, wanting to hear from her what he was doing wrongly. She grits her teeth, hesitating to answer. But she explains anyways, that a consul's important factor was virtue, and that even though his laws had reduced crime, many citizens will soon die and suffer from those laws, in the long term, it will cause hatred and rage from the people. Furthermore, the Baskerville family will also not welcome him, as he is gaining too much power than the clan leader in Underdog City. The cure adds on, saying that eventually he will be hated by the people, and even become a threat targeted by the Baskervilles. So he looks at her and asks her what he should do, she tells him to return all the power and achievements to the clan leader. And that he needed to stop getting attention by going to the Lunoir Mountain or the Academy in the Empire, to hide his powers and wash his identity. And when the time comes, the Baskerville clan leader will be the one to suffer in his stead, the cure hears this and remains silent. But soon she felt an immense pressure as Vakir asks her that what she said means that. She wants the hunting dog to bite off his own owner's neck, as Hound Shadows emerges. He stares at her with immense power. But she does not relent easily. She furthers tell him that as a hunting dog, this was the only way for him to avoid hatred. Bringing a smile to Vakir's smile. He tells her that she would keep that in mind, surprising her. Vakir takes out a key, telling her it was good advice and was almost identical to his own idea. He removed the handcuff, telling her she was free, but she was hesitant, but Vakir assures her he always keep promises. She turns to leave, telling him she hopes that the day he regrets what happened today never comes, but before she leaves, Vakir asks her if she knew the clan Mesamadunaro, which stops her in her tracks. He goes on to tell her that the clan were merchants who were rich and were once the eighth clan. But an unfortunate event caused the clan to end, hearing this made her grip her fist tight. Vakir recalls the history that the young master of the Mesamadunaro clan wanted to show off his sword skills, in his birthday celebration. The demo started and the people couldn't believe what they were seeing. The young boy was showing off the secret Baskerville sword techniques that only members knew. 
This later reached the ears of the leader of the Baskerville family, confirming that top-secret information had been leaked, releasing the hunting dogs of the family, causing the Mesomodinaro clan to go extinct. But the truth was, it was the young demons of the Seven family that made the young master learn the stolen techniques. Cindy smiles awkwardly, asking Vakir what that story had to do with her. Vakir continues the story, saying that there was a survivor from the clan, that the seven idiots had sneaked out a one-year-old girl from the devastation. All because the girl was beautiful, she went through cruel and unusual torture, acts so horrible that even Vakir couldn't talk about it, hearing this made Cindy grit her teeth hard. She turns to leave, telling Vakir she doesn't want to hear anymore, but Vakir tells her there was more to the story. And time passed, and a new deputy came to the city, managing to drag out the old problems out of the city and punish them, as the trigger for everything was the seven idiots. And that the new deputy made sure that the seven idiots were tortured properly and they admitted their crimes as they met their end, making them say their last words. I'm sorry for committing such a heinous crime or so they say. Hearing this made Cindy tear up as she turns to look at the cure. She yells at him, wondering who the hell they were saying sorry towards. And Vakir tells her that the sorry was meant for the young girl using the fake name Cindy Wendison Rose, the sole survivor of the Mesomodinaro clan, but Cindy could not believe him, telling Vakir how she was supposed to believe him when he tortured them. Vakir grabs a torch telling her that it would be easier for her to see with her own eyes. They reached a certain cell, where he told her to take a look. Tears fall from her eyes, as she was alarmed from what she saw. Bodies and walls were covered in blood everywhere in the cell she looked in. Words were written on the floor with blood, as the seven idiots confessed, saying they were sorry and begged for forgiveness. The scene before her, made Cindy throw up. Vakir walks towards her, saying there was still one clan left to hate, and tells her to hate the Baskerville clan, she had more than enough rights to do so. She wipes her mouth, staring at him. She asks him why he was helping her even though he was part of the Baskerville clan, but Vakir tells her she was asking the wrong question. She pauses for a moment, then tells him she understands what he was trying to say. She stands up, telling him that she will repay this debt. As she makes her exit, she tells him that whatever he does for the rest of his life, he will never worry about money ever again. This brings a smile to Vakir's face, as he tell her that he will remind her of this promise in the future. The next day, back at the mansion, Chihuahua greets Vakir good morning, but was shocked to see blood and dead bodies in the room. Vakir wakes up, rubbing his eyes and saying good morning to Chihuahua. Chihuahua asks him what was with the bodies and blood, Vakir tells him that he killed them in his sleep. They continue the talk as Chihuahua asks Vakir what his childhood was like. But Vakir tells him that a lot of inconveniences were happening in his way lately. There were poison arrows, poison drinks, acid, snipers, arson, getting run over by a cart and many more. Vakir wonders if this meant he was getting more attention as Chihuahua calls him insane. But it was thanks to his three skills that he was able to survive all these attacks and thanks to the river of sticks and tough life enhancing his body, graduator-class assassin couldn't pierce his skin. Vakir thinks of all this as annoying and wants to look into it, Chihuahua tells him it was a wise decision. Soon a carriage carrying the Baskerville flag appeared in front of them. Vakir recognizes them were sent by the main family. The carriage door opens, and a pair of feet appears. Chihuahua is shocked to see who came out as a white head appears. It was Barrymore the butler, he greets Vakir saying it has been a long time. Vakir tells Barrymore that he looks better now. They continue to talk as Chihuahua looks at Barrymore in disbelief. Barrymore was famous as being able to survive in the main family as a single mistake could cost him his life, and that he was the head butler for four generations. Chihuahua was happy to see the role model of servants in front of him. Vakir asks Barrymore if the reason he came was for that. Barrymore agrees saying that Hugo was happy with his results and wants him back at the main residence, Vakir thinks of Hugo, not believing that his face meant being happy. Hugo is seen reading about Vakir in the paper, and that he had achieved first place as the most beloved figure of Underdog City. He reads a quote out loud to Vakir that states, 
the Baskervilles are only good at using weapons and not their brains, but with Vakir's achievements, they could get rid of that image. Hugo praises Vakir, but Vakir tells him he was doing what he was supposed to, still thinking if Hugo's face is his actually happy face. Hugo then tells him that one must reward and punish according to the situation. He informs Vakir that he was the one to go to the academy this year as Vakir expected. The best academy Colossio was where the Empire's elites gathered, it was the perfect opportunity for Vakir to grow stronger without Hugo's attention. Hugo asks Vakir if he wanted any other siblings to go to the attend with him. Vakir tells him that he was close to the triplets but was actually thinking of using them as sandbags. Hugo tells him he would send them with him and asks if he remembers the plan he thought of when he was eight years old. Vakir remembers the plan regarding the ruby mines with the Morg clan to use them to get rid of the barbarians. Hugo smiles, telling him that the plan had worked. Vakir asks what he meant by that and Hugo explained, saying that the Morgs suggested a joint raid and were humble about it. And Vakir should inspect the territory before going GTO the academy and if the laws he had altered were being upheld. Vakir bows down and tells Hugo he will follow his orders. Back at Underdog City, Chihuahua waves a cloth in the air, calling out to Vakir. He tells him to take care, and that he will do his best with all the work in the meantime. Vakir turns back in silence, thinking that he will soon part ways with Chihuahua. As he continues the march, Vakir speaks out loud, telling someone to show himself. A group of hooded figures appears suddenly behind Vakir's convoy. One appears beside him, as Vakir apologies to the hooded figure for making him wait. The man was Staffordshire Baskerville, he tells Vakir it was okay and that their job was to escort him safely. Vakir asks him if Uncle Boston Terrier was doing well, and Staffordshire tells him that he wanted Vakir to join the pit bulls after the slave auctions. Vakir thinks of his uncle as someone who makes him uncomfortable. They soon reach a mountain. Looking at the mountain, they wonder if this was the region they lent to the Morg clan. Vakir looks around, noticing that nobody was breaking the laws. Staffordshire tells Vakir that a team was sent to inspect before, but Vakir knew that they were really meant to get rid of the barbarians. He informs Vakir that the Morg clan had formed a huge group showing that they were serious. On the other hand, the Baskervilles had only sent a small group with Vakir. But Vakir thinks it was a good idea by Hugo to see the barbarian's lifestyle. A fortress is seen deep in the mountain. Skeletons were seen with spikes coming out of it. Vakir sees it as a mage's warning to the barbarians, a very scary message. The act reminds Vakir of the little girl from the Morg's clan. Three figures stand on top of the fortress. They shout who goes there, catching the attention of Vakir and Stafford. They were girl triplets who tells them that no one can pass without their permission. Vakir knew who they were. They were the Morg clan three flowers, the triplets, Hysis, Milsis, and Losis. The author is lazy in naming triplets. Each of them were insane, combined together, their insanity could reach the heavens. Vakir tells them that they were the envoy team from Baskerville. He explains to them that they came to inspect the area and to open the gates, but they wave him off saying they had to report to the person in charge, and that a reply will come tomorrow. Vakir asks them what rights they had to stop him from entering the land he owns, but the triplets look down on him, asking if he was looking down on them because they were paying rent. The triplets asks Vakir if he knew about the tenant's law, which was his family's law, causing Vakir to have a headache. Red aura glows from his hands as Stafford notices, Vakir tells them that he made changes to that law, so that he could chase tenants he didn't like. I'll say it for the last time Vakir said, as the triplets begin to look nervous. Open the gates, Vakir said were intense pressure as he stares at them with murder in his eyes. The triplets all cower in fear from his words alone. One of them grits her teeth, casting a spell, saying they heard a psycho kid took charge of Underdog City, unleashing the spell towards Vakir saying they had dealt with such kids before. The spell lands near Vakir, scaring his horse. The triplets yell at Vakir for being a stupid swordsman and that he can't enter the morgue's land without permission, pissing Vakir off even more. Stafford reaches for his sword, telling Vakir he thinks that this can't be resolved with words, Vakir agrees with him. 
but three hooded figures from the back shouted back, saying what absurdity coming from girl who don't even know their place, this alarmed Vakir. He turns around, recognizing a voice as sweat drips down his face. The girls shout at them, saying they were mere underlings and if they think their ranks were higher than theirs. The three hooded figures jump in front of Vakir, saying not us. They remove their hoods, revealing themselves as the triplets of the Baskerville family, with the same names as the girls, point to Vakir as the symbol of the Baskerville family. They look at Vakir, winking and showing thumbs up, telling him to leave the girls to them. Vakir gave them a certain look, like what the actual F is going on here. As his annoyance is raised to the power of two, Vakir found himself puzzled, questioning the identity and intentions of the individuals standing before him. Their peculiar behavior left him bewildered and curious, seeking to understand the situation at hand. Highborough glanced back at Vakir, expressing his gratitude for recommending them to the academy. He signaled to Vakir that he should leave this situation in their capable hands, implying that they were capable of handling it themselves. As Vakir's thoughts raced, he started piecing together the puzzle before him. It became clear that the group's actions were driven by their affiliation with the academy. However, Vakir couldn't help but see them as mere sandbags, lacking independent judgment but able to effectively carry out orders. Aware of the triplets' future as skilled warriors, Vakir believed that with his training, they could become valuable assets. With a smile, he expressed his intention to trust the triplets, affectionately referring to them as his older brothers. Upon receiving Vakir's affirmation, the Baskerville triplets displayed signs of joy and satisfaction, pleased to have earned Vakir's trust. Morg's three flowers, who had observed this exchange, expressed disdain for the close bond among the Baskerville triplets, labeling them as ignorant fools who relied solely on each other. Unfazed by the taunts, the Baskerville triplets responded defiantly, raising their middle fingers in a cheeky manner, asserting that it was Morg's three flowers who were the true fools. The tension escalated as Morg's three flowers, fueled by anger, vowed to discipline the Baskerville triplets for their insolence. Vakir's thoughts shifted as he recalled his past knowledge. Before his regression, he had known the Morg triplets as powerful mages with water, earth, and nature attributes. Their combined magic abilities exponentially enhanced the effects of their spells, earning them the title of the Morg's Three Flowers. As the Morg's Three Flowers merged their magical abilities, a colossal vine made of soil and plants emerged, creating a formidable barrier. Hysis, positioned atop the wall, burst into laughter, mocking the Baskerville triplets with her taunts. Middleborough and Lowborough turned to their adversaries, questioning if they could overcome the obstacle. Undeterred, Highborough readied his sword, dismissing the plant barrier as insignificant. With precision and skill, Highborough executed the Baskerville first technique, effortlessly slicing through the massive vines. Staffordshire marveled at his flawless execution. However, before Highborough could fully recover, he sensed an incoming attack. He managed to block a whip-like strike from the vines with his sword, though the force pushed him backward. Middleborough and Lowborough called out in worry as they witnessed Highborough's predicament. Losis wore a smug expression, mocking the Baskerville triplets and asserting that their swords were incapable of reaching them. The Baskerville triplets responded with intense anger, their expressions resembling hounds ready to hunt their prey. Staffordshire turned to Vakir, asking if he found the situation enjoyable. Perplexed, Vakir questioned what Staffordshire was referring to. Staffordshire explained the ongoing clash between magic and swordsmanship, highlighting the long-standing debate about which was stronger. Magic used surrounding mana to amplify and reproduce elemental powers, while swordsmanship channeled the user's energy and mana for explosive and enduring strength. Staffordshire found pleasure in observing the potential and talents of the clans of mages and swordsmen who would shape the future. Vakir acknowledged his involvement, stating that if viewed from that perspective, he was indeed part of the ongoing conflict. Staffordshire commented that Vakir had already surpassed others his age in terms of skill. Vakir, uninterested in the ongoing fight, expressed his frustration and wished for all of them to perish. He considered it a waste of time, as he had important tasks to attend to, having recently found a supervisor burdened with a significant workload. 
Suddenly, a figure arrived at the scene, casting a fiery spell and angrily questioning what they were doing in front of their territory. Hyboro took the opportunity to attack Hysis, believing he had the upper hand. However, the situation quickly changed as they noticed a massive fire approaching them. The unexpected turn of events left them taken aback and shocked. A tremendous explosion of fire engulfed the area, causing tension in Staffordshire but eliciting a smile from Vakir, who wondered if everyone had perished. To Vakir's annoyance, he realized that the Baskerville triplets had survived the attack. He looked at them with a displeased expression, making a disapproving sound. Highboro, in a state of shock, questioned the sudden appearance of fire magic. Middleborough shouted at the figures behind the smoke wall, expressing frustration at the near-death experience they had just encountered. Behind the dissipating smoke, the three flowers of the Morg clan were in tears. Middlesis, still shaken from the near-death experience, expressed her relief at having survived. Hysis chimed in, acknowledging that if she had dodged the attack even slightly later, she might not have been so fortunate. Losis, scared and seeking comfort, voiced her fears to her older sisters. The person responsible for the powerful fire spell questioned the situation and asked what was going on here. Vakir looked up at the figure who had unleashed the attack. It was Camu Morg, standing atop the castle gate wall, flames still burning in her hands. Camu looked down and declared her inability to forgive anyone who caused trouble within her managed territory. As she landed in front of Morg's three flowers, Middlesis tried to explain that their intention was to stop the invader, while Losis added that the fight had been initiated by the other party. Camu cast a cold gaze upon them and questioned their informal way of addressing her as Camu, emphasizing her position as the vice head of the fortress. Middlesis couldn't help but shudder in fear, denying any disrespect and quickly correcting herself, addressing Camu with the appropriate honorific. Camu then pointed towards the treetops where dead skeletons hung warning them to be cautious if they wished to avoid a similar fate. Middlesis let out a frightened cry and apologized for their actions. Camu noticed Vakir, and her eyes widened in shock. She approached him and remarked that it had been a long time since they had seen each other, recalling that it had been seven years. Vakir smiled and acknowledged that it had indeed been a while, greeting her as Camu Morg. Vakir couldn't help but wonder if Camus's more mature appearance was the reason for her increased attractiveness. He mused about the beauty of Camus Morg, who had captivated the hearts of many men in high society. In his previous life, there had been scandals and rumors surrounding her, as she allured even married men. However, he found it strange that there were no such rumors in this lifetime. Nevertheless, he brushed off those thoughts. Vakir straightforwardly requested Camus to open the door, stating that words wouldn't work on the triplets. Camus was taken aback by his blunt words. She looked angry and questioned if that was all he had to say after such a long time. Vakir gazed at her with curiosity and inquired about what he should say instead. Camus's anger flared, and she exclaimed in frustration. Staffordshire observed Camus' escalating anger and wondered if the next fight would be between the superstars of the two clans. Camus pointed her finger at Vakir, her eyes filled with angry tears, and declared that he scored zero points. She accused him of having a disrespectful attitude towards his future wife, giving him a score of zero out of a hundred. The morgue's three flowers, the Baskerville triplets, Vakir, and Staffordshire all looked at Camus Morg in with the bombastic side eye look. Camu averted her gaze to the side, her face blushing, and muttered a huff. Everyone present was left with the same question in their minds, whose wife? Vakir and Camu rode their horses together, making their way toward the fortress. As they traveled, Camu commented on the Baskerville clan's lack of knowledge about the barbarians. Vakir confidently responded, assuring her that they were well acquainted with the barbarians and frequently fought against them. He claimed that their knowledge surpassed that of the morgues. Curious, Camus questioned Vakir's decision to send the Baskerville triplets, referring to them as young and foolish hounds. Vakir explained that it had been agreed with the Morg clan to position the main force on the other side of the mountain range. He wondered why Camus was asking about something she already knew. Camus smiled mischievously and playfully suggested that Vakir might not be as well informed about the barbarians as he thought. 
The Kir, determined to prove himself, retorted that as the person in charge of the delegation, he naturally possessed extensive knowledge. Camus then went to ask him which of the tribes were the most annoying, as the Kir thinks that she just keeps on asking questions. The Kir answered her, by stating it was the warrior tribe Balak and the sorcerer tribe Rococo, as the strength of Balak's bowmanship was on a completely different level to the empire, and its principles isn't well known either. Camus, teasingly, acknowledged his confidence in his well-informed answer about the ecology of the barbaric tribes and awarded him eight points out of a hundred in her unique scoring system. Puzzled by the points, the Kir questioned their purpose. Camus simply replied that it was because he had answered well. The Kir looked at her with curiosity, intrigued by her unusual scoring system. Camus continued her evaluation of the Kir, expressing her dislike for overly intelligent men and stating her preference for a little foolishness. She playfully critiqued the Kir's choice of a large horse, considering it ill suited for his shorter stature, and deducted six points. Moving on to fashion, she expressed disappointment with his lackluster clothing choices and assigned him a mere four points. When she noticed the cure ignoring her, she playfully gave him just one point for his mannerisms. Camus then playfully smiled and awarded his face 99 points. However, due to his poor control over his facial expressions, she playfully deducted one point. Growing frustrated, the cure urged Camus to stop the useless evaluation. Camus questioned why it was useless, asserting that she needed to be stern with her future husband. Perplexed, the Kir asked why he was considered her future husband. Camus reminded him of a test he had passed seven years ago, when he dueled Camus' uncle to assess his suitability as a potential husband. Camus expressed her dissatisfaction with her uncle's decision and how it had hindered her path to marriage. Reluctantly acknowledging the promise that had been made, she decided to follow through with it albeit resentfully. While Camus vented her frustrations, the cure observed her and acknowledged her prowess as a great fire mage. Interrupting her, the cure declared that he had forgotten about what happened that day and wished to make it as if it never occurred. Camus' face flushed red, and she threw a jacket at the cure, exclaiming that he couldn't simply reverse something that had happened and called him a dummy. She boasted about her genius intellect, claiming that once she witnessed something, she never forgot it. The Kir examined the jacket and jokingly wondered if she had returned it without washing it. As they reached the outskirts of the fortress, Camus informed the Kir that the barbarians had ambushed the ruby mine, plundering either the indigenous slaves or the crops. She explained that they took slaves to sell elsewhere. Pointing to a wall built by earth and iron mages over the course of a month, she proudly showcased the skill of the morgue mages. Impressed, the Kir acknowledged their talent noting that it would have taken several hundred regular people around a year to achieve the same result. Camus affirmed his observation with pride. The Kir noticed some large holes in the wall and jokingly asked if they were caused by the arrows shot by the Baleks. Camus confirmed that the arrows carried a strong aura and had caused numerous casualties during nighttime guard duty. She mentioned that the arrows were capable of breaking through walls two to three meters thick, emphasizing the exceptional archery skills of the Baleks. She revealed that her uncle had suffered a severe chest injury from one of these arrows but had luckily survived, albeit with wounded pride. Recalling a similar experience from his own clan, the Kir mentioned that his patriarch had injured his nose bridge. Curious, the Kir inquired about the talented individuals among the barbarians, and Camus responded that she believed there was a skilled female among them. Due to their black painted faces, it was challenging to discern their physical traits. As they turned around, a mage approached them, addressing Camus as the vice head of the fortress. The mage reported that a recon member of the barbarians had been captured and urged them to come quickly. Curious and concerned, Camus and Vakir followed the mage to a tent where the captive barbarian was being held. Vakir observed the barbarian and identified him as a member of the Rococo sorcerer tribe. Camus inquired if any information had been extracted from him. The mage informed them that the barbarian remained uncooperative and resistant to psychic magic due to his strong sorcery, making it impossible to read his mind. Camus then questioned the barbarian about the recent ambush on the Morgue clan's fortress, specifically asking about her cousin, Rose, who had been kidnapped. 
the barbarian responded with a smile and spoke in his native barbarian language. Camus turned to the mage, requesting a translation to learn about the whereabouts of the barbarian who rebelled. The mage reported that when the barbarians attacked, everyone at the fortress had either died or been taken away. He informed her that, at that moment, there was no one available to translate the barbarian's words. Suddenly, the Kir spoke up, revealing that he knew a little of the Rococo language. Surprised, Camus questioned what the Kir didn't know how to do. The Kir clarified that he was not fluent and only had a basic understanding of the vocabulary. Camus requested Vakir to ask the barbarian about the whereabouts of her kidnapped sixth cousin, describing her as a twelve-year-old girl with red eyes, red hair, and white skin. Vakir posed the question to the barbarian in the barbarian language, and the barbarian responded with an evil smile and gave him a short reply. Closing his eyes for a moment, Vakir relayed the grim news to Camus, her cousin was dead. Anger filled Camus' face upon hearing this devastating information. She declared that since the senator of the audience hall was currently being treated and the senator of the temple was away on an inspection, the decision would be made by her, Camu Morg, a member of the middle house and the vice head of the fortress. She announced the verdict, immediate execution. A spike pierced the barbarian's body, and soon he was consumed by fire. As the barbarian burned, he uttered something, but Camu dismissed his words stating that after the war, the language he spoke would only be used in hell. The barbarian's companion watched in horror as he met his fiery demise. Filled with anger, Camus turned around and urged Vakir to follow her, leaving him silently observing her departing figure. Exiting the tent, he was greeted by the sight of Camus crying out loud. He walked towards her, recognizing that despite her tough exterior, she was still only fifteen years old. Vakir asked her about her close relationship with her cousin, and Camus confirmed that they were indeed very close. She described her cousin as a pure child who didn't fit into the cold-hearted Mord clan. Vakir tried to console her, saying that he believed her cousin had left this world comfortably. However, Camus looked at him and expressed her doubts, stating that she was a genius and understood a little of what was said. She asked him to tell her honestly if what she heard was true. Vakir felt tense and wondered if she had understood the barbarian's words correctly. What the barbarian had said previously was, we ate her. Tears once again flooded Camus' eyes, and she fell to her knees, apologizing for not being able to protect her younger cousin. Vakir witnessed her anguish and initially extended his hand to comfort her. However, he hesitated and retracted his hand back. Camus' cries filled the air, leaving Vakir standing there pondering the situation. After a while, Camus managed to compose herself, wiping away the tears that stained her cheeks. She made it clear that she didn't want any half-hearted sympathy, stating that she would have killed anyone who offered it. Looking at the cure, she declared that it wasn't the time to mourn and that she needed to regain her composure quickly to seek revenge. The cure admired Camus' strength and determination, acknowledging that heroines were indeed different. He reached out his hand towards her, agreeing with her sentiments. However, just as Camus was about to take his hand, a loud sound echoed through the air, resembling the ringing of a bell. Curious about the source of the sound, the cure questioned its origin. Camus stood up and explained that it was a signal, notifying them of a barbarian attack. The cure commented that her time for revenge had come rather quickly. Outside the fortress, a group of barbarian girls sat atop white wolves, armed with bows and arrows. Their leader, a skilled archer, notched an arrow and shot it towards the guards stationed on the fortress walls. Caught off guard, the guards had no time to react as the arrow exploded near them, causing devastation. The barbarian girl signaled her companions to begin the attack. With their wolves, they engaged in a fierce battle against the soldiers of the Mord clan. The wolves fought ferociously, while the barbarians slashed at their enemies. They skillfully used ropes to incapacitate the soldiers, tightening them around their necks. In the midst of the chaotic scene, the cure arrived and witnessed the gruesome sight. He wondered if he had arrived too quickly, observing the intense battle between the morgue soldiers and the barbarians. Suddenly, a rope flew towards the cure and wrapped tightly around his neck. Confused, 
he looked ahead and realized that two barbarian girls had skillfully used ropes to capture him. They spoke in their native language, mentioning something about catching a good catch and their successful hunt for husbands. Understanding their intentions, the Kir contemplated the barbarians' plan to capture people and make them suitors, aiming to create a superior tribe. He quickly seized hold of the rope and swung it, sending the girls flying through the air. With a grin, he informed them that he couldn't be their husband and jokingly added that he might already be engaged. As the two barbarian girls crashed onto the ground, the male barbarians watched in shock. Uncertain of Vakir's affiliation, they readied their arrows, preparing for an attack. One of them asked his companion if Vakir belonged to the enemy forces. Undeterred by the situation, Vakir didn't back down. He bravely moved forward, marching straight towards the incoming arrows. In his mind, he remembered Hugo's request to avoid initiating a battle until joining up with the main force. He pondered whether he should wait or take action. With unwavering determination, the Kir unsheathed his sword and deftly cut down the incoming arrows with precise strikes, showcasing his impressive skill and agility. The barbarians were astonished by the Kir's display of prowess and expressed their disbelief. However, their surprise was short-lived as a sudden burst of fire engulfed them, causing cries of pain. Camus, who had cast the fire spell, emerged from behind Vakir, expressing her anger towards the barbarians and declaring their imminent demise. Vakir stared at Camus in awe, realizing that she had turned the entire area into a blazing inferno. Camus questioned Vakir, asking if he had used liquid aura, indicating that she recognized his abilities as a graduator. She stated that she knew he was the only man she could acknowledge. Vakir confirmed that he had received an order from the Patriarch to avoid battles until regrouping with the main force. Unfazed by the situation, Camus began casting multiple spells and inquired if it was an order from Baskerville's Patriarch. She asserted that a Baskerville should refrain from intervening, as she intended to eliminate all the barbarians. Camus unleashed a series of powerful attacks, engulfing a vast area in front of them with scorching flames. Vakir watched in shock, recognizing the spell as burn. He also noticed that she employed a quadra-casting technique for her burning spells, increasing their lethality. Driven by her desire to avenge her younger cousin, Camus continued to cast spells, resolute in her quest for revenge. Suddenly, a barbarian used a blow dart and shot a needle that landed on Camus' neck. Feeling the sting, she realized she had been poisoned. Camus noticed a barbarian riding on the back of a wolf, responsible for the attack. Unable to move due to the numbing poison, Camus fell to the ground. Vakir observed her condition and thought to himself that she was quite a handful. The barbarian then threw a rope towards Camus, but Vakir swiftly caught it before it could reach her. Camus acknowledged his catch and complimented him. Looking at her, Vakir suggested that it would be better for them to retreat. Camus questioned what would happen to the farmlands and the captives. Vakir replied that it would be wiser to avoid engaging in battles until the main force from Baskerville arrived. Refusing to retreat, Camus was determined to avenge her cousin who had been taken by the barbarians. Vakir gazed at her and urged her to make a rational decision. However, in the next moment, Vakir sensed an arrow attack coming from behind his head. With quick reflexes, he managed to dodge the arrow just in time. Vakir observed the barbarian girl who had launched the arrow and wondered if this was the destructive power Camus had mentioned earlier. Lost in his thoughts, he was caught off guard as a barbarian approached from behind and swiftly took Camus away. Desperate, Camus called out Vakir's name, pleading for his help. Frustrated by the unfolding scene, Vakir contemplated the situation. He recalled a past incident when Camus Mork, still an adolescent, had been held captive but returned after annihilating the barbarians. Despite her reputation as the Queen of Le Rouge et Le Noir, Vakir realized that he needed to take action. Suddenly, the barbarian girl lunged at Vakir, launching an attack. With remarkable agility, he evaded her strike, his senses heightened. To his surprise, he noticed that she had used a bow to attack him. The barbarian girl then attempted to speak in his language. You, me. We meet again, she said. 
the Kir looked at her and recognized her as the barbarian girl he had freed during the slave auctions. In his mind, he couldn't help but label her as a troublemaker. The Kir notices who the barbarian was, he recalls seeing her at the slave auction as the one that he had let go. The Kir asks her if she was repaying his kindness with revenge, but she tells him that she was a slave and needed to take revenge for her capture, and that it has nothing to do with him, just the morgue family. She leaps onto her pet wolf, as she turns to leave with her group, she tells Vakir that she had repaid what she got, and that they had taken the next leader of the morgue family, Camus, and that if he wanted her back, he needed to follow them. Vakir thinks about revealing his power here but Uncle Adolf had arrived, he was shouting after Camus while bringing the reinforcement, Vakir sees him and thinks that he had run all the way here after hearing about the ambush, just as Adolf prepares a blue spell in his hand, he calls the barbarians bastards, he unleashes the spell into the group, sending shockwaves that appear to chase after the barbarians, as he shouts at them to return back Camus to him, but the barbarians were unaffected by the shockwaves from the ground, as they easily rode their wolves, dodging the attack and making a swift exit, they leap through the rubble that the spell had caused that slowly disappeared from the base, the Kir and Adolf along with the reinforcements could only curse and stare at the barbarians as they easily left them behind. The Kir thinks about the Balak's ambush, seeing that they had finished the ambush just three minutes after the warning bell had been rung, things became worse because it overlapped with Camus' carelessness and lack of practical experience. The Kir notices that a subordinate was telling Adolf that they believed that the Balak's had run off to the restricted area of the Lourouge et Lenoir mountain. Adolf couldn't believe that the Balak's had gone into the restricted area of the mountain with Camus. Adolf thinks about the restricted area knowing that it was undiscovered and a dangerous place, heading there at night was going to be too dangerous, he thinks. About Camus and wondered if there was nothing he could do now, but Vakir joins into their talk, telling them that they could still pursue the ball axe, catching Adolf's and his men attention. He tells them that he had been in the dense forest before in his childhood, but deep down in his thoughts, Vakir knew about the forest because of his past regression and that he had recon and subjugation experience as he went through most of the dense forest. Adolf grabs Vakir's shoulder at because of what he just said, asking Vakir if he was actually serious, the man behind Adolf informs him that going into the La Rouge mountain itself was a suicide mission, but Adolf tells him that he will only bring those that want to go, and wouldn't make an issue out of it later, as Vakir nervously looks at Adolf's hand on his shoulder. Adolf thought to himself that he already knew that Vakir was extraordinary but had no other choice then to rely on him. The moonlight pierces the skies as Adolf tells Vakir that he will leave it to him to save his niece Camus. A metal fence is seen with a skull sign. It was the booty of the dense forest on the La Rouge Mountain residing on the Baskerville territory. Inside the dense forest, there were many creatures such as the bone-sucking mosquitoes, poisonous thorny vines, silent spiders and other dangerous creatures. A normal human being would never last for more than an hour in there, which was why it was called the life-engulfing forest. Something bounces off a tree branch, Adolf and his men are seen following a red streak of light bouncing side to side. Adolf asks Staffordshire if all the kids from the Baskerville clan were like the Kier, but he tells him of course not as the triplets follow them from behind. Yellow hornets with red glowing eyes appears, just like the ones in Pokemon, the Kier grabs onto his sword preparing himself just as Staffordshire tells Adolf that Vakir was special, Vakir. Easily slices the yellow hornets into pieces, the triplets stare at him in amazement, all of them were thinking about how cool Vakir was, Vakir peeks out from his cover, sending a signal to everyone else, catching Adolf and Staffordshire's attention, a bright orange glow is seen in the distance as Vakir tells them that he doesn't think that the barbarians have gotten far, he tells them of a rumor he heard that the Balak hunter would scatter dry leaves to hear the sound of their chasers, he warns them that they needed to be more careful from here onwards, Adolf approaches the Kir and casts a spell called silence, he explains to him that this magic would prevent him from making noise as he walks, Adolf tells the Kir to let him take over from here and that he won't forget this, calling him nephew-in-law, the Kir grows nervous at the thought of this nephew-in-law, a campfire is lit, showing that the barbarians were all gathered around the fire with their wolves on standby, Camus was tied to a string, shouting at them, calling them bitches and that once she was free, she will burn them all to death, she continues to yell at them, telling them that she'll show them the horror of her special fireball and that they should prepare themselves, but they ignored her, 
two females were talking about how they liked the guy they saw before and that they failed in husband hunting. Kimu began to breath heavily from all the shouting as sweat drips down her face. She thinks about how they weren't even listening to her, and that they've been talking about husband and wife hunting since earlier. She wonders if that was why they kept ambushing them but a foot appears near her, a male barbarian appears stroking his chin, saying that since they captured Kamu, all the males within the tribe would want her. Kamu yells at him calling him a perverted bastard, asking what he was planning to do to her and that they should kill her instead, but the man cleaned his ears saying he doesn't understand what she was saying, he grabs her face instead knowing that she was talking back because of the look in her eyes, he licks an arrow as he stares at Kamu's face telling her that an arrogant slave should be disciplined, but Ayan interrupts them, she calls him a hun and tells him to get away from her slave, a hun talks back to Ayan saying that he was the one who captured Kamu, but Ayan tells him that it was bullshit and to keep his voice down, but a hun continues to argue saying he was the one that shot the paralyzing arrow and set up the trap, but Ayan tells him that she made it possible because she stopped Fakir, who was good with the sword, or else he would be dead. Kemu stares at them arguing and wonders if an internal argument was breaking out. She looks at Ayan and assumes she was the commander. She thinks deeply about how Ayan had the skill to go against Fakir, who was a low-ranking graduator, and that if she wanted to escape, Kemu needed to do something about Ayan first. Ahan continues to shout at Ayan telling her that he won't let her stubbornness slide just because she was the commander, but Ayan's hand began to glow blue. She lets out an intense glare at Ahan, revealing a horrifying blue aura as she tells him that if he was angry, he could come at her any time, and she would turn him into a bloody mess, seeing Ayan this way. Send an overwhelming sense of fear into a hun, he then decides to give up and back off as Ayan continued to stare at him intensely, Kamu sees a hun leaving angrily and thought that Ayan had one, Ayan praises Kamu's eyes and physique as she came from a good bloodline, but she kicks into Kamu's shoulder hard telling Kamu that she was captured by the Morg clan bastards and sold into slavery as Kamu lets out a painful grunt. Ayan recalls her meeting with Vakir, and that she was lucky to receive some kindness, that allowed for her to escape from the fate of a slave, but her eyes were filled with anger as she tells Kamu that she won't be as lucky, and that she'll take her time to tame Kamu so much that she would feel it in her bones and soul, making licking the spaces between her toes a daily routine for Kamu, but an explosion erupts all of a sudden behind Ayan. Ayan turns around and both her and Kamu were shocked to see the explosion, the barbarians shouted out that it was an ambush, as some of them were set on fire, screaming in pain, footsteps are seen walking through the fire, Adolf appears among the flames, calling out to barbarians, that he had come to repay them for what they did, Kamu was happy to recognize that voice. She sees that it was her uncle, with fire in his hand, Adolf shouts to them to return his niece back to him this instant. The barbarians could only stare as everything was set ablaze in front of them, they see that the Morgue and Baskerville clan members were easily killing each of the barbarians, Vakir was sitting on a branch of a tree, witnessing how everything was unfolding, he looks at the scene before him, thinking that something was strange, he wondered why the Balaks who ambushed them before so perfectly, was now panicking this easily from an attack, the barbarians turned to run away from the attack on their wolves calling the Morgue and Baskerville clans crazy bastards, for causing such an uproar inside the forest in the middle of the night, but Adolf shouts at his members telling them to not let a single barbarian run away alive, just as two Morgue members chased after the barbarians, Camus laughs at the barbarians and tells them they were getting what they deserved, but a sound rustles behind her causing her to sit upright, her face grew nervous as she slowly turns around to see what it was, it was. Vakir he signals to her to be quiet as she yells out his name, he cuts the ropes that were tying Kamu to the tree with ease, Kamu is happy to see him as he lifts her up, asking if he came to save her, the cure replies back to her if she doesn't understand what hand gesture was used for keeping quiet, but their chat was cut off as Ian appears before them, telling the cure that she knew that the boy who uses knives well would come, she tells him that his strong physique that made it possible to cover a long distance within a short period of time, and his level-headedness that made it possible for him to get through the darkness of the forest, adding on his passionate and pure love that made him put his life on the line for his girl, all these conditions were perfect, as Ian tells Vakir that she won't ask about his past and that he had passed, Vakir looks at her and wondered what he had passed, but Camus and Ian send lightning stares at one another as they both know what each of them wanted, Vakir is a lady's man, Vakir pulls Camus closer to him, causing her to blush slightly, 
as he thinks about not being able to hide his powers in this situation, and that he couldn't recall anything about Ayan from his past life. Ayan seemed pissed that Kamu was close to Vakir, as he wonders if she was the one that gave the nose bridge scar to Hugo's face, and if she was the Black Archer Knight Fox, but he changes his thought as he realizes that she was too young and unskilled to be the Night Fox, but was probably someone who had the same bloodline, but as they were talking a blow dart is seen pointing at them, Vakir sees the attack going to Kamu and easily blocks it with his hand, Ahun was shocked to see this and wondered how Vakir knew as he was hiding in the bushes, Vakir decides to pick up Kamu causing her to scream a bit as he realized that things had become bothersome, he tells Kamu to bear it with him for a little, and that he will return her to his uncle, Kamu. Agrees shyly, thinking that he was still out of it as he was using formal language, which might be because of the poison, Vakir and Kamu quickly leap away leaving Ayan to stand alone in Slyans, she scratches her head saying that she wanted Vakir to return with her obediently, as Vakir and Kamu escape, he asks her if she was severely poisoned, Kamu replies shly while blushing that she thinks so, all of a sudden two barbarians appear and shoot arrows at them, Vakir manages to block their attacks with his sword as Kamu shrieks from fear, Ayan then prepares her arrow, lightly releasing a blue aura that covered the arrow, she stretches the bow string and prepares her shot, with her arrow glowing blue intensely, her gaze filled with focus as she prepares to get rid of Kamu, she lets go of the arrow which unleashes a powerful blue streak of light, the arrow soon reaches the back of Vakir as he carries Kamu, he turns his head in a swift motion and sees the powerful arrow. Reaching them, Kamu turns as well due to Vakir and sees the arrow just inches away from her eye, huge pillars of ice suddenly erupt throughout the forest following the attack of the arrow, sweat drips down Kamu's face as she spots the arrow standing still just inches from her face. Adolf appears and had used ice magic to freeze the arrow from attack Vakir and Kamu. He shouts at Kamu asking if she was alright. Kamu was glad to see her uncle arrived. Adolf casts cure poison to heal Kamu. He holds Kamu dearly and mentioned that the poison was really severe and numbing, which was difficult for him to remove everything, and tells her that they needed to visit the divine Quo Vadis when they return, but Kamu pushes his hand away asking him to let her go for a moment. Instead she runs towards Vakir and hugs him with all her might, telling him that he had saved her again, seeing the shocked Adolf, tears filled his eyes and he tries to tell her that he too also tried his best, but Kemu was not happy with him, she yells at him, wondering why he had only come now and that she was going to tell her mother everything, just as Kemu was yelling at Adolf, a rope appears around Vakir's face, the rope tightly wraps itself around Vakir's neck as Ian appears behind him holding the rope tightly and surprising Vakir. She tries her best to pull Vakir but couldn't, she wondered why he was so strong and why he wasn't moving backwards, she tells Vakir to be obedient and to let himself be captured as she was running out of time, Vakir easily snaps the rope into pieces thinking why was there no time, Kamu yells at her saying it was you again, Vakir thought deeply about the reason why the Balak were in a hurry, soon enough a demonic being gaze was felt, an ominous deadly aura was felt throughout the forest. Ayan trembles in fear as she gazes at the sky, saying shit did it finally noticed, even Vakir's weapon Beelzebub was activating on its own and causes a buzz, Vakir looks at it wondering why the Beelzebub in his veins were giving him an intense warning, he knew that it meant that something was coming, Ayan tells him that she was coming as sweat drips down her face, fear overtook her as she spoke its name, Madame Eight Legs, as she looked up, a sudden pillar appears though it pierced through the forest and was aiming for the skies, Everyone looked at it, the barbarians and even its wolves were terrified at its appearance, saying that the madam was here. Vakir and Kamu looked up and wondered why a pillar had appeared. The pillar was releasing a scary looking purple aura, and soon split into various legs. Hell no, if I was there, I would be running away instantly. Like by Felicia, the legs attack various places throughout the forest, as Adolf covers Kamu and Vakir, he questions why. There was such a monster's hiding in the forest. Vakir recalls what the monster was and didn't expect to see it in a place like this, if Vakir's memory was right, it was Madame Eight Legs who had an S rank rating, Madame Eight Legs lets out a horrifying shriek of madness that was heard throughout the forest as the three of them stare in horror. As Kamu tries to shout out what that was, Vakir quickly covers her mouth telling her that she can't make loud noises, he explains to her that even though Madame Eight Leg has poor sight, it has sensitive touch and hearing. Vakir recalls an old native prior to his regression, about the incident seen and heard about at the La Rouge et Lenoir mountain, the legend the elder told seemed like a horror story, 
it was a horror story about the madam with eight legs which inhabited in the depths of the forest, according to the Empire's Monster Dictionary, which was finalized after seven revisions, there were written records of Madam Eight Legs, that its risk ranking was S, and was a monster capable of destroying a nation within a single day, making it a disaster rank, Madam Eight Legs lets out a horrible shriek causing green slime to spread all around from its mouth, as though it was part of Nickelodeon's slime show, the green slime melts the branches of the tree, the cure dodges the green slime. With ease while Adolf protects Camus from the slime using a spell shield, but Hans lets out a scream like a little girl, he shouts out as Madame's poison had landed on his hair, no more man buns for him, the hair covered with poison was quickly cut off, Ian had cut it off whispering to him that he was an idiot for screaming in front of the Madame, just as a hun kneels down on the ground, Ian couldn't believe what happened and looked up, she sees that Madame Eight Legs was looking right at her. She tells a hun that she would have killed him but he was lucky that he was the grandchild of the shaman. She whispers to the others to quickly retreat. On the other side, the Kir and others were making a run for it too, as Adolf whispers to them that they needed to get away. But Madame Eight Legs had spotted both groups and slowly senses their movements with her. I don't know what this is man, is this a tongue? Comment below what you think this part is. Madame Eight Legs had spotted the two groups who were retreating differently. The Balaks were running away in small groups just like the Blue Dots, whereas the Morgues and Baskerville members were running away in a large group just like the Red Dots. There was a slight difference in how the two groups retreated, but it made the Madam decide who to chase after. It decided to chase Vakir and the others. Adolf asked why it was coming their way, a member of. The Morg clan tells Adolf to leave it to him as he knew that a bug's weakness was a fire attack. He conjures a huge fireball and sends it flying towards the Madam. It lands and causes a huge explosion in its face. The members saw the explosion and believed that the fireball attack had worked. The man asked Adolf if he had saw that but was interrupted when one of Madame's legs pierced through the man beside him into the air. The man could only stare as blood flew all over from its attack. Blood was spilled on his face as tears began to form. He looks at the Madame and realized that the fireball attack had nothing. Adolf was panicking as he was running away wondering what the hell was that. But Vakir was deep in thought. He decided that this was it. As the others continued to run away, Vakir had turned around, surprising them. Staffordshire sees this and asks what Vakir was doing. Vakir tells him that at the rate they were going, they were all going to be killed, so one of them is. Needed to tie down the monster's legs, Staffordshire then offers to do it, but Vakir cuts him off, telling him that his skills were not enough to tie down the monster's leg. Everyone could only stare at Vakir in silence as he explained to them that they couldn't afford to bring the monster back into the territory with them, and that in the current situation, the best person has to tie its leg down, which was Vakir as he holds his sword closely, he tells Adolf that there was no time and a decision was left in him, but Camus was shocked to see what Vakir was doing, Adolf hesitated at the idea of leaving behind Vakir alone but Vakir tells him to hurry and run away. Adolf then decides to leave Vakir telling the others to not let his nephew-in-law's sacrifice be in vain. Tears form in Camus' eyes as she calls out to Vakir while Adolf pulls her away from him. Camus' voice could be heard telling Vakir to return but Adolf tells her not to move as Vakir holds his sword tightly. But he lets out a deep breathe and lets go of his sword. He looks ahead and thinks that he has no intention in the destruction of the Baskerville territory, and that the Allied forces could not stop the madam who was still growing. However this was a good opportunity for Vakir, as he plans to fake his death in order to get away from Hugo, to buy enough time for him to learn the tenth technique in his head, he decides to return to the clan, only when he was skilled enough to not be pushed around by Hugo. Or when he had perfect control over his skill, being able to hide and control it, was when he will return, Vakir's unleashes the full power of Beelzebub in his arm, revealing its demonic energy blade, knowing that if he doesn't go all out, he would die. Madame Eight Legs stares at Vakir as Vakir stares back at it, preparing himself for his hardest fight yet. The Baskervilles and Beelzebub's demonic energy surrounds Vakir's body as he slowly unleashes all his skills, the large amount of mana he received from the river sticks his blessing, the aura that was more worldly and used for high-ranking Baskerville swordsmanship techniques, and finally, the demonic sword Beelzebub. Vakir's eyes were filled with intense focus as he tells the monster that he was going to use everything he has to attack it. Vakir leaps forward with crazy speed in a zigzag motion, and leaps through all the tress in the forest into the night sky. 
The red aura follows him as he makes his way into the clouds, his demonic sword glowed red as he sees Madame Eight Legs right in front of him. Madame Eight Legs lets out a shriek as it spots Vakir in the air. Vakir gives it a bombastic side eye while raising his sword up in the air, unleashing an immensely powerful attack that turned the pages black and white and the drawer colorblind, revealing a bright red attack from him that strikes Madame Eight Leg head on. It was the Baskerville's fifth technique. Fury rose in Vakir's face as he attacks with all his soul and strength. Madame Eight Legs soon began to tremble from the power of Vakir's strike, causing it to slam into Mother Earth as Vakir's attack was powerful enough to force it to the ground. The attack caused a bright red glow to appear in the forest, which began to shine like a diamond in the sky. Soon a huge crimson red glow appears in the forest and reaches for the sky, just as Adolf and the others made it out of the forest. Camus sees the intense glow unveiling right before her eyes. Tears fall from her face as she witnesses what happens next. The red glow slowly begins to die down as Camus screams out, Vakir. Vakir is seen tied to a guillotine, awaiting his death as two bloodhound guards stood by his sides holding their swords up high. Vakir wore an expressionless face as he thinks about his final moments. But even in his final moments, his eyes were filled with an intense red glow as he stares at something in front of him. Hugo was standing proud and tall as the moonlight casts light on him, as a platoon of bloodhounds stood behind him. Hugo slowly raises his hand in the air while his eyes glowed bright red in the night. His eyes released an intense glow and glare as he pushes his hand in a downward motion. The sound of a sharp blade meeting flesh and bone was heard in the night as blood was seen splattered in the sky. Vakir's vision of Hugo and the others were now at a low viewpoint as everything started to look hazy. Blood soon filled his vision as he looks at the numerous red stares from his once former family members. Hugo slowly walks away from Vakir as his vision was almost filled with blood. But his eyes were still focused on Hugo's head as he left Vakir alone. Hugo so in the end you, muttered Vakir as his vision fades to black. Vakir then slowly opens his eyes after awakening from his dream. He stares at the ceiling and saw that he was in some sort of cottage. Bandages covered his face and body as he lay on a bed made of something while his neck was tied to a rope. He wonders what this place is. He thinks about how he didn't know how many days had passed, or how he had survived the battle against Madame Eight Legs. He recalls back to the moment when he had unleashed his most powerful attack on Madame Eight Leg, realizing that during that crucial moment, if Madame hadn't stopped in her tracks upon receiving a shock from the explosion's light, the cure would have lost his life. The cure slowly sits upright while holding his injured shoulder, he thinks about how his muscles' veins, and even bones were all injured. There wasn't a place in his body where he felt uninjured. Vakir didn't think this would be the extent of his injuries after receiving a hit head on. He realizes that he had misjudged Madame's attack power so bad that he could even feel it in his bones. Vakir then holds onto the rope around his neck, wondering if it was because of this that caused him to have a neck ache that he was feeling now after the battle against Madame, but it was because of it that he was saved. Vakir started to think about the others, and wondered if he could consider it as going according to plan. His plan of escaping Hugo's watch was a success as, besides Adolf and Camus, many other witnesses could prove his death, allowing Vakir to not worry about his death being proven. Vakir exits the cottage tent and notices something. He sees barbarians of different ages and genders walking around. He recognizes it as the Balak's camp called Bulak, and he wonders if he was being held captive in their camp. Vakir thinks about how he was in the midst of the camp that belongs to the natural enemies of the Baskerville clan, which was bad for him as he couldn't run away with his ruined body. A voice shouts out saying hurry up. Walk, just as a group of prisoners appeared behind Vakir with their hands bound together. A female barbarian was holding the rope attached to four of the men's necks as prisoners while shouting at them that if they don't move quickly they would die from the wolf's bite. Vakir watches them from a distance and was surprised as he recognizes their faces as people who were soldiers from the Baskerville and Morgue clans. He watches them leave thinking about why he was not being executed. A foot appears behind him saying that he was up. Vakir looks back and sees a punk rock hairstyle barbarian male asking him if he could speak Balak. Vakir recognizes the barbarian as Ahun, the barbarian holding the dart blower who tried to attack him from the bushes a few days ago. Ahun tells Vakir that he should be thankful that he wasn't going to end up with the same fate as the prisoners he had just seen. 
Ahun then smirks right in the face of Vakirs, asking him how he felt watching his comrades walk towards their death, and that he must be in despair since he could not do anything with that crippled body. With an evil smile on his face, Ahun tells Vakir that if he weren't the commander's pet dog, he would have boiled Vakir right away. Hearing the words pet dog triggered something deep within Vakir's soul. He visualizes Hugo's face with his hands filled with chains and a dark aura. The chains were slowly suffocating Vakir as his body was slowly being covered by the chains and dark aura. Ahun suddenly felt an immense pressure wondering what it was. He looks at Vakir and sees that his eyes were filled with murderous intent and that his hockey was extremely strong, One Piece reference. Ahu responded with a punch to Vakir's face calling him an arrogant bastard. The punch left Vakir on the ground trembling slightly as he didn't respond back, Ahun leaves him alone telling Vakir that he should stop standing there and go find his owner who was at the end of the rope. Vakir slowly got up and looked at Ahun walking away. His eyes were filled with revenge as he had memorized Ahun's face and swore to get his revenge once his body recovers. Vakir walks past a few more cottage tents in the camp. He slowly pulls onto the rope inch by inch as he made his way out of the camp wondering how the rope was this long. He walks a bit further but soon notices that he had walked quite a fair bit but still couldn't see the end of the rope, which causes him to wonder if his owner was actually at the end of the rope. All of a sudden the rope tightens itself. Vakir notices that the rope was being pulled in a certain direction. He sees that the end of the rope was leading into a pool of water, where Ayan was seen submerged inside. She was holding onto the end of the rope but remained silent. Vakir and Ayan were soon entering an awkward staring contest with one another, as Vakir stood on land while Ayan was submerged in the waters. She gives him a wide smile before telling him to lie down. Vakir was suddenly pulled forward by her. As his head was pulled forward by Ayan a certain object went through the spot where his head was originally. An arrow lands on a tree. Ayan came out of the water and shouted at a group of children calling them brats and telling them to go practice somewhere else. Meanwhile, Vakir was just laying on the ground motionless. Ayan then turns to him to thank him for setting her free at the slave auction. She points a finger at Vakir telling him that she was the kind to return kindness twofold while returning tenfold when it comes to revenge, and since he had saved her once before, she had now saved him twice. Vakir wondered where the twice came from. She explains to him that she had gone back for him after his fight with Madame Eight Legs, and if she didn't do that he would have died, so he needed to be thankful that she was tenacious. Vakir then asks her if she was the one who had set up the rope attached to his neck but Ayan simply smiled at him as he asks her another question about the reason why she was keeping him alive. The rope tightens around his neck which catches Vakir's attention while Ayan informs him that she noticed that Vakir seemed to be in a high position within his party. While pulling his rope Ayan tells him how she wonders how much his party would pay for him. Vakir starts to grow nervous as he thought that he was in trouble, he knew that if the barbarians started hostage negotiations with the Baskerville clan, his original plan of escaping Hugo's watch would have become meaningless. He thinks deeply about what he should do in this situation. Ayan flashes a smile and chuckles. She asks Vakir about what he was thinking and if he had felt a sense of hope. But CK! Ayan tells Vakir that unfortunately, he wasn't going back to his party as she pulls him closer while slowly taking out a blade from her thick juicy thigh. She cuts the long rope while telling Vakir that he was going to be her slave, lucky man, but Vakir was actually glad to hear that. Ayan then points her blade towards Vakir telling him that they should decide on their titles first and that Vakir should call her master, sorry lady but our hero ain't a beta is a goddamn alpha am I right viewers? But Vakir doesn't respond at all and just remains silent like a giga chad. Ayan laughs and tells him that she liked his rebellious eyes and that it would be fun taming him. Ayan then sheets her blade back into its cover on her thigh. She looks forward and tells Vicar that before they get into the taming, they had to go somewhere else first. Vakir then asks her where they were going. Ayan smiles happily as the sunlight brightens her face, she tells Vakir that it was obvious. Vakir had to give his greetings when he stepped into someone else's land, a cottage tent is seen with skulls hung around and on top of it. An arrow is pierced through the thick skull of a dead crocodile. Ayan informs Vakir that they will be visiting the village head which is the matriarch, 
just as a fierce mommy-looking barbarian woman is seen sitting on top and around the dead bodies of animals who had their skulls pierced by a single arrow. The Kir and Ayan were now walking back through the camp of the Balaks together. A. Ayan explains to Vakir that if he didn't have a place to sleep, you could just sleep under friend's hammock, and if he was ever hungry, he could get food from someone who was more affluent. Ayan tells him that this was how the Balaks were living as. She turns to Vakir and informs him that their way of life may mean nothing to outsiders, but to the people who lived here it was a very homely place, and that it would be good for Vakir to get used to their way of living. But Vakir commented that he noticed that the Balaks had no regard for private assets. Ayan then informs Vakir that they had arrived at the matriarch's house, which was the cottage tent covered with skulls shown before. Ayan entered the house first and informs her mother that they were here. As Vakir entered the house he catches the word mother. Ayan's mother stood up saying you're here. She takes note that Ayan had brought back the empirical boy that she was talking about every day. Hearing this made Ayan fluster as she tells her mother that she didn't talk about Vakir every day. The Kir connected the dots in his head after seeing that Ayan was the matriarch's daughter of the Balak tribe. Which might be that her mother was the Night Fox. The Night Fox was the female Balak warrior who had scarred Hugo's nose bridge, and was the reason behind why the Kir could not cross the La Rouge et Lenoir Mountains landscape. The Kir thinks about his past self and wondered what would happen to his past version if he had gone up against her. He started to experiment in his head about his chances if he were to fight her in head-on combat which ended up in 0%. He then thought of his chances of winning if he went through the assassination route but realized that it was still at 0%. Vakir gulps nervously as a sweat drop drips down from his face after imaging those situations in his head. Seeing the night fox's intense deadly aura up close made him realize that if he had run away, his chances were only a mere 20% but the 20% would only be referring to his survival rate. The night fox takes a look at the Kier's face and tells him that he had seen his face before. The Kier wondered nervously if she had realized that he was from the same bloodline as Hugo by instinct, but the night fox brushes it off by saying that most imperial men look the same. She asks Ayan about what she was planning on doing to the Kier as he was no different from a cripple but Ayan tells her that Vakir would be useful once he receives good treatment as he was the one who attacked Madame Eight Legs after all. But her mother warns her that taking action without knowing your place might come back to bite you. The night fox brushes off Ayan's initial intentions as it didn't matter to her whether Vakir's body was destroyed or not, she only cared about whether his seed was fine, Ayan became flustered and told her mother that it was not about that. The Kir begins to inspect certain objects in the house while the mother and daughter continued to argue. Ayan tells her mother that she was going to use Vakir was a slave, but her mother was surprised to hear that as she was talking about doing something else to Vakir, before her mother could complete her sentence, A. Ayan yells at her that she just needed Vakir as a slave to support her during hunts. Night Fox soon pats Ayan's head which causes her to blush as she tells her that it is up to the owner to do what they want to do with their slave. A. Ayan then takes a peek, and sees Vakir checking out the main pillar of the house. They soon left the house and went to walk back to the forest. As they walk together Vakir tells Ayan that he had a question. He asks her what her name was, causing Ayan to yell at him about suddenly asking a question all of a sudden and how he dared to ask questions as a slave. But Vakir informs her that he does not intend to call her his master which was why he asked what her name was. Ayan rubs her head before telling Vakir that her name was Ayan. Vakir then introduces himself as Vakir and asks her what she wanted him to do by her name. Ayan was flustered at Vakir calling her by her name and told him how dare a slave call her by her name. She then decides to give Vakir his first order. A. Ayan points her finger at her and shouts out that his first order was to build a house, a house that he will be living in from now on. Ayan thinks mischievously about how Vakir was acting too arrogant as a slave and that there was no way an imperial bastard like him would know how to build a house. She continues to think that ordering a slave around was part of a master's competency and that she needed to use this chance to rebalance the hierarchy between them. Meanwhile, Vakir was thinking about the first order of building a house. He smiles and says that this was going to be fun. After some time we see Ayan standing still with her hands behind her back wearing a stunned expression on her face. The Kir points to a makeshift tent and tells her that he had carried out her order. She looks at the tent that the Kir built and wondered why he was so good at building tents, 
she thought that he would have struggled to build a house because of his injured body. Ian turns around to look at the building materials that she brought over, she thinks that since he managed to build the house, there was no use for the items that she had brought with her. The Kir was happy with the house he built as he thought that it had been a while. He recalls his past memories during the time of destruction when swordsmen were only good at wielding swords which was why they couldn't survive. So in order to survive in extreme situations, one would need to learn a variety of survival skills. Ian inspects the drains that Vakir had dug out and commented that they were perfect too. Vakir informs her that the matriarch's tent looked unstable, this catches Ian's attention as it was about her mother. Vakir explained to her in detail in regards to her mother's tent problems stating that in its current state, during the rainy seasons the ground around the central pillar will shake which might cause water to leak through, if she orders him to, Vakir was willing to mix limey dirt and gravel on the opposite hill to create bricks, which he will reinforce the bricks by spreading oil and burning it. Hearing the long explanation made Ian order Vakir to do what he said as she was thinking the same thing. Vakir then went on to gather the materials to create the bricks as AI and watched him from behind a tree. He then started to roast the brick mixture to form the actual bricks while Ian watched closely by his side. They soon met up with the matriarch once again, with Vakir carrying a wagon filled with the bricks he had made. Night Fox was surprised to learn about her house problems from them. After a while Vakir had created a solution made up of bricks to help resolve the issues the matriarch's house was having. The matriarch tells them that she was frustrated because of the numerous amount of time she had tried to repair the roof, water would still be leaked through, she now realizes that the main problem was the main pillar. She tells Vakir that he had done a good job while informing her daughter that she had picked up quite a useful mail. She then instructs Vakir to go around the barracks to take care of tedious matters such as this, Ian remains silent while looking concerned at Vakir nods his head upon hearing her mother's command. Vakir was seen washing the rags at a nearby river when Aion calls out to him, catching his attention. She asks him if it was exhausting to just slave away and wonders if he wants to be an official member of their tribe. Vakir continues to wash the rags while answering her that slaving away wasn't too bad, he thinks about how it was much more peaceful being a slave here than being part of the Baskervilles or living in the underdog city. Aion was surprised to hear that kind of reply from Vakir. She stated that from the way Vakir spoke he had been disciplined well, and that from a slave's perspective, it would be hard to complain, Vakir continued to tell her that it really was not that bad, I in the reply saying there was no way it wasn't when he was doing tough and tedious work. Vakir ignores her and continues to do his work, Ian follows behind him and tells him to not be silent and to follow her, as she would be able to help him in terms of surviving and adjusting in the Balak's tribe. Ian informs him that if he does a good job, she will remove the rope around his neck, this offer catches Vakir's attention and he turns around to tell her that that offer sounded appealing. He then asks her about what he should do, AI and smiles and tells him that he was now being honest. She tells Vakir that he needed to go on a hunt and capture a huge prey. She explained that the tribe's warriors haven't been able to catch prey large enough. Making the growing children unable to eat meat for a while. In other words, Vakir needed to bring in a huge prey so that changing his title from slave to commoner wouldn't be a pipe dream. Aion then smacks the back of Vakir's heart causing him to flinch, with a smile on her face she tells Vakir that he had no problem moving light objects and that all he needed to do was just assist her. Vakir was showing an annoyed expression after being smacked on the back just as Ayan tells him about how lucky he was to be the slave of the Balak's hunting commander. Vakir thought about the job of hunting for a moment and then agreed to join Ayan in hunting. Hearing this brought joy to Ayan as she smiles widely while blushing a bit. She tells Vakir that they would be leaving tomorrow but Vakir was curious about why she was smiling like that, Ayan tells him she wasn't just as a foot appears behind a tree. Ahun was glaring angrily upon hearing the conversation between Ayan and Vakir. He sees how close Vakir was getting to Ayan and calls him a disgusting bastard, jelly much? An arm covered in bandages is seen placing his hand inside a jar. When the hand is removed from the jar, some sort of grayish mud is seen coming out of the jar. A man wearing a skull headpiece with crazy eyes brows tells the hunters it's time to gather around and it was time to start the hazing ceremony, his hand is covered in the mud that was in the jar, this was a human the Balak shaman. 
a human is seen seeing down on a tree stump with a hunter kneeling before him and with other hunters forming a line to see him, he tells the hunter that was kneeling to take his blessing, if he doesn't take it it would mean that the hunter would have a hard time later on. Ian explains to Vakir that the Balak hunters feel guilty when they kill their prey, so before they kill, they spread charcoal on their faces to hide themselves from the god of death. Vakir after hearing the explanation from Ian thought about how even the Balaks which was a warrior tribe, had a shaman as well, the hunters in front of him were complaining about the fact that a human the shaman was nagging again, and the male hunter tells the female hunter to let a human be as he was a shaman that needed to establish his position in the tribe as well. Looking at a human spreading his blessing and writing on the faces of the hunter with charcoal made the hunters question the fact that the shaman's blessings usually fail a lot, and that the hunters were only just seeking his blessings whenever there was an occasion. The Kir overheard the hunters talking and thought about if it meant that a human's position as a shaman was meaningless, and realized that the Balak tribe place was not that much different from other places. Ian had received the blessing from a human and her face was covered in charcoal markings. She kinda looks like a joke. The Kir points to her and tells her that it was quite a sight to see. Ian attempts to wipe off the charcoal markings on her face, telling the Kir to shut up and that her markings were funny as she didn't get along with the shaman. While blushing hard she hands over a collar that has spikes all over it and tells Vakir to wear it. Vakir takes the collar with spikes and recognizes it as a dog collar, Ian wears a similar one and tells him that the hunters wear them on their necks so that they won't get bitten by their prey. Vakir holds onto the rope around his neck while staring at the dog collar in his hand, he thinks silently for a moment before deciding to put it on as he thought about how he was already here, and that it would be better for him to adapt to this place. A white wolf with yellow eyes is seen panting heavily with its tongue hanging out of its mouth. Vakir and Ayan are seen riding on its back, she turns around to Vakir asking him if he was really going to be okay as she had told him to hold onto her waist, but Vakir assures her that he was going to be okay. Ayan then tells him that they were going to leave now but Vakir suddenly sways heavily to the back. Ayan smiles as she looked behind after hearing a loud sound. Shimin faces Vakir and tells him that he should have grabbed onto her waist and that he would fall if he kept that up. Vakir had fallen flat on his back and onto the ground once Ayan had commended her pet wolf. He stayed flat on the ground thinking about whether he could even get up when his body was in such a horrible state. A shadow is cast over him which piques his attention as he looks up to see what it was. A hunt had once again appeared before Ayan and Vakir with his pet wolf behind him. Ayan gets down from her pet wolf and calls out to Ahun. Ahun informs her that it seems like she was very free as she was busy playing around with her slave. He continues to tell her that he was going to catch a bigger prey this time, so that in the next joint hunt, he would become the captain of the hunting group, he was even going to place his grandfather's honor on the line, Ayan questions him about why he was willing to put his grandfather's honor on the line when his grandfather only knew about shamanism. Just after Vakir had sat up to see what Ayan and Ahun were talking about, he sees something fast approaching his face. Ahun went on to kick Vakir directly onto the side of his head, this action surprises Ayan who was shocked to see what Ahun was doing to Vakir. She calls him a bastard and asked what he was doing, Ahun smiles after kicking Vakir which sent him flying backward onto the ground, he commented about the fact that Ayan had given Vakir the dog collar which was a protective piece meant for hunters but was used on Vakir who was a slave. As he continues to berate and question Ayan about how she was going to use an injured male such as Vakir as a hunting assistant, he tells her to get a hold of herself as she was a commander and that Vakir was only going to be a burden, but Ayan notices something. She shows a smile and wonders if Ahun actually believed that Vakir was just an injured male. She informs him to take a look at his waistband before saying those things. Ahun takes note of her words and looks at his waistband which showed signs of being torn apart, this shocks him. Vakir spits out some blood after being kicked by Ahun. He shows a smile and was holding onto a quiver holding onto a few arrows, he informs Ahun that he should grab hold of his weapons as he would with a lover as Ahun was still stunned as to what had just happened. Vakir then tells him that his quiver and arrows were taken away. Ayan covers her mouth to muffle the sound of her laughter as Ahun continued to look annoyed and stunned while turning to look at Vakir. Ahun finally broke out of his stunned state and rushed over to beat up Vakir even more as he calls Vakir an arrogant slave bastard. But a bow grabs onto his arm just before he lands a punch on Vakir, Ayan tells him that it was enough. 
she had used her bow to hold on to a hun to prevent him from attacking the cure even further, she asks him about whose slave he thought he was going to punish on his own accord. A hun shouts at her that the cure was a slave and that he dared to insult a Balak warrior, Ian replies back to him that he was being pathetic in front of the cure, but a hun continued to explain that the cure was just a slave and questions why she was defending him so much. He then yells at her asking if she had come to like the slave that was Vakir, Ian remained silent upon hearing that from Ahun and didn't reply back. After a brief moment, she touches her head and tells Ahun that a slave was a slave and that since Vakir did something wrong he should be punished. Ahun agrees with what Ian was saying and explained that it was what he was saying as well. But A. Ian informs him that Vakir was her slave and that he does not have the right to punish him, Vakir then looks curious at what was happening. Ian had given Vakira Saatama's one punch straight into his face as blood was splattered out. More blood could be seen splattered onto the nearby grass. Ahun was shocked and stunned once again to see what Ian had done to Vakira as she continues to beat the crap out of Vakira's punishment. Ian had finally stopped her punishment as Vakir falls onto the ground with a heavy sound. She then looks at Ahun with her eyes glowing brightly while Vakir lies flat out on the ground in front of them. She asks Ahun if he was happy now. She tells Ahun that she knew that he was upset as he was not able to catch a maiden for himself previously during the ambush with the Morg clan, as her fist was covered with Vakir's blood that was enough to drip down from her hand. Her rage explodes in a mad fury as she tells Ahun that she would beat him up once he did the same shit to her slave again with her eyes glowing brightly while her hand was still covered in Vakir's blood. Ahun was too stunned to speak as Ian asked if he got it. He tells her that he got it as Vakir continued to lie on the ground without even a single muscle moving. Some time had passed after the incident with Ahun. Ayan peeks behind with a sad and nervous look on her face. Vakir was behind her with injuries covering his face. They moved slowly through the forest on the back of Ayan's pet wolf. She then asks Vakir if her punishment had hurt and if he was angry, but Vakir remained silent and did not respond to any of her questions. She then explains to Vakir that she needed to have him punished as Ahun was a petty and stubborn guy, and that beating up Vakir as a punishment was the only way to stop his petty retaliations. Vakir remains silent even after Ayan explained her actions, she then asks him about why I was not replying to her. After a while Vakir finally replies to Ayan and states that it was because her punishment hurts, Ayan's eyes open wide as she hears his words. Ayan instantly does a headstand to spin around in the air as Vakir looks at her. She grabs onto Vakir's face quickly asking a bunch of questions, she asks him if it hurts a lot, or if it was bad, and whether his life was in danger. With his mouth being squeezed by Ayan's hand he slowly tells her that it hurts to talk. He explains to her that he had these types of injuries a lot but Ayan moves her face close to his which stops his sentence halfway, let's go girl, comment below if you are team Ayan or team Kamu. Licking sounds could be heard in the forest. Ayan was blushing heavily as she touches her mouth while facing Vakir. She then quickly turns around to face away from Vakir. Her eyes are shown to be intensely red as she tells Vakir that she knew that she was right about him and that even though he was an imperial bastard Vakir had shown promise. Vakir wipes his face with the back of his hand wondering if the barbarians usually licked each other's injuries, and that licking an injury like how Ayan just did was dangerous as it might spread an infection. She turns around shyly and asked Vakir if he needed something from her, and then even if it was one thing he should tell her because if it was something that Ayan could do, she would do anything for him. Vakir then asks if he could really ask for anything, this startles Ayan as she jolts up while telling Vakir that a Balak warrior does not go back on their word. Vakir then takes a moment to think deeply about what he wanted. Ayan's heart began to beat hard and loud, she blushes and sweats hard about what he was thinking about so hard. She wonders if Vakir wanted to actually do the deed. Vakir then tells her that if he could do anything then what he wanted was good. Ayan's heart continued to beat hard and fast in anticipation of what Vakir wanted. Vakir then tells her that he wanted her to teach him how to shoot arrows. Ayan was extremely disappointed in hearing his request and tells him that since it's about arrows it was fine. They continued to travel through the forest on the back of Ayan's pet wolf as she raises her arm telling Vakir that from tomorrow onwards they would be doing special training, Vakir agrees with her suggestion. A bunch of arrows are seen stuck into a tree. 
I in comments to Vakir that it looked like her slave has no talon in the bow and arrow and that she had told him to aim at the arrow that was already stuck in the tree. Vakir was drawing the string of the bow with sweat dripping down his face as he calls out to Ayan. He asks her if it was alright to teach him how to shoot a bow in such a position as Ayan could be seen holding onto Vakir with her legs warped around his. She smirks upon hearing Vakir's question and informs him that he was the one that asked her to teach him how to use the bow and that this was the way how young Balak warriors were taught. She continues to instruct Vakir that he should bend his back a little more, while explaining that he won't be able to use the sword for a long time, because of his body he needed to learn how to use the bow well as Vakir needed to capture a large prey for the sake of his reputation after all. Vakir struggles to get into position based on Ayan's instructions as he notes that his bones were at their limits. The sudden appearance of Ayan's pet wolf appearing in the bushes behind them cause Ayan to press a little too hard on Vakir's back as a loud cracking sound is heard. She calls out to her pet wolf called Bakira asking if he had found something, Bakira barks in response as Vakir is seen kneeling on the ground trembling in pain over Ayan's touch on his back. His face turns purple as he struggles with the pain while Ayan calls him a slave in to get up. She smiles widely at him and informs him that from here onwards they would be moving quickly. A long stream of water is seen moving rapidly as large spikes of rocks are located at the end. Ayan explains to Vakir that this is the area where the river and ocean connect so that both the ocean's water and animals could occupy this area. Ayan informs him that her grandmother told her about this that a salmon believes that if it successfully swims up the waterfall, it could evolve into a huge beast, as large numbers of salmon fishes could be seen swimming in the waters and jumping into the air. However Ayan continues her story about how most salmons fail to rise above the waterfall and fall, eventually, they would be punished when they fall onto the sharp rocks. And that the fish that falls onto the sharp rocks, would become good food for an ox bear. A huge bear with horns on its head is seen standing over a salmon that had failed to escape the waterfall and instead had been impaled by a sharp rock. The cure asks if what they were seeing was an ox bear as it looked like a completely different species, it was totally different level compared to the ones that he had seen, Ian tells the cure that the ox bear in front of them was not an ordinary one as they continue to hide behind the bushes. She explains that it was an ox bear that was born from a superior bloodline and has survived countless pandemonium. Vakir looks over to Ayan nervously and asked if she was telling him to capture that bear version of Godzilla, Ayan tells him that there was no way as she didn't tell her pet wolf Bakira to find her a strong female to hunt. A clawed brown foot appears while Ayan tells Vakir that their prey was the male bear that comes to court the female bear, just as a huge number of male ox bears appear beside the female ox bear. The female and male ox bears were soon engaged in an intense ice daring contest. The female ox bear soon bitch slaps the male ox bear straight into his face. Seeing this situation caused Vakir to be shocked. The female ox bear continues to bitch slap each of the male ox bears one by one easily with each of her claws. Vakir commented that the female ox bear keeps rejecting the proposal of the male ox bears. He soon wonders about how strong of a male ox bear was the female ox bear she was looking for as the male ox bear continued to leave the female ox bear one by one. Ayan turns to Vakir and informs him that he had the wrong way of thinking about it as it was the opposite. She finally tells him that the female ox bear was not looking for a strong male ox bear just as a pink looking male ox bear appears in front of the female ox bear. Both the male and female ox bears soon touch noses with each other. Vakir was stunned to see that the strong Godzilla like female ox bear had chosen the weakest looking male ox bear but Ayan seemed happy as she explains that the female ox bear was looking for a mate that she could boss around. She explains to Vakir that when a strong male ox bear gets excited, there were situations where it kills its partner, which made them not popular among the ox bears, which was why the female ox bears would look for weaker and smaller partners. This was similar to how the Balak warriors would select their partners. She then asks Vakir if he knew what kind of spouses were the most popularly chosen. She answers her own question by saying it was a young entity that possess excellent DNA and it would be even better if they were weakened due to an injury. The cure remained silent upon hearing Ian's explanation and thought about how Ian was basically saying that as long as she gets the DNA, then everything would be fine. The female and male ox bear soon left together as Ian tells the cure that they were going to wait as the female ox bear will suppress the male ox bear's strength completely. Deep within the forest. 
a mix of roaring and growling sexual sounds could be heard throughout the forest. The Kir was seen standing still with a dull expression on his face as he continues to hear the sexual roars and moans of the ox bears. He was standing silently in front of a cave entrance as the growling noises became louder. Food made up of berries, fish, and fruits are seen piled on top of leaves. It had been four days since Vakir had to listen to the ox bear's moans, which soon made Vakir unaware of what he was doing right now. Ian soon appears and asks him if he had left any food for the ox bears. He tells her that he did as he returns to their campsite where a shelter and campfire had been made. Vakir has been giving the hungry ox bears food over the past four days so that they could continue their mating. Our boy has become a fluffer for the bears lol. Ian picks up a pinkish berry in her hand and explains to him that the fruit has an effect where it boosts one's strength temporarily, but in the end, it was harmful as it consumes one's lifespan instead. She further explains that the female who was more intelligent would understand their intentions and that the male would understand as well, but in order to handle the female he had no choice but to eat it. The Kir thought of the scenario where the male ox bear was attempting to escape from the female ox bear. He now understood the reason why Ian had chosen a big and strong female as their target. Her plan was to deplete the male's strength. Two bowls of soup are seen on the ground which Ian had made. She tells Vakir to eat up so he could heal. Vakir accepts the meal and commented that the ox bears were really mating like crazy. Isn't that normal? Ian tells Vakir which causes him to spit out the bowl of soup. She giggles at Vakir's reaction and tells him that all male Baloks were like that but guessed that Imperial males like Vakir weren't, and then she guessed that since he came from a geeky country, it meant that Vakir couldn't mate as the crazy ox bears could. Ian continues to taunt Vakir asking him if he could do it like the ox bears as he wipes the soup off his face. She leans closer to Vakir, playfully teasing him and asking if he could. A fierce loud roar soon catches Ian's attention. Vakir was alarmed to see Ayan's reaction as she quickly grabs onto her bow telling Vakir to get ready as the fierce roar continues to be heard. She noted that the female ox bear had finally been impregnated as the female ox bear is seen towering over the collapsed body of the male ox bear. Good job bro you tried your hardest. The female ox bear lets out one more loud and fierce roar into the air that causes it to shake. The fierce roar causes the male ox bear to run away from the cave in a hurry. Vakir and Ayan are seen sitting on the branches of the tree. Vakir then asks Ayan about why the female ox bear was chasing the male ox bear away. She explains that an ox bear that has finished mating is no different from a competitive predator who has intruded a territory and that it was a warning to the male ox bear to never come back. Vakir understands and commented that the female ox bear wants to sleep since she had used her strength and has not slept for the past four days as he looks at Ayan. Ian looks at him and tells him that the female ox bear would hide herself in a safe and remote place and that from here onwards they would find her traces and chase after it quietly. As Ian prepares her bow and arrows she tells Vakir that once the female ox bear starts to go to sleep, that was when they would start their hunt. Up in the snowy mountains. Bakira's legs could be seen walking through the mountains. Ian and Vakir are seen riding on Bakira's back between two large pillars of stone. Vakir commented that the female ox bear would be tired but is moving so far away. Ian tells him that she was finding a place that has the least number of threats that the forest possesses. And that the place where they were was cold making sure that mosquitoes that suck bones or blood could not live here. Vakir then asks Ian if the female ox bear knew about those facts and came here knowing that. Ian tells him that the female ox bear's intelligence is quite high and that its acquired knowledge is better than its instincts. As they continued to follow the trail of the female ox bear, Vakir could start to feel the coldness of the area due to his body's condition as he covers his body with his arms. Ian turns around to ask if Vakir was feeling cold and that if he was, he could put his body closer to hers, but Vakir tells her that he was fine. Ian warns him that his body temperature could decrease making his body become stiff, and when his body becomes stiff it might get in their way when they start hunting. She then asks if he plans on getting in her way. Vakir thinks deeply about the facts Ian had stated thinking that it was a rational reason, and wonders if she was capable of making such rational decisions, he soon agrees and hugs tightly onto Ian's body causing her to jolt up and blush heavily. Ian soon grew nervous and thought to herself that she was only doing this because she was concerned for her slave's health and that it was the duty of a master to look after their slave. Bakira soon notices something up ahead. 
he lets out a fierce growl which catches both Ian's and Vakir's attention. They soon noticed that the female ox bear footprints on the ground soon disappeared halfway. Ian shouted out that the female ox bear's trace had disappeared. She turns to look around and wondered where the female ox bear had disappeared to, just as a pair of red eyes appear in the shadows right behind Ian. Something fast was approaching Ian at a high speed. She soon realizes it and turns to see what it was. It was the female ox bear. She launches straight towards Ian at full speed with her claws close to Ian while letting out a devastating roar. A group of hunters was seen looking happy and amazed at something. Wow, look at that boar they shouted as they gathered around the boar that had been tied onto a wagon. They commented that with the amount of meat they could get from the boar, the whole tribe would be able to eat their fill. A female hunter tells the hunter who caught the boar that she had only managed to catch three rabbits, while another male hunter guessed that the hunter who caught the boar was the best hunter amongst them now. They asked the hun who was the hunter that caught the boar if it was true that he was the best hunter now as he smiles in front of the prey that he had caught. A hun continued to smile and bask in the compliments that the other hunters were giving him. The hunters asked him if it meant that he was going to be the hunting commander from here on out, and the other hunters agrees with that comment based on the rules. Even Commander Ian could not hunt as good as him since there was a limit to what she could hunt by herself. But another hunter wondered about the fact that Ian had brought a slave out with her to hunt. Hearing this comment made a hun chuckle as he informs them that the slave bastard she brought along with was just going to be a burden to her instead. A hun tells the other hunters that Ian will return without having even caught a single rabbit. We now return to the moment when the female ox bear launches an ambush attack on Ian from the shadows. Ian's face was filled with shock and surprise as she sees the clawed hand approaching fast through her face, but a hand appears on her body in an instant. The cure had just barely pulled her away from the path of attack of the female ox bear. Pieces of her hair were blasted away as a nervous sweat drop drips down her face. Both Vakira and Ian fell to the ground with a heavy sound which surprises Bakira her pet wolf even more. Bakira growls fiercely at the female ox bear that had ambushed its master. Bakira lets out one final wolf and leaps onto the female ox bear. Vakira and Ian continue to lie on the ground as Vakira holds Ian with both of his arms around her body. He asks her if she was okay. Ian tells him that she managed to survive thanks to him and thanked Vakira for saving her. As Bakira fought the female ox bear head on by itself, Bakira asks Ian if the female ox bear was luring them instead. He commented that the female ox bear had a cunning intellect that surpasses other monsters. Bakira now understood why the picky female would choose the male ox bear. He continues to Ian that they could not avoid a head on battle while Ian thought to herself about the fact that she had gotten help from the slave making her dignity as his master drop. She then calls out to Bakira her slave and tells him to rest idly behind her, which catches his attention. She prepares her bow and arrow with a determined look on her face, and she tells Vakir that she was going to show him the dignity of his master. Some time has passed as Vakir is seen with a dull expression on his face. He looks up to see that Ian and Bakira were both leaping between the two walls of ice and commented that he was a slave that was lazing around while the master was working, but he was impressed with the way of the Balak slaves as they were quite unique as Ian could be seen sending two arrows towards the female ox bear. Her attacks were successful as more arrows could be seen on the back of the female ox bear as it tries its best to run away from her with its mouth dripping with saliva, the sin of acting indecent before my slave you'll pay ox bear. Ian shouts as she chases after the female ox bear, just as she was about to send another arrow towards the female ox bear it retreats into the stone wall, but Ian's eyes were still filled with focuses as she tells the female ox bear if it thinks that it will be able to avoid her attack by hiding behind an object. As she draws the string of her bow Ian's arrow began to flash bright blue with an intense aura. A good arrow would pierce through steel but if it doesn't want to pierce through. Anything it wouldn't even pierce through a leaf she says. She unleashes her attack towards the boulder but the arrow deflects upon hitting it. But the aura that was inside of the arrow was able to pierce through the boulder and through the female ox bear that had went inside to hide. It coughs out blood as the aura hits its body. The cure was alarmed to see that the ox bear that was hiding behind the rock was actually attacked by Ian's arrow. He speculates that the wave of aura from the arrow had passed through the boulder precisely and pierced through its target. He stares at the back of Ian's while thinking about the archery skills that you could call an art form and the hunting skills that can strangle one's prey without any flaws. The cure continues to comment that Ian when judged by her skills she might surpass Camumor just as Ian turns around with a smile on her face asking the cure if he had seen what she had done. A massive amount of blood is seen dripping onto the ground, causing a pool of blood to appear. The female ox bear continues to breath heavily with blood still dripping off its mouth, 
the female ox bear decides to come out from its hiding place and rushed fiercely towards Ayan and Bakira in a mad frenzy, but Ayan simply sent even more arrows straight into its face. With one of its eye pierced by Ayan's arrow it still continues to charge towards Ayan without stopping as Ayan tells it if it thinks whether it could go up against her arrows, Ayan then, pulls back the string of her bow with an arrow filled with her aura, she tells the female ox bear that an arrow filled with her sincerity, could even break a castle wall she says as her blue aura filled everything from her body to her arrow, she finally unleashes the giga chat arrow that looked Goku's Kamehameha, the female ox bear finally stood still with fear in its face as Ayan's bright light is shown on its face, but with its remaining eyes still filled with determination, it bends its head, like Beckham to dodge Ayan's powerful arrow attack, Ayan was too stunned to speak after witnessing the female ox bear dodge her attack, the female ox bear slams hard enough Ayan and Bakira causing both of them to be flung up high in the air, after being smashed by the ox bear Ayan rolls and tumbles away on the ground, she lays flat on the ground for a moment without an inch of muscle even moving, but she soon awakes and opens her eyes while thinking, she recalls a memory of her mother who, told her that when a beast with dull senses nears death, they can sense the killing intent of a person, Ayan thought about how she was careless thinking that she had cornered it perfectly but didn't expect that the last arrow she shot with righteousness was dodged that easily, Ayan grunts hard as she tried to pull herself off from the ground, but looky here ladies and gentlemen, the female ox bear she tried to kill was right in front of her face with its only remaining eye glowing a deep, angry red color, it laughs out loud and showed its fierce sharp fangs while salivating over the fact that it was going to eat our cutie pie Ayan. She could only close her eyes right before the attack as she knew that she was the prey now. Are you done showing me what a master's dignity is like said Vakir. Ayan opens her eyes upon hearing that sweet sounding voice of our badass main character as a teardrop appears in her eye. Vakir finally appears with his arm stretched out as he covers her. From the impending female ox bear attack, not today Pendejo, now it's my turn Vakir says with his one eyes glowing bright red just like the female ox bear. His right arm started to change from white to a bright red color as he aims it directly towards the inside of the ox bear's mouth, with his hand covered in bandages and a red aura it slowly rips apart as his sword skill Beelzebub reveals itself along with a tattoo. The Kir lets out a huge scale of flames that toasts the female ox bear right in. Its face, it's epic meal time everyone, even Ayan was surprised to see that the Kir had managed to use a fire skill. The female ox bear was totally knocked out as it lets out a quiet growl after being toasted from Vakir's hot flames. Bandages could be seen burn apart in the air. Vakir's bandages that wrapped around his face and body were slowly burned away from his body. Our boy is back guys. Ayan could only blushed upon seeing Vakir's glorious body that was hidden by the bandages. But Vakir spoke out that he knew it. Using that skill was too much for his body as a dizzy and hazy feeling came over his body as his eyes turn white. He falls forward flat on the ground which shocks Ayan while the female ox bear was also laying on the ground completely toasted, the cure. Ayan shouts with concern after seeing him drop flat on the ground. A big campfire could be seen lightening the Balak's campsite with ease. The members of the tribe were celebrating by singing out loud and dancing around the campfire. The spoils of the hunting event could be seen everywhere especially the female ox bear that our boy Vakir had helped Ayan to capture from before Vavs hung at the back of the party. A giant pot of food is seen being lit by a fire as the member of the tribe hands out bowls of food to the others, a weird tribal mask with teeth is seen as Ayan explains to Vakir that the hunter who catches the largest prey receives the villagers' respect and admiration, Vakir and Ayan are both seen wearing the mask on their heads, Ayan asks Vakir about how he felt about becoming the hunting hero, Vakir takes a look at the mask and tells her that it was nothing much. Hearing that comment made Ayan tell Vakir that as a slave his issue was his half-assed reactions. As they continue to talk, Ayan explains to him that the female ox bear wasn't just strong and fierce but was also highly intelligent making it an honorable catch. Those were the reasons why they were chosen as the main figures of this pillaging ceremony. She looks up with a smile on her face as she tells him that it was different from a boar that was sluggish scared and poops whenever it runs away. She then asks Ahun if he agrees as he was seen standing beside Vakir with a disgruntled look on his face as he had no choice to agree with what Ayan had said. Here, this is your slave Ahun said to Vakir as he hands him a bowl of stew. Vakir looks at the bowl of food that was handed to him asking what it was which causes Ahun to shout at him about what he meant. Vakir then asks him why he couldn't get lots of meat but Ahun assures him that it was because the little amount of meat in the soup represented the worth of his honor. Ayan explains to Vakir that it was a tradition of the Baloks. The one who contributes the most in the hunt gets the least amount of meat and gains that much honor in return. 
Ahun leaves angrily and shouted at Vakir that he too wanted to give him lots of meat. Vakir thought deeply about how being more honorable meant having less meat. He wonders what use was some useless honor over having lots of meat instead. Ayan giggles to herself because of Ahun as seeing his sour expression meant that he was really pissed. Vakir continues to think to himself that the meat wasn't what he really wanted to obtain in the hunt. It was. The 600 kg stability which stems from Beelzebub after catching the ox bear. He looks at his hand with his Beelzebub skill activated. His first slot contained the Flame Cerberus skill rank A+, while his second slot was filled with the 600 kg stability ox bear rank A, with his last slot filled with Durable Life Merciel rank A. He wonders if the ox bear skill would allow him to increase his weight by 600 kg while holding his breath, as he ate the bowl of food given by a hun. The Kir notices that after Beelzebub absorbed the ox bear his body had recovered a lot. Hey Slave Ion says as she presented to Vakir a bowl. The bowl contained things so nasty that the artist himself had to vomit after drawing it. The studio had to censor how it looked to save you guys watching this video. Ion blushes slightly while asking Vakir if the bowl of food he had wasn't enough and that the bowl she was giving him was taken away from the shaman who wanted this particular meat. But instead she had taken it to give it to Vakir as it was his hunter's right. Vakir brushes her off by telling her that he had already gotten a portion of meat, a bowl of blood and a portion of intestines. Ayan shouts at him that he has to eat what she was giving him. She continues to scold Vakir by saying that if his eyes were bad he should eat the eyes, and that if his heart was weak he should eat the heart and if he had weak limbs he should eat the legs. As Ayan continues to scold him, Vakir thought about how the long, purple censored thing was the intestine and if it meant that his insides were weak. Three female barbarians appear behind Ayan. They booed her together and stated that they knew what she was planning on doing to Vakir and could see through her motives. Ayan hears their shouts and seems and tells them to shut up. Vakir takes a bite of the censored food and thought about how it was very chewy. He soon swallows the food down his throat which Ayan spots and smiles happily. She continues to smile and giggle while telling Vakir that since he ate the food he would be able to fulfill his duty. Vakir continues to chew on the food while thinking about how he was done with his part of the hunt and wondered what else she wanted from him. Comment below what you think Ayan wants from Vakir. The sun shines brightly in the morning. Vakir takes a few steps before stopping in front of a massive stump. Smokes was coming out of it along with a long scratch mark. Vakir continues to stare at the smoke. As he thought about what Ayan had told him yesterday was true, a flashback is seen where large amounts of meat are piled on top of one another. Vakir asks why Ayan was placing so much good meat over here. He tells her that the village was going through a food shortage but Ayan tells him that they were doing this as an offering as a sacrifice, to Madam Eight Legs to whom the Balak tribes were asking for permission to live in the dense forest. Vakir thought about how Madam Eight Legs was the horror of the dense forest where you couldn't survive after running into it, a flashback to when Vakir unleashed his most powerful attack on Madam Eight Legs body run through his mind as he knew that after seeing the Balak's villagers behavior towards the Madam he understood how reckless his actions were. Vakir then tells her that Madam Eight Legs was an annoying monster, back at the tribe nobody could be seen walking around. Vakir walks past a certain tent before noticing something. He stares at a long line that extends all the way outside of the chief's house made up of the members of the tribe. Vakir wonders if there was still another ceremony or something. The members of the tribe queuing outside the tribe chief's house were talking about how some of them had been in line since dawn others were glad to be at the front end of the line while another stated that they had stayed awake the entire night. The female members talked amongst themselves about based on the results of yesterday's pillage there was a high possibility that Vakir might be able to come a commoner. Another member commented that they were sure that a woman from the village will become his wife, while the last one commented that if he was strong enough to hunt an ox bear it would mean that Vakir was really strong. These girls seriously shouted a voice that startles the ladies who were talking about Vakir. Ayan had appeared with a deer that she had just hunted. She tells them that she had given. Vakir that specific stew yesterday and yet, she sees that someone else was trying to take her property away. The girls continue to argue with Ayan over the fact that she should have left some of the stew for them as well and that she was being so stingy for keeping it all to herself. Hearing their complaints made Ayan throw down her prey to the ground. She tells them that if they felt that it was unfair then they should set up a trap to catch one for themselves. The girls tells her that they had gone out there so many times already. They even shouted at Ayan that they had went to the Empire's border but there was no one there like Vakir. Hearing those words made Ayan upset as her face turned into a stone-cold killer's look. She readies her fist and warns them that there might be some in hell as her aura turned black all over. 
seeing this caused the girls to scream out in fear and to run away from her. Ayan was glad that it was over with the girls as she touches her head. She spoke out loud about how she was waiting for the cure to recover and that those cunning girls might take him away. Add unto the fact that she had fed him with the ox bears penis in order to get the cure to carry out his manly duties. The time is near gentlemen for our boy to reap the fields. But Ian was unaware that Vakir had overheard what she was saying out loud as she turns around. Ian asks him nervously if he had seen or heard everything from before. Vakir gave out a mean face as he realized what part of the animal's meat was in. The stew that he ate yesterday, Ian quickly changes the topic and mentioned to him that last night she had heard that her mother had called a meeting among the elders and that Vakir would be able to request something from her mother as the honorable hunter of the pillage. She blushes once again before telling Vakir that when her mother calls for him, she had already thought about what he should ask her. What she tells Vakir to ask her mother catches his attention as his ears perk up upon. Hearing it, the long line outside of the chief's hut was gone now. The elders and other members of the tribe were gathered inside. Vakir is seen holding a kneeling position on the ground with his head lowered in a serious manner. He greets the matriarch who is seen sitting on her throne with a calm expression on her face with an eagle above her. She asks Vakir if he was the one that had caught the ox bear as it allowed her to eat good meat. Vakir tells her that he just did what he needed to do. She tells Vakir not to be modest as he had done well. She also noted that it seemed like he had recovered a fair bit too, which was fascinating as she didn't expect his recovery rate to be this quick. Vakir grew nervous upon hearing those compliments but assures her that it was all due to her care. He also thought about how he had felt this way before which was interesting. The night fox Akiya was a genius archer who scarce the people of the empire despite having led the Balak tribe that had less than 300 hundred members. She was as dignified as Hugo but was warm and soft like a buttery croissant. Akia then tells Vakir that she should reward him for his contributions yesterday and was willing to change his status. She informs Vakir that he was no longer a slave but a part of their family. Hearing those words caused the shaman to cough a bit. Vakir notices this reaction and recalled that Ian had mentioned to him that the elders were dissatisfied about his status change. He looks at the shaman and recognizes him as the old man who smeared ashes on the hunter's faces as the Balak shaman called a human who was also a hun's grandfather. Akia slowly stood up from her throne while asking Vakir to tell her what he wanted as he was now officially a member of the Baleks. She offers him her hand and tells him that since he was part of the family even though she did not give birth or raised him, she was willing to accept his request. Akia tells him that if he wanted a beautiful village maiden then she would give him and his partner her blessing or if he didn't want a partner a slave would be fine too. Ayan could be seen doing some Naruto hand seals with her arms towards Vakir which translates to you didn't forget what I told you right? Vakir could see her actions and takes a moment to close his eyes. He then tells Akia that he does have one request. She then tells Vakir to tell her comfortably while looking at Ayan as she noticed that she was signaling to Vakir like crazy and wondered if she really wanted him that badly. Vakir had a darkened expression on his face as he hesitated to ask what he wanted. But with a determined look on his face he tells Akia that he would like to bathe in the hero's spring, the elders end. Other members including Ahun were shocked to hear about what Vakir was requesting from their leader while Ayan was smiling from ear to ear. The hero's spring said Akia with a serious look on her face. Are you aware of what you're requesting she said sternly to Vakir. Silence filled the room after Vakir had told his request to the leader, you bastard shouted the shaman who asked Vakir if he knew whose presence he was in to display such arrogance. The shaman complained to the matriarch that the people who are able to bathe in the hero's spring are high-ranked warriors, and that there was no need to listen to the trash known as Vakir request. Ahun agrees with what his grandfather is saying. He added on that only heroes who have proved their incredible strength can enter the hero's spring, making Vakir an ignorant bastard for asking such a question that was not in his place. But Ayan disagrees with Ahun and his grandfather. She argued that Vakir had already proved his strength by catching the ox bear at the pillaging ceremony. Akia the matriarch take note of their worries and arguments. She then looks at Vakir and asked if he even knew that the hero's spring is. Vakir our boy just looked straight at her and told her that he knew what the hero's spring is. But let me do the explanation. The hero's spring, it's the Balak shrine where only the strongest Balak warriors are submerged in. It's also a hot spring where both internal and external injuries recover just by bathing in it. Vakir knew some other facts from what Ayan told him. It takes a long time for the water in the hero's spring to accumulate, and only warriors who have made a special contribution can go there. Akia continues to stare at our handsome boy in silence. An elder with a mohawk haircut spoke out. He tells Akia that they couldn't send an outsider who just became a commoner to the shrine, 
an elder dressed like a mage beside him spoke out as well, he notes that Vakir has a promising future and that it wouldn't be such a bad idea to send him to the hero's spring once to motivate him, another elder burst out in anger, wondering when was the hero's spring a waterhole that anyone can enter, another elder states that since Vakir's body was in a rough shape and also a part of the family, then they should treat him well too, Akia overhears the various arguments and statements made about whether Vakir should be allowed into the hero's spring, deep in her thoughts, she wanted to agree with Vakir's request but it's also true that there wasn't a good enough reason to, and that it can't be helped since the shaman and guards were so against it, but a constant bell ringing soon catches her attention, the ringing noise can be heard throughout the Balak's camp, Vakir notices the sound as well and wonders if the bell meant it was time for war, Ian tells him that it was a signal that meant that the tribe has a guest, and that there was no way any insane bastard would pick a fight with the Balak's in the forest, Akia begins to leave the tent first, but before leaving she tells Vakir that they would discuss this matter another time and that everyone should return to their duties, the shamans and elders continue to remain silent and seated as Akia left the tent but soon a human's face was filled with anger and disgust as his eyes began to glow bright blue, members of the Balak's tribe could be seen gathering in huge numbers, Vakir and Ayan had arrived on the scene, Vakir asks Ayan if that was their guest to which she says yes, human beings were everywhere carrying crates of goods with horses bringing more into the tribe area, Ayan explains to Vakir that the humans were merchants that could bring the Balak's things, that couldn't be found in the forest, the Baloks would then anticipate and count down the days until the merchants comes, Vakir was not listening to what Ayan was saying as his attention was drawn to a certain symbol, he recognizes it as one of the seven merchant families, called the bourgeois family, Vakir thought deeply about how the bourgeois family had to come here from the imperial capital, which meant that they had to cross either the Baskerville or Morgue family's territory, but how did they get here was the question that stuck in his mind, as Vakir knew that there was no way either of those families would permit their crossing, Vakir then thought that the bourgeois family had smuggled themselves in, a man with a huge mustache arvies and announces to everyone in the tribe that the five-day market has arrived, he tells the tribe members that if there was anything they wished to barter then please bring it here, the tribe members could be seen happily bringing over various things, to barter with, a market is made with merchants calling out to the tribe members, the merchants introduce cosmetics and even a glass orb that makes you have sweet dreams when placed on your bed as well as grains. Vakir continues to hang back and monitored the situation that was unfolding in front of him. He could see that the merchants had brought food and daily necessities that are distributed throughout the empire, but wondered what the tribe members were bartering rare items that come from the dense forest for those measly things. Vakir knew that the merchants had no way of not knowing the value of the items the Baloks were trading with. He continues to question if the merchants were using the Baloks who were ignorant about the current market prices. Vakir turns around from this site and continue to think that this was something the Baloks had to figure out themselves as things would get annoying for Vakir if he steps in and someone recognizes him, Ayan could be seen, shouting at the top of her lungs stating that the deal was unfair as she holds onto a piece of corn. Vakir watches from the background as Ayan continues to argue with the merchant that it made no sense for her to trade a single diamond for a corn. Vakir was relieved to see that there was at least one normal person in the Balak tribe, but Ayan destroys his thoughts, but shouting that she at least deserved to get two corns for one diamond, she then poses in a victory stance as if she was in Fortnite and had won the two corns for one diamond, worst trade in history, Vakir could only stare away as he thought of Ayan as being hopeless after seeing her trade, three other tribe members could be seen arguing with the merchants, they complained about how the bar value of a pearl clam for today's radish isn't equal and that they should get at least two radishes while another yells at them for claiming something as a cabbage, the last member wouldn't give the merchants another deer antler, the merchant with the mustache could feel that he was losing the trade, so he tells the three members that he couldn't go against the Balak warriors and would give them what they wanted, the three members celebrated over their victory with a victory pose as well, the merchant smiles to himself as he thought of the Balaks as stupid bastards for celebrating since they didn't even know the value of the items they were offering, just then a little girl calls out to the merchant asking him if she could please have one glass orb, the merchant tells her that he had brought many with him but asks about what she could give in return, the sweet little girl opens her hands and reveals a sun dung beetle larva, she explains to him that they were rare yummy and nutritious, but the merchant responded with a disgusted look on his face, may this guy end up in the deepest part of hell, comment below if you agree with me, he immediately swipes the precious sun dung beetle larva that the little girl had brought off her hands, 
a sad look grow on her face as she watched it fall to the ground. The merchant left her and thought about how pretty she looked for a stupid barbarian. As the little girl began to cry tears over her little dung beetle, the merchant thought about how she could be sold for a good price as a slave. A hand soon appears and pats her on her head. A voice calls out to the merchant. Vickery had finally decided to step in but looked a bit different. He tells the merchant that the trade with the little cute girl was invalid. Ian sees the cure and wonders what he was wearing while the merchant grew nervous. He was surprised to see that a barbarian could speak the imperial language. He tells Vakir that there was a misunderstanding regarding what he said just now, but Vakir repeats the merchant words of selling a Balak child as a slave. The merchant tried to cover up what he said but Vakir tells him that that's not what's important right now. Vakir wanted the merchant to cancel all of today's unfair trades. Hearing the words unfair trade made the merchant angry as he asks Vakir about what was unfair. Vakir explains to him that the merchant had been marking these items at a price completely different from the current market price. Our boy looks at the merchant straight up in his face. The merchant grew nervous as he thinks about how Vakir was the only one who knew how to speak the imperial language. He then attempts to school our boy by telling Vakir that he talked as if he knew the retail price. The merchant quickly announces that this was a sacred trade that's been permitted by the Balak shaman, the proxy of the forest god and that is was something a little boy like Vakir shouldn't interfere in. Vakir slowly raises his hand and points at something. Vakir starts an ass-kicking lecture to the merchant. He tells the merchant that the corn he brought was worth 100 gold each, but the diamond he received goes for about 2 million gold. The merchant was alarmed to know that our boy Vakir had brains. Vakir continues his lecture by saying that when he grinds an ox bear horn into a billiard ball, it would be worth about 1 million. It was the same price as the goblin but mushroom which was anew. Medicine, horror and shocked was written all over the merchant's face as he wonders how Vakir knew the exact market prices. Two words main character. Vakir then picks up the glass orb in his hand. He tells the merchant that the glass orb that gives the user sweet dreams when placed next to a user meant that they would certainly be drugged and only dream of sweet dreams. Vakir goes on to explain that on the surface of the glass orb, there are small holes and drugs fall out of them. The drug. Inside it is a cheap drug that harms upon long-term use, and Vakir knew that it's illegal to use it in the empire, but the merchants had distributed this well. Vakir smashes the glass orb with his hand. He lets out the pieces of the broken glass orb along with its hidden goods much to the horror of the merchant. Another member of the merchant group whispers to the mustache man about what was wrong and he tells him that Vakir had found out about them. Ian quickly asked Vakir if he had mentioned the words drug body harm. Vakir hesitates for a moment before telling her yes. Our wife who began to rage as she realized the main cause behind why so many of her people's health was deteriorating. Merchant gives off a faint smile and tells her that there seems to be a misunderstanding while thinking of leaving the Balak tribe for now. But something fast and quick pierces the shoulder of the merchant in an instant. He looks at it in horror before letting out a little bitch scream. Ian had taken a bow and arrow from a fellow tribe member and shot the merchant with it. Members of the merchant group rallied around their leader to comfort him just as Ian calls them bastards. She claims that the merchants had fearlessly fooled the Balaks. The rest of the Balak members soon realized what was going on as some of them started to inspect the goods. A dreaded feeling started to overcome the merchant upon being discovered by Ian. He yells at his ground to take their things and run. The entire merchant group began to flee on the backs of their horses. The Kir questions Ian about why she was letting them go since merchants were known for not returning a loss. But Ian assures the Kir that there was no way she would let them go. She explains to him that for beasts that live in large packs, injuring them and letting them go is also a hunting technique. The merchant leader could be seen holding onto his injured shoulder while cursing at the Balak tribe members. Ian continues her explanation about how they had the tendency to return to their pack when injured. A campfire is seen just as the merchant group finally slowed their pace. He shouts at a group of mercenaries decked out with weapons about how the Balak bastards had stolen their products. He then tells everyone to get ready for battle. Time for free experience points for our boy Vakir. Night soon arrives as a campfire is seen being lit in the middle of the forest. A bird is seen flying high in the air. It soon lands upon somebody's arm. They messed with the Balaks. There's only one way to take care of them, said a voice as Vakir listens to it closely. It's slaughter time, said Ian as the eagle rested on her arm. Our wife who was about to rip these guys to shreds along with our boy Vakir whose eyes were showing that daddy red glow. The group of mercenaries could be seen walking together through the forest lighted by the moonlight. A mercenary with an eye patch tells the merchant leader that he must have been shocked that the Balak bastards looted him. He continues to tell the merchant leader that words don't work on those barbarians and that he needed to kill them and turn them all into slaves. 
the merchant leader tells the mercenary that since it was his first time in the deep forest, he wouldn't know it well about how. Defeating the Baloks in combat was not that easy, the mercenary still felt confident about his skills, he asks the merchant leader about how he felt being scared and if that was the reason why he brought the mercenaries, he continues to question the merchant leader about how he was going to turn the tables if he got caught, the mercenary lights a match up, saying that the merchant groups and mercenaries had decided to split the gross earnings in exchange for being their escorts, he shows an evil smug grin on his face with a cigarette in between his lips, he tells the merchant that if it comes to looting, then the mercenaries could treat everything as theirs. The merchant leader was nervous and silent upon hearing the disgusting words the mercenary spoke with, but he soon turns forward and tells the mercenaries to do as they please. The mercenary was happy to hear that and asks a question. He wonders if the Baloks were really that special, since they wanted to exploit night time. The group wanted to ambush the Baloks while setting them on fire and finally to slaughter them making them done for. The eyepatch mercenary continued to talk while two other members could be seen fight over the lit match. One of them grabs the member holding the lit match and tells him to not blow out the match since he needed to use it too. The guy holding the match decides to hand it over, but he tells the other guy that it was a rule that only two people can use a match, and asked him if he had heard on the battlefield that three people aren't supposed to share one match, but the friend didn't listen to him. He continues to light his cigarette with the lit match, telling the other member that he didn't believe in such superstitions. Lucky for him. He gets to meet God straight away as an arrow flies directly into his skull, just before he could blow one puff of his cigarette. The mercenary with the eye patch continues to talk to the merchant leader about his history and how he caught barbarians and sold them as slaves. But the man didn't even realize that his party was being sniped one by one, even an arrow reached inches from his face. The merchant leader could only look in shock as blood spilled everywhere from the mercenaries being sniped by arrows. The group of mercenaries began to cover themselves with their shields but they were still getting sniped by the Baloks. The merchant leaders yells at them to extinguish their cigarettes as the Baloks had found them, I and and. Her Balak tribe had appeared with their bows drawn and ready to fire. She commands her troops that she wouldn't allow any of them to hit the mercenaries and merchants anywhere else but their heads. She tells the Baloks that it's time to show them how scary the Baloks are. The Kir stares in amazement and wondered if the light from the cigarettes was all the Balak warriors needed to shoot their arrows so accurately. Another member of the tribe appears while carrying a two barrels. He calls the Kir. A slave and tells him that Tay had finished preparing what he asked for. The Kir reminds him that he was a commoner and no longer a slave. The tribe member laughs and tells the Kir that he was being timid for fussing over something like that. The group of mercenaries could be seen cowering behind their shields to block the hail of arrows coming from the Baloks. A bald man orders mages to gather up, to block the arrows with the shields while the aura users prepare to counterattack. An arrow, covered in blue arrow is seen flying through the air with a rope attached to it. The mercenaries could only stare as the arrows landed on the trees above them. Carrying between the two arrows a barrel, more arrows attached with ropes are sent flying into the trees. The space above the mercenary group were soon filled with barrels hanging above them. The bald man was alarmed to see that the Baloks had launched alcohol barrels. He looks at the barrels that began to leak a dark fluid and mutter the words. No way. Flaming arrows were then sent flying into the alcohol barrels in the trees. It caused an explosion in front of the mercenaries which lighted the whole place as if it was the 4th of July. Yeehaw. The merchant leader had hid himself behind a tree. He watches the mercenaries being burned alive and hears their screams of pain. They shouted that the Baloks had started a fire. The merchant leader continues to watch the flames engulf the mercenaries thinking about how the Baloks had tied ropes to arrows and launched oil barrels. This was something that was unheard of as he continues to wonder about how the Baloks had gotten that intelligent, oblivious to him Vakir was walking towards him from the shadows. Like an assassin from Assassin Creed he sneaks up to the merchant leader, Vakir finally lets out a heavy footstep which catches the attention of the merchant leader. He recognizes Vakir as the meddlesome Balak bastard. Vakir appears with arrows on his back and with his eyes turned red. It's time for the bloodhound to hunt. The merchant leader pleads with Vakir, telling him that he would regret it if he killed him. He then reveals a piece of paper, stating that this was the exploration permit he had received from the underdog city. It was the official seal from the newly appointed deputy consul, meaning that if Vakir kills the merchant leader, the Baskerville family will come for him. Vakir then asks the merchant leader if the deputy consul he was referring to was named Vakir. The merchant leader immediately tells him that he was right. It was that infamous Vakir. Let's say a small prayer for the merchant leader guys. How strange. I don't remember permitting that, said Vakir as flames grew around him. 
his disguise was removed and his eyes turned a bloody red. The merchant leader was horrified to see that Vakir's skin looks different from before, but he soon realizes something. You're really Vakir, was the merchant leader's last words an arrow struck. Him straight in the head body and on the piece of paper he was holding, bullseye. Vakir had fired the arrows that slain the merchant leader. He tells him that those who forge the Baskerville seal are to be executed. Ayan soon appears behind him on her pet wolf Vakira. She still calls Vakira slave and tells him that they needed to run away. Vakir looks at her and reminds her that he was no longer a slave. Multiple arrows could be seen stuck onto various shields. The mercenaries soon realized that the hail of arrow attacks from the Baloks had come to a stop. They rejoiced in joy and shouted out to one another that the Baloks were retreating. They stated that the fact that the Baloks attacked with fire meant that they were not confident. The mercenary group decides to chase after them right away. A member of the mercenary group shouted that if he catches the barbaric bastards, he would butcher them straight away. But just as he was yelling, a familiar pillar of death covered in a purple aura appeared behind him. It's our queen madam eight legs. She appears and started to rain down pain onto the mercenary groups. Vakir could hear the screams of the mercenaries as they yelled out that there was a monster. Ayan praises Vakir for calculating the madam's appearance and for thinking of using fire as a tactic. She states that Vakir had become a great Balak now. Vakir continues to look behind and tells Ayan that was how he felt every time he sees her. He looks at the numerous legs of Madam Eight Legs as they reached high into the sky while being covered in a deadly purple aura. He tells Ayan that that was a disaster. Akia was wearing a smile on her face as she tells Vakir that she would permit him to enter the hero's spring. She continues by stating Vakir's various achievements from resolving the food shortage issue by catching an ox bear, concluding the previous battle without any casualties by using oil barrels, and discovering that the cause of the infection that was bothering the Balak warriors was caused by cheap drugs. Akia concluded that there was no doubt that our boy Vakir was a brave warrior. She touches his shoulder while the shaman showed a dark expression on his face in the back. Akia then tells Ayan to take Vakir to the hero's spring since it was a full moon tonight. Ayan agrees and began to stood up. She wraps her arm around Vakir and tells him, serves him right. Vakir was curious by what she meant by that. It turns out she was referring to a human. She tells Vakir to look at a human not saying a single word. It was said by him that the reason why the warriors were unwell was because they were cursed. But due to Vakir's actions it caused a human's words to hold no weight now. A human could be seen struggling to hold his anger within himself. Vakir wonders if it was really a curse as he recalls. The memory of when the merchant leader had told him that the sacred trade had been permitted by the Balak shaman who was the proxy of the forest god. Night soon arrives as a full moon lights the skies. Vakir's publicious body could be seen submerged in green water. He takes a deep breath and chills in the waters where other animals could be seen floating around as well. He takes a scoop of the water in his hand. Thinking that his mana was taking a step closer to purity, he could feel his broken bones and muscles starting to heal. He noted that the old shaman didn't cause a fuss without a reason as he probably wanted to come here himself, although it was not as effective as the river of sticks at the Baskerville side. The hero's spring was better since there was no age limit. The cure then asks Ian who could be seen soaking in the waters of the hero's spring beside him, lucky main character. Comment below how many of you guys want to take a dip in those waters as well, he asked her, about whether the efficacy would be halved since she was inside the waters as well, and Vakir was certain that the matriarch mentioned that only he could go in, Ian wonders if that was really important since real Baloks do not fuss over minute things like that. She then tells Vakir to thank Sir Adonai for finding this hot spring, Vakir wondered who Sir Adonai was. Ian explains to him that Sir Adonai was the only person who can fight against the madam that lies within the deep forest. He was the best warrior among the Balak legends. She teases Vakir that since he had become a dignified Balak, he needed to make sure to respect Sir Adonai, but Vicky was reluctant as he tells Ian that he would respect Sir Adonai only if he fought against the madam head to head. Ian screams him that it was true. She shakes her head in disappointment over the fact that it was hard to communicate with outsiders, but her face started to blush as she remained silent while thinking deeply about something. She recalls her mother's face who tells her that since Vakir had become a commoner and has a good reputation within the village, she notes that when Vakir recovers with the hero's spring and can become the man he should be, he wouldn't be that bad of a husband. Can anyone else hear the wedding bells ringing? Ayan ends her flashback and glances over to her side. She sees Vakir's sexy hot delicious body with his hair pulled back. Ayan decides that today was the day. She was going to make Vakir hers. Guess someone wants that Baskerville D. 
The Kirin Ion continued to bathe in the waters of the Hero Spring. Lucky man, Ion soon reveals to Vakir that she knew that those merchants were taking an excessive amount of profits. She had a vague idea, so it was a good chance that they used this chance to get back at them. If Vakir hadn't done it, Ion would have. Vakir closes his eyes with a smile, saying that he understood her intentions. But Ion was feeling embarrassed as her face started to blush heavily. She tells Vakir to not laugh at her as she genially knew about what the merchants were doing and that she knew for a fact that those diamonds were more expensive than corn in the empire, since she brought up the topic of corns, Vakir questions her about how much more expensive they were compared to the diamonds she sold, Ian stutters but says 20 corn, she soon changes her answer to 30, but Vakir tells her she was still wrong, and finally reveals the number of corn she can get with one diamond, a little cute rabbit, is seen floating in the waters as well, Netflix in chill style, what, Ian screamed out loud, she was shocked at the amount she could have bought with the diamond after Vakir revealed the truth to her, but she immediately covers her mouth, still calling Vakir a slave and told him that she knew that. She deces that the login within the empire is strange, where would they even use that stone? She questioned Vakir. Vakir looks at her and tells her that it didn't matter, he then changes the topic, my name or slave, he asked Ian, between the two, which do you want to call me by? He tells Ian that he didn't like to keep things ambiguous, Ayan took a moment to think about what she should call Vakir by, she pauses for a moment in silence, she then moves closer to Vakir, to the point that she was right in front of him, this is it everyone, comment below what's gonna happen, you don't like ambiguity right? Ayan asked as she stood in front of our boy, she places her finger onto Vakir's lips, telling him that she was gonna make things clear, this causes our boy to be taken aback for a moment, I don't wanna call you slave or Vakir said Ayan as she looks at Vakir with innocent eyes and a blushing face while the waters of the spring drip down her body slowly, she pulls her face closer to his, whispering to Vakir, what I want you call you is, but a bunch of a kids appear suddenly behind her, they jump with joy and laugh out loud as Ayan was stunned and, embarrassed, the kids come up to Ayan and greeted her as Commander Ayan, they also called out to Brother Vakir, Ayan looks at them and questions them about how they managed to get here, but the kids didn't bother to answer her, Instead they just wanted her to play with them together in the spring. The cure watches from the back once again, thinking about how if it's neither his name nor slave, then how does Ian want to treat him? Our boy Vakir is dense like a rock, you rascals, shouted Ian as she splashes the waters. She tells the kids that if they enter the spring, its efficacy will reduce by half. The cure cuts in and repeats what Ian said to him. He tells her, didn't someone say a true Balak wouldn't be stingy regarding such things? The kids hid behind Vakir and agreed to what he said. They even went as far as to call Ayan a stingy commander. Ayan couldn't talk back to Vakir as he had used her own words against her. Ahun appears as well with two other little girls by his side. He tells Ayan that they were here based on the matriarch's command. Due to the drug side effects brought upon by the merchants, the matriarch had told the sick children to go into the hero's spring. Ayan could only recall her mother's cheeky smile. She thought about how she wanted to make a fool out of her. Ahem said Ahun which catches Vakir's attention as he turns to look at him. Ahun shyly thanks Vakir for helping his younger sister with the merchant, it was the cute little girl, that wanted to trade a larvae for a glass orb, she smiles and thanks Vakir as well for his help, Ahun then takes the chance to apologize to Vakir about misunderstanding him this whole time, Vakir simply gave him the bombastic side eye before replying, yeah, was the only word that Vakir said to reply to both of them, this leaves Ahun stunned and silent, he then bursts out in anger, yelling at Vakir that he and his little sister had come here to apologize and all Vakir said was yeah, Vakir, continues to chill in the water, he tells Ahun that he has too much anger inside of him, Ayan watches the two boys talk to one another, she showed a relief expression on her face as Vakir had finally become a part of the tribe, and that the tribe members were slowly accepting him as one of their own, she continues to think about how there would still be a lot of time to continue what she tried to do, comment below if you are jealous of our boy right now. She then calls out to Vakir, cheers to, you for becoming an official Balak member, Ayan announced out loud as she stands in front of him, posing with a bright smile on her face, the kids in the back cheered on as well, two years has passed by, a barbarian could be seen getting his face being rearranged by a powerful blow straight to his face, the barbarian falls back onto his ass as another member towers over him, other members were alarmed to see the interaction as the barbarian continued to sat on the ground with a bloody nose, you're more of a crybaby than I thought, said a voice as a familiar fist is seen pointing outwards, it was our boy Vakir Van Baskerville with a ponytail now, 
he had finally reached the age of seventeen years old, he relaxes his fist as he called out to a hun, one more time, shouted a hun as he covers his nose, the other members came to his side in order to help him get up, but Vakir dismisses his request, telling a hun that their sparring ends here today, as Vakir continued to walk away from a hun and into the forest, a hun shouts at him about whether he was running away, Vakir tells him that he was simply taking a stroll, a hun calls Vakir an annoying bastard, while telling the others that Vakir had became more monstrous after his body had recovered, the other members mentioned that they had heard that Vakir's marksmanship is on par with Commander Ion recently, the other member questioned how they could compare Vakir with Commander Ion, he tells them that he can hit a hun's nose too and make it bleed, but a hun tells them that he didn't get hit, which surprises the tribe members, a hun explains to them that Vakir's fist didn't hit him, he had just stopped it in front of his face. Vakir is slowly becoming one punch man. This revelation brings a shock to the tribe members' face as they soon realized something. Vakir had managed to make a hun's nose bleed from the wind's pressure caused by his fist. Vakir could be seen sweating all over as he continued to breath hard. He looks up at something, saying that he could do it perfectly now. The sixth technique Vakir can perfectly bear the sixth fong. Six holes that looked like they were drilled into the huge wall could be seen as Vakir stood below them. Vakir knew that Altoog there's still a long way to go before achieving the 10th technique, he finds it already impressive that he managed to get to the 6th technique at 17, which is formidable growth, the almighty Beelzebub's sword continues to screech out loud, Vakir also has 6, mana circles within him, with this, he can be a high rank graduator, Vakir releases his sword ability, thinking that including the river sticks his blessing, the demonic sword, Beelzebub, the usage of the marksman and assassination techniques he learned from the Baleks. Vakir could now go up against the highest rank graduator. Our boy has fully transformed himself into a member of the Assassin's Creed. He looks back at the forest, thinking about how it has already been two years since he had set foot into the deep forest. Looking back at it, Vakir wonders if he was bidding goodbye to the Baleks once he was done preparing. Bakira could be seen playing around with a butterfly. Vakir looks at some deep track marks etched into the ground. He determines that the tracks were from the deep forest snake Mashusu, our waifu Ayan had grown up too, she now has long hair and a different hairstyle, comment below which version of Ayan you like, the short hair or long hair version, the Kir continues to explain that the snake was the large and ancient one, the Kir tells her that if they could catch this, the food would be settled for the village for at least four days, Ayan continues to repeat the same words, I see, to the Kir regardless of what he said, this causes him to look back at her and thought about something, he asks Ayan if she was thinking about something else while they were hunting, Ayan blushes hard after being caught, but she tells Vakir that she wasn't, she quickly changes the topic, telling Vakir that another hunting group wanted her to ask him about something, as she reached for that something from Vakir's saddle, Vakir continued to think, that she was definitely hiding something from him, Ayan reveals a dagger in her hand that had a certain symbol on it, she tells Vakir that the hunting group brought a dagger from an imperialist who trespassed the deep forest, she then asks if he knew anything about this emblem, Vakir looks at the dagger and tells her that he does know it, it was a famous emblem, the emblem belongs to an extremely famous clan, called Leviathan, a significant clan that is part of the seven imperial clans along, with the Baskerville clan, the iron-blooded sword clan, Ian explains to Vakir that the hunting group thought it might have been someone's dagger from the mercenary group they massacred two years ago, but thankfully, it wasn't, but one thing was bugging Ian it was that in various places around the headwaters, they poured a red liquid from a glass bottle and retreated, the hunting group caught someone, but they had ingested a hidden poison in their mouth and died, the only thing that was, left behind was that dagger, Vakir continues to inspect the dagger in his hand, but Ian tells him that there was more, she wore a nervous expression on her face as she tells Vakir that there was something she wanted to ask him, don't you want to return to your hometown, Vakir? was the question that Ian asked him point blank, Vakir questions Ian about why she was suddenly asking him about that, even wearing a weird expression while asking it, Ian touches her fingers together nervously, a sweat drop drips down her face as she tells Vakir that she doesn't like secrets or lies, and that he should tell her, Ian reveals to Vakir that there was another imperialist who came to the deep forest, and that Ian believes that their goal was Vakir, Vakir received a shock upon the sudden revelation from Ian, she looks at him with a worried face, pausing for a moment before revealing another painful information, she finally reveals to him, that a certain waifu had came to the deep, forest, Ian continues to tell Vakir the honest truth, two years ago, when he had fought the madam up until now, that certain waifu, 
together with a search party, came to investigate the deep forest. Ayan believes that she was looking for traces of Vakir. She didn't dare to look Vakir in the eyes as she asked him if he was going to go with her. Ayan's thoughts started to go haywire. She wonders if Vakir will hate her because she hid this information up till now. What would she do if he says that? He'll go with her. Should I stop him from going by using the tribe's rules? These were the thoughts that ran through her mind as Vakir stood there silently. Would that even work? Was the final thought she had as Vakir finally started to open his mouth. I won't go back, said Vakir with a stern look on his face. Silence came over Ayan after hearing those words from Vakir. She stutters her words as she asked Vakir if it was true. He tells her yeah. Our wife whose face shined bright like a diamond. She hugs Vakira with joy, telling him that Vakir isn't leaving. Meanwhile, Vakir thinks about how he thought the Empire knew that he was alive. But it seems like they don't. Vakir needed to return once he was able to perfectly hide his power from Hugo without being noticed. And then he thought about the woman that Ian had mentioned. He wonders if Ian was referring to Camus Morg. He continues to wonder if she has not yet forgotten that he had saved her, or is it a part of a diplomatic event? But seeing how the Baskerville clan gave permission for the Morg search party to enter the deep forest, means that their alliance is still strong. Vakir wondered about if the two families form a bond through his supposed death. Vakir then decides that he should go investigate what's happening outside the deep forest soon. But a sudden appearance of a big fat ugly fish disrupts Vakir's thoughts. But Ian and Vakir were shocked to see its sudden appearance beside them. The giant fish lands right, in front of both of them with a loud impact. Water began to spill from out of its mouth as it tries at best to breath. A lungfish, said Ian with a perplexed look. She states that seeing as how it jumped out of the river, it seems like the rainy season will come soon, judging from its size. This year's rainy season might be long, but Vakir tells her to wait as he sends spots something. He wonders what that arrow-looking thing is that was poking out of the ugly fish. They decided to slice the fish like sushi to find out what it was from the inside. They were surprised to see a skeleton holding what looks like a spear from inside of the fish. Ian looks at the skeleton and figured that it was a Lococo bastard based on the clothing. Since he stabbed the fish with an arrow and there are traces of resistance, it seems that the Lococo bastard was quite surprised after being eaten. She explains to Vakir that a lungfish was a stupid beast that eats dead things, but this was a little strange to her. Vakir states that the Lococo bastard might have been very weakened to the point where the lungfish thought it was a corpse. Ian then questions why would such a weak person be hunting. Vakir looks at her and answers her question with a question. What if their tribe's situation is that bad? He continues to tell her that something might have happened within the deep forest, and that it was not a bad idea to investigate. After walking a far bit distance, Vakir and Ian were taken back as they witnessed something that causes Ian to shriek. The scene before them was like from hell. Dead bodies covered with red marks could be seen around the Lococo village that Vakir and Ian had stumbled across. They wondered if all the Lococo warriors were dead. Vakir inspects the dead Lococo warriors. He sees that they had signs of vomiting and diarrhea, along with red spots, which he soon realizes what it was. Ian then calls out to Vakir and tells him to look over there. She explains to Vakir that it was way past the time to eat, but there were no signs of fire towards Te Lococo's village. Human skeletons could be seen being hanged around the trees as if it was a Halloween decoration. The Lococo village could now be seen, but it was filled with dead silence with no signs of life. Vakir and Ayan along with Bakira were now strolling through the deserted village. Vakir notes that it was strange. There were no signs of life here. Vakir notices that based on the number of weeds, it's been a while since this place has been looked after. Ian questions whether the Lococo tribe had moved somewhere else just as she opens the curtains to one of the tents. But as soon as she does, a whole bunch of flies came swarming out of it. A small dead body is seen hugging the bigger body deep within the tent. Ian shouts at Vakir that there was a corpse inside the tent. Vakir tells her that there was also one over here. He looks at all the dead bodies that were scattered around the village. The corpses in the village and the red spots seemed familiar to him. Before he had regressed, there was an epidemic that spread throughout the deep forest around this time. It was called the Red Death. It was a first-class infectious disease that killed almost all the barbarians and species alike. Red spots appeared all over one's body along with vomiting and diarrhea, and due to the lethargy and pain, they become a cripple and die slowly. The infection spread so unusually quickly that it spread past the Empire's border. Ian tells Vakir that they need to quickly leave this place. She tells him that this was a curse, a god's curse. Vakir tells her not to worry since it was an infectious disease. Ayan becomes more alarmed after hearing that as she tells Vakir that it meant that this was more serious. 
the two of them continued to argue throughout the village. The Kir tells her to calm down since it wasn't that contagious, Ayan continues to wonder if it really wasn't a curse. The Kir then tells her that if she was scared she could go back first, but Ayan was worried about him about dying after being cursed, then I die, said the Kir. Ayan screams at him after hearing that reply, who said you can go ahead and die, her face was pissed off, a true waifu, the Kir thought that it was him obviously, the Kir went on to state that from the number of corpses, it seems like the whole Lokoko tribe wasn't annihilated, they had probably moved somewhere else, leaving the dead and sick here. He then tells Ayan that he was going to take some of the usual things in their barracks, so Ayan could go first and rest somewhere. She looks at him with concern while thinking that Vakir really isn't sensitive at all, but a chill went down her spine. She turns to see what it was that sent shivers down her spine. She lets out a horrifying scream that even caused Vakir to sweat a bit as he turned to see what had happened. What is it Ayan? said Vakir as he walks. Over to her, Ayan had dropped to the ground out of fear. She tells him with tears in her eyes that it was the curse. She points her trembling finger towards a certain direction in the village. She turns to Vakir and tells him that here was a cursed child. We need to run away Vakir, shouted Ayan. She tells him to go first and that she would follow right after. But all of a sudden, Ayan yells out that her legs got a cramp. But our boy isn't a simp. He ignores her and moves towards the so called cursed child. He kneels in front of her to inspect her, judging from the child's appearance. Vakir noted that she didn't look like she's from the Lokoko tribe. She's about five years old too, the cursed child was startled to see Vakir up close. Vakir then notices that there was a pile of rocks with a flower near it. He deduces that she was mourning someone's death. Who are you? asked Vakir to the cursed child. But the child remained silent for a moment before answering, Lokoko, slave, kitchen maid, the cursed child said. Vakir figured that she was a slave of the Lokoko tribe. What's your name? The Kir continued to ask, Pomerian, she answered, based from her reply. The Kir figured that her name was an imperial name, and wondered if she was an imperial child who was captured by the Lococos, but her answer wasn't complete, La Baskerville, was the word she intended to end her sentence with when she told the Kir her name, those two words alone set the Kir spiraling, his entire world had, turned upside down as horror filled his very soul, unable to believe what she had just said, the Kir questions her about what she just said with her cute little finger pointed upwards. She points back to herself. Pomerian, La Baskerville, was her name as her red eyes were revealed amongst her messy hair. Did we all just get a little sister? Comment below what you think of our new family member. There are three middle names within the Baskerville clan. Van is given to those from the extended lineage. Lou is given to the males from the direct lineage. The middle name given to the females from the direct lineage, but isn't frequently seen as most Baskervilles are males, is La. Our new little sister introduces herself as Pomerian La Baskerville. The Kir continued to be shocked upon hearing her name. He couldn't believe that she had the middle name of La, as there shouldn't be a lot of people who bear that middle name in the family. As the Kir remained stunned by this new information, Ayan points out something to him and tells him to look at it. She recognizes the emblem as the symbol of the Kir's clan, the Baskervilles. The Kir soon takes notice of the necklace and grabs it from Pomerian. His sudden action startles her as he said excuse me while grabbing the necklace, seeing the necklace up close causes Vakir to be startled again. He opens the necklace which reveals a family portrait that Vakir couldn't believe. He sees that Hugo Le Baskerville was standing in it along with two other members of the Baskerville family. He pulls the necklace closer to his face to see it more clearly while wondering why Hugo was in the picture, but he soon realizes something as he pulls the necklace closer. Pomerian was shaking in fear due to his sudden actions. But this doesn't stop our boy as he begins to interrogate the sweet little girl. He lets out his bloodthirst, asking Pomerian about who the people were in the picture as well as her connection to them. Ayan cuts in and asks Vakir how he expects to get an answer from a kid when he responds like that. She tells him to ask her while smiling instead. Vakir thought about Ayan's advice and knew that she was right. He couldn't hold back his emotions because of how shocked he was and knew that this sweet little child had done nothing wrong. Bakir then asks the same question to Pomerian about who the people in the picture were, but this time he asks her with a gentle smile on his face. Ayan looks in him and couldn't believe that her slave was able to smile like that. That comment made Vakir kind of annoyed. Pomerian then took a moment to answer. She then points a finger to the picture in the necklace, telling Vakir that it was her mommy, grandma, grandpa. Hearing the word grandpa made Vakir realize something. He recalled what Butler Barrymore told him that might have been true. A flashback is seen from when Vakir was younger. He was confused by Butler Barrymore as they walked through the estate. 
Barrymore informs the cure that he may not believe him, but the clan head Hugo used to have a very loving and gentle personality. The cure couldn't believe that Barrymore was referring to the scary Hugo that the cure knew and tells him that he didn't know how many people within the Baskerville would believe that. Barrymore further explains that in truth, the clan head loved the first wife Lady Roxana very much and cared for her dearly, although Lady Roxana passed away from illness, that wasn't the reason the clan head's personality changed. When the soul bloodline created between Hugo and Lady Roxana, Lady Penelope was taken away by barbarians, that was the tipping point. Hugo then began to move swiftly to find Lady Penelope, due to this, he requested the Emperor move him to the frontier, and the Baskerville house that used to be within the archipelago was moved to the mountain La Rouge et Le Noir where the barbarians lay hidden, but no matter how many hunting dogs he sent, he wasn't able to find any traces of Lady Penelope, as time passed, without being able to even confirm the life or death of Lady Penelope, the clan head ended up being filled with rage and sadness that caused him to cry tears of blood over the loss of his precious daughter. After that incident, Hugo's rage against the barbarians neared madness, and he became a cold calculating killing machine that lived only to destroy barbarians and demonic creatures. The cure thought about how he ignored Barrymore's story of Hugo because he just couldn't believe it due to its absurdity, but upon seeing the appearance of Pomerian in front of him, she was the living proof. Penelope is the daughter of Lady Roxana, the only woman that Hugo loved and the daughter of that Penelope is. Pomerian, if the cure had to guess if he was correct, then it meant that this girl here was Hugo's direct granddaughter, if Hugo, who currently treats how own children as tools while raging against the barbarians, saw his granddaughter who has barbarian blood mixed into her, what expression would he make? Wondered the cure, he soon places his hand on top of Pomerian's head to comfort her, he noticed that she wasn't treated well within the Rococo tribe, so he tells her to come with him, Pomerian's eyes and mouth open wide as she heard Vakir's words, Vakir continues to smile at her, thinking about if he was smiling correctly as she hadn't said anything yet, but she soon points out that her mom, hair, eye, same. Vakir tells her yes, as all the Baskerville hounds look similar in that it seems like he was her uncle. Pomerian repeated the word uncle as she continues to gaze at Vakir due to their similarity. She then looks back to the grave that she had built and placed a flower on. A flashback is seen where her mother, Lady Penelope was coughing badly due to the plague, she tells her daughter that if she ever sees someone with red eyes, then she must follow them. Pomerian continued to stare at the grave while thinking of her mother's last words to her, but her action catches Vakir's attention as he looks down. Pomerian was holding onto his shirt, she calls him uncle and tells him that she wanted to come with him, this was the moment when the two stragglers of the Iron-Blooded Sword clan had crossed paths. The scene changes to the tent that Vakir had built for Ion. A cutie pie pops her head out from the tent, asking her uncle about where he was going. Lads we must protect her at all cost. Comment below if you wish to protect this sweet thing. The cure tells her that he needed to go since he had a meeting to attend to as the matriarch had called for him. Pomerian wails out loud as she chases after the cure, telling him that they should go together. The cure agrees to her request and carries her up with his arm while thinking if she was scared of being alone. He thought about how it was great that she opened up but looking after a child was harder than he thought, but there was nothing he can do, the cure looks back at Pomerian who had nested herself onto his back, her face was filled with joy as she hugged the cure as he carried her, as the cure walked through the village to the meeting, he thought about how he couldn't raise her in the Balak's village, he needed to raise her somewhere Hugo's eyes can't reach, in a place where the empire's civilization grazes, he looks back at her and could see that she was sleeping and snoring peacefully, this made he think about Chihuahua and to ask him for a favor, the cure also noted that he needed to leave the forest and stop by the city later. We soon arrived at the matriarch's tent. She was alarmed to find out that there was an infectious disease going around. She tells the people who had gathered in her tent that it was bad, since the rainy season was approaching. If the disease is still present during the rainy season, the damage done would be even more lethal. But the shaman elder shouted out to her that it was not a disease, but a curse instead. The elders on his side agrees with what he said. They continued to tell the matriarch that lifting the curse would solve it and that they needed to perform a large ritual, but Ian argues back to them, telling them that it couldn't be a curse and that they needed to leave the village and relocate immediately, but the elders on the shaman's side didn't budge from their argument, they question Ian about how they could dare to abandon the scared place where the ashes of their ancestors rest, so it made relocation out of the question, they further argued that this was Balak's land, and that it was where they have lived for 200 years. The younger generation of leaders on Ian's side pushed back against the elders. They argued about the chance of the disease spreading all over and killing the children, 
and further states about their future, saying that their future generations will disappear if they continue to try looking after their ancestors' graves. The two sides continue to argue. The elders on the shaman's side continue to state that it was a curse and that it happens when you eat a strange mushroom, adding on that the ancestors were enraged because they had been neglecting their graves. Another elder was convinced that it was bug that was spreading the disease. The elders soon asked the matriarch to choose, but all she could do was remain silent as the two sides continued to battle against one another. The cure sat at the back of the meeting with Pomerian sleeping peacefully on his lap, so freaking cute, he thought about the Red Death. He knew that the infectious Red Death was comparable to the Black Death that had spread throughout the empire. This formidable disease was rampant and had spread to the empire's border. The reason why the empire was safe was due to Camus from the Morgue clan. She had casted a firewall to stop the spreading of the disease. It was also thanks to Dollars, the dispatched female saint from Quo, Vadis. With the help of her powerful divine power, they purified the disease. However, that treatment method was only restricted to the empire. Most barbarians who lived in the La Rouge et Le Noir mountain would die, but that was favorable for the Baskerville clan since the barbarians who played an important part of the forest's ecosystem disappeared, a monster wave occurred due to the influx of low-ranked monsters. This resulted in an exponential increase in the number of casualties among civilians. The Baskerville clan, who protected the borders, received support from the empire and started to subjugate the monsters. In the end, they were successful in protecting the border, and it became an opportunity for Hugo to further establish his political position. The cure then raises his hand up to catch the matriarch's attention. He tells her that he had a way to stop the Red Death. As the cure refused to witness that Hugo, a pair of green legs with three toes on each foot is tied upside down by a rope as it struggles to free itself. The green figure was then dumped into a pot of water. The rope that was tied onto its feet was pulled across a tree branch. It is revealed that there were a bunch of barbarians who surrounded the green figure as it was lifted up from the water. The barbarians were wearing a cloth on their faces as they exclaimed in wonder over this experiment. Upon closer inspection of the green goblin, they realized that it had contracted the red death after being dipped into the pot of water. The barbarian then tosses the green goblin that had the red death into a fire. Ian was happy to see that all the goblins that they had shoved into the infected water contracted red death. It all went accordingly to what the cure said. She then asks him if the red death really transmit through water. The cure tells her yeah. He explains to her that the infected water was the biggest cause of the infection. But once they boil the water, there shouldn't be any problem. Ian smiles and looks at the three other green goblins that they had captured, thinking that boiled water was fine. Seeing her happy expression and what they did to their comrade causes the remaining green goblins to be startled. Soon enough, one of them was tied to the rope once again and lowered into a boiling pot of water. It lets out a scream as its head enters the pot first, as soon as they pulled the green goblin out of the boiling water. Ian points out to it and tells Vakir that it had died immediately. Vakir tells her to put the green goblins into the cold water with a I can't believe this dumbass did that kind of face. Once again, the remaining green goblins were dipped into the cold water that Vakir had asked them to do. The tribe members couldn't believe that it was true. Even after some time passed, the green goblins didn't contract the Red Death. The tribe members were happy to have found a way to conquer the Red Death as the answer was water. They also asked that if they were to drink boiled water, they could prevent the infection. The matriarch appears with a smile on her face as she tells Vakir that he had done a good job. She informs him that it was thanks to them that they were able to see the light at the end of the tunnel, and for that she was grateful. But Vakir warns her that they couldn't let their guards down yet. He explains to her that the water cannot enter their eyes or any mucous membranes, as the red death can be transmitted through the respiratory system, so the tribe needed to be careful when the fog is present at dawn. Ian could be seen teasing the shaman over what he said about how the Red Death was supposedly a curse. All the shaman could do was grunt as he did nothing to help, but he soon questions Vakir on whether the solution to the Red Death was just to avoid water as the rainy season would soon arrive. He then asks about how they should avoid the waters when it happens. Vakir tells the shaman that what he said was true, that when the rain comes, there will be an overflow of water from the river and the air will become humid. There will be limitations to the methods of how they could boil water and wash up as they go according to the preventative measures. Kind of sounds like they have COVID. Hearing Vakir agree with him brought a smile to the shaman's face as he was right for once. But then Vakir tells him that they needed to relocate the village. Hearing that causes the shaman to be startled. He yells at Vakir that he had already told the tribe that they couldn't leave the place where their ancestors lie. He then questions Vakir if he was choosing to ignore the words of the Council of Elders. 
but Vakir remained determined with his words, he tells the tribe that there was a method such that they won't have to move from the Balak territory. The rainy season approached the Lurugi T. Lenoir mountain as dark clouds filled the skies with a heavy downpour of rain, the river flooded, and what was once flatlands became vast torrents of swampy terrain, within the deep forest. The torrential rain was something that even the elderly had never witnessed before, and that's how everything within the deep forest became flooded. Massive amounts of water covered the land as only the tops of the trees could be seen from above, all except for the Balak village. The tribe members could seen shouting to pull harder and tie it tighter as they held onto a rope. The tribe members continued to shout at one another to raise the fence, so that it could be stabilized and wouldn't fall down. It turns out that the Balak tribe had relocated to live on top of the trees. Just like the Ewoks from Star Wars, the other tribe members talked about how with this much rain, the village didn't get flooded. The other tribe member looks up and tells him that it was all thanks to a certain someone. The two tribe members soon shouted out at Vakir who stood above them. They thanks him for not getting the village flooded and thought about how great it was for them to have listened to him. Vakir continued to think about how it was a good thing that there were many tall trees within the Balak territory, which made it possible for them to be able to endure the rainy season. Pomerian then pokes her cute little head out of the tent, calling out to Uncle Vakir that she wanted to be with him, so cute, but something soon catches Vakir's attention as he looked down, he yells out to the two tribe members that it was dangerous, as a massive shadow in the water with glowing eyes approached the tribe members who were still waving at Vakir, the massive shadow soon comes out of the water, it was revealed to be a gigantic sea monster, the two tribe members were shocked to see this massive beast coming towards them, they screamed in horror as its massive teeth reached closer to where they were, but somebody else was quick to react as an arrow is being drawn. A powerful blow manages to land itself right onto the gigantic sea monster's body that causes its face to go like, WTF, Ian had appeared with her bow in hand, get lost, you damn catfish, said Ian. Bakir then asks her if that monster was the Mashusu, Ian explains to him that it was the one known to be the king for dozens of years around this area. She tells him that the tribe calls it Ka. It kind of looks like a mix between Garritos and Magikarp from Pokemon, comment below what you think it looks like, but the Ka doesn't retreat even after being hit by Ion's arrow, it slams its tail into the buildings that the tribe had built, it then sends the two tribe members flying through the air, the Kira immediately leaps down from his home, thinking about how the Ka was destroying the home that they had struggled to build, he summons Beelzebub as he hand unleashes that good looking red aura while telling the Ka that he was going to fix that habit of its, Vakir had fully summoned the Beelzebub blade as he lands onto the tree trunk, with a powerful leap forward that smashes the tree trunk into pieces, Vakir lets out the ever so powerful sixth technique of the Baskerville clan, six lurking ambushes, as he soars across the Ka he cuts it six, different ways, the Ka lets out a horrifying roar due to the pain that Vakir caused, he looks back at it to see the damages, the Ka soon retreated back into the swampy waters, yeah run like a bitch, you ain't nothing for our boy Vakir, the Kir then lands onto a nearby tree and stared at the Ka as it retreats back into the swampy waters, even the two tribe members were lucky enough to stop themselves from dropping into the waters as they clung onto the tree trunk with all their might, the other tribe members cheered the Kir on as they witnessed him chasing the Ka away, they couldn't believe the number of times that he had saved them, they continued to call the Kir as the Balak's hero, but our boy just felt relieved as he unsummons the Beelzebub sword into his hand, only the shaman felt annoyed over the heroic feat that Vakir had achieved, but Ahun wore a troubled expression on his face as he thought about something deeply, Ayan, our waifu, was simply starstruck and had fallen even deeper for Vakir's riz as she gave him a thumbs up while thinking that he had passed, she did, all this while her mother was watching her from the side, the scene then changes to a tent that was had light and smoke coming from out of it, a plate filled with some delicious looking food was placed on the carpet, yummy, our cutie pie Pomerian takes a bite onto one of the food that was on the plate, her face along with Ian's face were both filled with joy over the wonderful flavor that the food had, Pomerian gives her uncle Vakir a thumbs up and tells him that it was yummy, Ian tells her that Vakir was good at cooking, but our boy could only stare at them with a troubled look on his face, he then tells Ian that he couldn't remember inviting her into his house, she tells him that she couldn't just walk past a place where she could smell something yummy, Vakir then tells her that he didn't prepare her share of the food, but Ian replies back that whatever belongs to the slave, belongs to the master, so what was Vakir's was also hers, Vakir continues to argue with Ian about her calling him a slave as he had told him many times not to, but Ian continues to remind him to not pay attention to the fine print, as they argued with one another, Pomerian started to think deeply about something, 
she looks at both Ayan and Vakir, telling them both that it felt like they were a married couple, hearing those words made Ayan smile and blush. She then grabs onto Pomerian to hug her while rubbing their faces together. She tells Pomerian that she was so cute. Pomerian felt happy with her embrace and could only smile happily. Vakir looks at them and wonders when they had become so close. But a brief breeze of wind enters his tent which causes him to turn around. It turns out that there was someone who had opened the curtain to his tent even though it was raining heavily outside. As Ayan held onto Pomerian in her arms, she questions the person who stood at the entrance of their tent about their reason for coming here. It turns out to be a hun. He could be seen breathing heavily as the rain continued to pour heavily onto his body. He then calls out to Vakir in a low voice which startles Ayan and made Vakir nervous as a sweat drop appears onto his face. Tears flowed heavily from Han's eyes as he tells Vakir that he came here because he thought that it might be possible if it was him. Since Vakir had saved the village multiple times after all, Ahun then starts to beg Vakir, telling him please, please. The scene then changes to Ahun's little sister who was gasping for air as she laid on the ground. Ahun finally begs Vakir to please save his little sister. It turns out that she had contracted the Red Death as its red markings appeared on her face and neck. We return to Ahan's house on top of the tree during the harsh stormy weather. His little sister, one of our baby angels, is seen breathing heavily as she battled against the evil of the disease called Red Death. Ahan along with Vakir and Ayan stood by her side and monitored her status. Vakir then questions Ahan about when she had first showed signs of the Red Death. Ahan tells him since yesterday. He suspected that she had entered the swamp when they were gathering the wood for the construction of their houses on the trees. Ayan cuts in to inform Vakir that Ahul, the name of Ahun's little sister, was a kind child who always helps people. She wonders if there was anything Vakir could do, even Ahun looked at him with a worried expression on his face. Ha! shouted someone as the voice grabs everyone's attention in the house. A wet foot appears. The shaman had appeared in the house as well, with an annoyed look on his face. He tells them that it serves Ahul right for going around and not listening to her grandpa. He continues to scold Ahul telling them that what goes around comes around, and that this is what happens when you listen to the words of that imperial spy bastard Vakir. Ahun stands up in front of his grandfather to tell him that his words were too much. Shut up, shouted the shaman as a loud slap sound resonated throughout the house. He calls Ahun a useless bastard, as he was the same as his parents. Ahun could not talk back to the shaman as he held his cheek which had gotten slapped by him. The shaman then opens his umbrella as he exits from the house, turning back to the group once again. He tells them that he had mentioned this repeatedly, that this disease was a curse from God and that the answer to it was to carry out an ancestral rite. The shaman then warns them to not dirty the Balak's name by succumbing to the imperialist Vakir, since things have come to this. The shaman was confident that the matriarch will surely permit it. Ayan and Han could not refute the shaman's claims as he walked away from them. Ayan could only scold him under her breath while Han stood silently even after being hit and insulted. He then started to cry over the fact that he was a useless older brother that could do nothing to save his own little sister, but Vakir spoke out to them, telling them that if they were referring to treatment, he knew of one such method. He then orders a hun to sanitize the furniture that Ahul uses with boiling water, then to burn charcoal in the bonfire to chase out all of the bugs and bats that are around the house. They also needed to create an environment for Ahul to combat the disease in order for them to buy some time. Can you do that? asked Vakir to Ahun as he looked at Vakir with tears in his eyes. He quickly rubs the tears away telling Vakir that he could do it as he turned around. Ayan was surprised to hear that from Vakir. She walks over to his side to question him if he really knew about a way to save Ahul. Vakir replies that he did, but he needed her to do something for him. Ayan was glad to hear that she could help so she tells him to ask her for anything. Bring me out of the deep forest, was Vakir's request to Ayan who then wore a shocked expression on her face after she heard that. He looks at her with a serious look on his face, telling her that by doing that for him, Vakir would be able to get the medicine for the infection. Don't say such things, shouted Ayan all of a sudden which startles Ahun who was outside the house doing what Vakir wanted him to do. Ayan proceeds to scold and lecture Vakir, stating that even though he was acknowledged as a member of the Baloks, there is a condition for going out into a foreign land and that there was no way her principled mother would allow that. Vakir simply replied that he agrees that the principled matriarch would most likely give up on a heel, but he continues to tell her that if the people here keep it a secret, Vakir could sneak out and return without anyone knowing that he had left. Will you let me go? Ayan, said Vakir with his riz level going off the charts as he looked at her with his devious red eyes. But Ayan couldn't reply to him straight away. His riz powers had her stuttering as she gripped her body tightly. The scene changes to the deep forest being flooded with massive amounts of water. 
but something quick was bouncing off the logs that floated in the waters. Our boy Vakir is seen hopping with ease onto the various logs in the river, carrying something on his back as well, but then something was pulling his attention as he held a troubled expression. Vakir then comes to a screeching halt. He turns around to ask someone about why they were following him. Didn't you let me go? Questioned Vakir, as it is revealed to be our waifu Ayan who was following him from the start. She tells him that they should go together but Vakir replies that she would only get in his way. Ayan asks him to tell her where he was going but Vakir replied with a stern no. She then questions him about why he was taking Pomerian. It turns out that it was our cutie pie Pomerian who was being carried by Vakir all along. She was still sleeping peacefully on his back as Vakir didn't reply to Ayan's answer. She talked to Vakir about how she saw him using a sword that came out from his arm and the fact that he knew about Red Death. All these things happened yet Ayan didn't ask him about any of them. The rain continued to pour down heavily onto the pair as she recalled their memories together. Ayan knew from the first time that they met from when he had rescued her from being a slave, that she would always give in to Vakir. And the fact that she couldn't ask him anything is that. She knew that Vakir would disappear once he tells her the answer. So she just wanted Vakir to answer one thing. With a sad look on her face, Ayan asks him, You'll come back right? Afraid of hearing the worst answer from Vakir made Ayan close her eyes. I will, said Vakir which made Ayan open her eyes just as she was about to cry, but as she looked up to see him, her face changes expressions. Vakir had disappeared from her sight, leaving her to mutter the words, You better keep your promise. The scene changes to a mansion. Chihuahua could be seen touching his nose as he lets out a deep sigh. He noticed that it was getting dark already and that no matter how much paperwork he had done, the numbers don't seem to decrease. The moonlight then pours inside the room where he sat. He walks over to the window to gaze at the moonlit skies, thinking about how nice it was back the, when the deputy consul was here. The work may have been tiring but it was fun. Chihuahua still couldn't believe the fact that the deputy consul was dead as he watches over the city. I miss him, said Chihuahua with a saddened expression on his face as he gazes up to the moon. Did you call me? Asked Vakir as he appeared right in front of Chihuahua's face the same way Spider-Man did to Mary Jane in the first ever Spider-Man movie. Comment below if any of you could hang yourself upside down by just grabbing onto the window like Vakir is doing while holding Pomerian with his other arm. Chihuahua could only stare at the sudden appearance of Vakir with a shocked look on his face. But a sudden flurry of emotions combined with shock and fear overtook Chihuahua as his mind tried to process what was going on right now. Vakir finally lands down from his hanging position. In his Spider-Man pose, he looks at Chihuahua with a smile on his face while Pomerian continued to sleep peacefully on his back. How are you Secretary General Chihuahua? Vakir asks him. Chihuahua had finally calmed down after seeing the so-called dead Vakir alive right in front of him now. He then recalls the events that Vakir had explained to him, from Vakir confronting a monster from the deep forest, having received a critical injury and having to stay with the barbarians. As he sips his tea, Vakir agrees with what Chihuahua had summarized while Pomerian continued to sleep by his side peacefully. But Chihuahua continues to question Vakir about whether he was saying not his, not an actually ghost. Vakir could only smile and wonder if that was why Chihuahua was shocked for so long. He then tells Secretary General Chihuahua that he was still the same as ever. Tears flooded from his eyes upon hearing those words from our boy Vakir. His body trembled as he tried his best to contain his feelings while telling Vakir that he was so glad that he was still alive. But he soon questions Vakir about who the child was that was beside him as she resembles Vakir. Chihuahua further asks if she was the child that he had with the barbarians. Vakir replies that he and Pomerian simply shared the same bloodline which was why they look similar and that it was not what he was thinking about. But Chihuahua continued to become more curious after hearing that Vakir and Pomerian shared the same bloodline and that he had mentioned that it was not what he was thinking about right now as he continues to wipe the tears off his face. Vakir then asks Chihuahua about whether he could look after the child beside him. This was when Vakir introduces and reveals that this child was called Pomerian. He noted that it would be good for him to go through basic education with her. Chihuahua immediately agrees to Vakir's request, noting that it had been a while since he had gotten an order from him so he wanted Vakir to leave it to him. Vakir then notices a pile of books and papers that covered and sat on top of Chihuahua's desk. This prompts him to ask about whether it was difficult for him to take on the work for Underdog City by himself as the Secretary General. Vakir then offers a solution by telling Chihuahua to look for Cindy Wendy's and Mesamadunaro if he ever needed help. Hearing that name made Chihuahua recall the image of Cindy as he questions Vakir if she was the same criminal that he had released two hours ago during the plea deal. But he was more curious about how to find her. Vakir asks him if he remembers the time when he was in office and had given 10 billion gold to a certain girl. 
Chihuahua remembers the girl as Judy who sold flowers. The cure reveals that no one was supporting Judy which made approaching her easy so Cindy would have went with that child. He added on that if Cindy doesn't cooperate he could tell her that the cure was still alive, and since she was indebted to him, she would be willing to help. Chihuahua replies that he understood and was happy to find a solution with his workload, as the sun started to rise in the background. Chihuahua then asks Vakir about when he would be returning. Vakir smiles and continues to drink from his cup, telling Chihuahua that he would return once he had finished what he needed to do. Recalling the moment he had left Ian behind in the deep forest, Vakir knew that he had to return as he had a promise to fulfill as well. Treating a Yule's Red Death can be done quickly with a single drop of holy water from that clan. Knowing that information made Vakir decide on what he needed to do as he looked out from the window while Pomerian and Chihuahua got closer to one another in the background. Gazing up into the skies, Vakir knew that he had to go to the religious and holy Quo Vadis clan. The scene changes to a new location we have never seen before. Two guards wearing silver armor stood together as they held their spears in an ancient city. One of them soon notices something that was approaching their city. Seeing the incoming object made they cross their spears to block its path. It turns out to be a carriage that was being led by a horse. The guards announce to the driver that they would be carrying out an inspection. One of the guards recognizes the driver as Sir Joseph, who is the one that manages the oil shop on the first floor. They soon question him about what he had brought with him this time. Joseph smiles and reveals a letter in his hand informing the guards that he had brought foil as it was written on his import permit. One of the guards steps forward and asks him if he could check what was inside. Joseph chuckles nervously while telling the guard that he had come here really often and wonders if there really was a need to check it, but the guard refuses his request by telling him that the higher-ups take importance in formalities. Seeing his request denied started to cause Joseph to sweat a bit. The guard continued to look amongst the various barrels of oil that were on the carriage, thinking about which one of them he should open. He finally picks up a single oil barrel and noted that this one looks good. Panic and fear started to set inside Joseph as he couldn't believe that the guard had chosen the single barrel that was the most important to him. The guard soon opens the lid off the oil barrel, looking inside of it with an intense gaze. He then commented out that it was fine as it was revealed that the oil barrel contained nothing else but oil inside it. The guard walks past Joseph and informs him that he can pass. Joseph lets out a sigh of relief after seeing that nothing had happened. The guards then welcomed him to St. Mecca. The carriage that Joseph drove soon reached the end of an alleyway inside the city. You can come out now, said Joseph as he looked back at the oil barrels with a nervous aura surrounding him, but the oil barrels simply remained silent for a moment, before a handprint appeared from within one of the oil barrels with tremendous strength. Joseph watched in horror as the sounds of the oil barrel lid echoed through the air as it continued to be hammered by the hand. A figure soon emerges from inside the oil barrel covered in the oil wearing a costume as if he was a plague doctor from Assassin's Creed. The figure soon walks out from the oil barrel. Joseph approaches the figure and nervously asks that since he had fulfilled his promise of getting the figure inside St. Mecca, then it meant that he could go now. But the figure tells Joseph to wait which startles him. The figure hands over a pouch to Joseph, telling him that it was the ox bear canine which was promised to him. Joseph nervously accepts the reward and thanks the figure for it. He stood still as he watched the figure walk away. Joseph couldn't believe that the figure had been submerged inside the oil barrel for over two hours, making him question if that mysterious figure was even human at all as that same figure stood on top of the bell tower, giving off major Assassin Creed vibes. The mysterious figure soon removes the mask and lets out a deep breathe. It was revealed to be Vakir. He watches over St. Mecca while stating that it was his first time being submerged for so long since the river sticks, where he was submerged for seven minutes. But anyways he was glad to have successfully infiltrated the Quo Vadis territory. St. Mecca was the Quo Vadis clan's central city. It has a population of 160,000 people. Because of the church, sexual desires and greed are heavily restricted. Even if gold is on the floor, they would walk past it. Since the citizens are consciously aware of order and public peace, they strictly abide by the rules. The bell in St. Mecca soon begun to rung heavily. Vakir looks up at it and started to think about how when the clock tower's bell rings, the people of St. Mecca would do this weird thing where they stop walking and pray. Just like Vakir thought, the people of St. Mecca soon stood still and held their hands together in a prayer position. A familiar headdress soon appears amongst the citizens of the city. Vakir calmly and easily walks past all the citizens with ease, thinking about how they could live when it's so suffocating here. Night soon arrives as darkness covers the streets of the city only to be lighted by lamps. Vakir stood in front of a water well while rummaging through his jacket, 
he reveals a vial that contained a purple liquid inside of it and opens the cap, he then begins to pour out the mysterious purple liquid inside the vial, the red death's infectious bacteria is carried in a Huel's blood, sweat and tears, it's a highly infectious plague, so people will get infected immediately pouring this into the well, although it's an extreme method, the situation is very urgent, and every minute and second is precious, it's a religious and holy territory so, they'll be rescued before a casualty even comes, hey who are you, questioned a bunch of kids that appeared from behind Vakir out of the blue, the kid talked about how there was a suspicious person by the well but his friend tells him that they should just go, as looking at Vakir made them realize that he looks dangerous, Vakir lets out his bloodhound Riz Aura which envelopes the entire area around him in a red murderous color, he calls out to the children and tells them to listen carefully, he warns them that this well was cursed, and that those who drink the water from this well will not be spared by death, heed my words well warned Vakir, the kids immediately tried to get the F out of there as they screamed out in horror, they shouted out that there was a ghost and that the ghost had placed a curse on the well, another kid began to cry as he shouts that he would never drink from that well, as the ball that the kids dropped rolled over to Vakir, he was glad that with this, the children wouldn't drink from the well, such a nice guy, a dagger soon appears and stabs itself deep into the ground, Vakir had placed the dagger near the water well, noting that a dagger left by the Leviathan clan, a clan famous for its deadly poisons, and that judging from the situation, the ones who spread the red death in the deep forest were none other than the Leviathan clan, Vakir smiles deviously over his mastermind plan, knowing that since the religiously holy clan and the deadly poison clan hadn't had a good relationship since long before, he knew that a huge fight will probably break out with his actions, and that it was all for his preparations, Vakir soon realizes that it was almost time the holy water pours, making him wonder if he should go see the saintest dollars, a blonde haired woman sat on a chair, and watches the citizens gather before her, is this a new waifu for our boy, comment below what you think, numerous citizens of the city had gathered before the saint's massive mansion where she stays, the crowd of citizens continued to shout out to her, exclaiming that they had heard that the saints rests here and that they wanted her to open the door so that they could give their blessings, the crowd continues to call out to the saints by asking her to please take a look at their illness while some of them simply wanted to see her face, a voice started to appear in the air wondering why they had all come to see her at such a late hour, the citizens recognizes that the voice belongs to the saints, a man appears and announces to her that he would like to introduce himself as the lord of the Dortsmile region, he was also the eldest son of the Jonathan clan, the clan that dispatches soldiers often and that he was also the son-in-law of the Alphonse clan, another man appears to introduce himself as well, he was the one that was in charge of the Ibsen Guild Association, the association that oversees the bourgeois family's exports, he was also an honorable knight who served Count Boston Terrier Le Baskerville as his squire for two years, an older gentleman introduces himself this time, telling the saints that if she heals his personal illness then he would be willing to reward her with the entire productive granary, he would also reward her with a villa that sits on the beachfront villa on the warm southern shore and exclusive carriages, even after hearing all those numerous titles of prestigious men and their rewards for her powers, the saints simply replies to them to stop, she informs them that she was uncertain if the identity or wealth they presented was enough of a reason for her to open her gates at such a late hour, she then tells everyone to return to where they came from, the citizens hear this and none of them argued back, they simply left her gates, Vakir stood among the citizens as everyone went their separate ways to return home, he held a curious look on his face as he recalled his past memories, before Vakir had regressed, he often saw the saints on the front lines of the battlefield, he saw her covered in blood desperately treating the injured, her white clothes were stained in a bloody red and her white divine power never stopped glowing, the saints that Vakir knew of dislikes money and power as he recalled while staring at her gates, as he stood alone in front of her gate, the saints soon asks Vakir about who he was to come and look for her, Vakir kneeled down before the gates upon hearing her voice, telling the saints that he was just a young lamp that had lost its way, Vakir continued to kneel down in front of the gate for a while as there was no reply to his answer, but the gates soon opened to reveal the holy light that poured out of it with immense glare, the holy light shined brightly onto his mask as the saints tells him to please come in, entering the gates changes the scene as holy relics decorated the walls and ceilings, Vakir continued to walk towards the angel statue that stood above a pool of water that sparkled brightly, the saints continued to question Vakir about how he had lost his way, but before he answers her, Vakir thought about how she was not going to personally meet her and figured that she had no reason to meet someone who's wearing such suspicious clothing, throwing a bag onto the fountain, 
the cure reveals to the saints that he had come to report that there was an epidemic spreading throughout the slums, he had brought the water from their well through the pouch that was on the fountain, telling the saints that since she possesses divinity, the Akira was sure that she would be able to detect the wicked energy that was exuding from the water that he had brought to her. The saints remain silent upon hearing that horrible information from the Akira, but she soon replies to him that he had lied to her. Upon hearing those words the gates behind the Akira immediately shut itself closed in an instant. Troops covered in metal armor soon appeared and gathered around the Akira on the second floor, but the Akira simply showed no reaction to the events that had just occurred around him. A lone man stood in front of the others and exclaimed that for a young lamb who has its ways, Vakir's way of speech was rather aggressive. The man soon questions Vakir about who he is. Vakir's eyes began to glow bright red as he thought about how the man who stood in front of him belonged to a face that he hasn't seen for a while. Vakir knew the man as Pietro Quo Vadis. Before he had regressed, Pietro was someone whom Vakir entrusted his back to in the battlefield. Pietro was the type of man who never compromises with injustice and if it's for the name of justice, he was a man that can be more cruel than demons. The cure had also learnt the interrogation techniques he used on the seven young masters in Underdog City from him. The cure then spoke out loud to Pietro that it was quite refreshing to see him here but all it did was confuse Pietro. He soon informs the cure that he had heard that he came here to report about an epidemic but due to the attire he was wearing, it made the cure quite suspicious. So until he takes off the mask and displays some courtesy, the cure cannot meet the saints. The cure replies back to him that there was a reason why he was wearing this gag mask and that he couldn't take it off, and since he had reported whatever he needed to, the cure's job was done and so he decided to take his leave first, but a blue object speeds past his face at an incredible speed which causes the cure to stop in his tracks. Pietro shouts out that he couldn't allow a suspicious person like him to return as he held open a book that shined brightly in his hand. The cure took a look at the object that was revealed to be a piece of paper. He speculated whether Pietro had thrown the paper after infusing it with divine power. The cure noted that Pietro still uses such interesting weapons, reminds anyone of Gambit's powers from X-Men. Pietro then lands right in front of him, telling him that he could sense the wicked energy coming from that water pouch that the cure had brought to them. Pietro then concluded that if there really was an epidemic then it must have been the cure who spread it. The cure then questions his logic on whether he was the culprit if so then why would he come here to report it. Pietro further deduces that it might be according to Vakir's tactics to bait the saints out, hearing that made Vakir thought about how Pietro's every word was right, summoning and casting even more of the blue pages imbued with holy powers to Vakir. Pietro announces that he would hear his confession later when he was in prison. Seeing the attack coming made Vakir immediately dodge the blue papers as they flew all around him, as he continued to run from Pietro's attacks. He knew that if he uses aura then everyone here would figure out that he was a Baskerville member. He soon spots the place where he needed to be at. He leaps onto the balcony of the second floor and into the air to dodge the blue paper attack. The cure then continued to fly towards Pietro who simply stood in the same spot while casting even more of the blue papers towards the cure. With a heavy downward strike, the cure lands a hit onto Pietro who still manages to block the powerful attack. But he was shocked by the weight of the attack as he noted that it felt as if there was a boulder that fell on top of him. Feeling the intense weight behind Vakir's attack made Pietro wonder where such strength was coming from due to Vakir's small physique. Seeing that the attack had failed to land properly causes Vakir to leap backwards from Pietro. As he leaped through the air, Vakir noted that it was the skill that he had obtained from killing the ox bear two years ago. The skill was called 600 kg stability. He also noted that it was his first time using it and that the skill wasn't that bad. The moment he landed on the ground, the cure took no chance and instantly rushes towards Pietro once again. This time he lets out a mad flurry of punches that seemed to stop Pietro from casting his skills. He could only stand still and block the cure's attacks. Seeing him hesitate gave the cure a chance to cast another one of his skills as flames started to appear on his hand. With a swipe of his right arm, flames cut across Pietro's body as the cure cast it as a plus rank skill called Cerberus Flame. The book that Pietro held was soon set ablaze as he immediately shouts in pain over being burned as he threw the flaming book onto the ground. The Kears asks him if he wanted to continue as Pietro healed his hand by stopping the fire from spreading through the use of the water from the fountain. Feeling angry over the Kears attacks causes Pietro to slam his fist together as he shouted out that the Kier was using sorcery which was irreligious. He then rushes towards the Kier to tell him that he wasn't going to let him go. The cure sees him coming and immediately kicks the book that was still burning towards his face which stops Pietro in his tracks as he was confused by the sudden appearance of his old book. Due to that moment of hesitation, 
it provided Vakir with the chance to land a powerful blow onto Pietro's body as he slammed his might fist into him. The punch that Vakir had sent out was covered in his aura, allowing him to hurl Pietro into the angel statue of the fountain which causes it to break into pieces from the impact of Pietro's body. He soon coughs out blood due to the damage dealt by Vakir. The soldiers that were gathered on the second floor couldn't believe that their boss had been defeated and wondered amongst themselves if they were dreaming right now, wasting no time at all. The soldiers gathered themselves around Pietro to protect him from Vakir. Seeing their reaction made Vakir realize that the soldiers didn't intend on stopping the fight right now, but the saints soon appears on the second floor to tell everyone to stop, introducing to everyone Vakir's new waifu. The saints had appeared and questioned Vakir if he was the lost young lamb, but she replies to Vakir that he looked more like a puppy than a lamb, a small puppy covered in injuries. But a soldier on the ground floor tells her that Vakir wasn't a puppy but a blood-crazed wolf instead. The saint soon requests the soldier to bring them some tea which surprises him. She informs them that she needed to talk to Vakir. Comment below if you think Vakir is getting a new wife. The tea and snacks had been served onto the table. The saint and Vakir sat at the table across from one another while Pietro stood behind her as her personal bodyguard. He continues to stare at Vakir with a stern look on his face while remaining silent as the saint picks up her teacup. Vakir looks at the saint and wonders if she was 16 years old right now. The pretty blonde lady aka Vakir's potential future waifu who sat across from him was known as Dollars Luan Quo Vadis the Saint. In the future during the war against the demons, she treated patients on the front lines, saving countless lives. She is the living example of benevolence. During the time of ruin, like everyone else every martial artist who encountered her, including Vakir himself respected her. Dollars continues to stare at Vakir with a cross symbol in her eyes in silence after taking a sip of her tea. She then reveals to him that she had been stressed lately which piques Vakir's interest as he wonders what she meant by that. Dollars continues on to say that she was a student who had enrolled in the Imperial Academy called Colossio, as it was the holidays. She was currently taking a break from studying and the handling of family affairs. Hearing this from her made Vakir wonder what was with the sudden mundane talk. She then looks out the window to tell Vakir that just as he witnessed from before, nobles and merchants would look for her no matter the time. The illnesses that they wanted her to treat are either after effects of narcotics or sexually transmitted infections. She sees that there was not one person who was gravely ill present among the crowd that had gathered before. She continues to inform Vakir that justice, righteousness, benevolence, and equality is God's will, but she wonders why do people only see what's in front of them? Theology is essentially the process of understanding humans, so it's inevitable. Was Vakir's answer to Dollar's question, which was good enough to catch her attention? She recognizes the phrase that Vakir spoke out loud as the Old Testament Asmoser from chapter 6 verse 9. She couldn't believe that there was someone who knows such old passages exists but Vakir simply remained silent afterwards. He then changes the topic to inform Dollars that there was an epidemic that has spread throughout the slums of St. Mecca and that the pouch that contains the infected water that Vakir had personally collected from a well in the slums, hearing all that information made Dollars wonder if it was all accurate. She stares at him with a serious look in her eye and questions Vakir on whether he was not involved in this incident. He answers back to her with a question, if I was would I come here on my own? But Vakir continued to think that he couldn't avoid suspicion, which prompts him to wonder if he should use that method as he raises his hand off the chair. Seeing that sudden action from him catches Pietro's attention immediately, he stands in front of Dollars to act as a shield while telling her to get behind. But a sparkling light soon appeared in the middle of the air. Vakir tells them that he dislikes harming innocent people as the divine light power started to radiate from his own hand. He continues to tell them that it was especially true since this was his hometown. Dollars was captivated by the appearance of the divine power in Vakir's hands while Pietro remained stunned and wary of his actions. Dollars couldn't believe that Vakir was a believer of Luan. He then stops showing off the divine power and questions them on whether they would listen to what he has to say now. He informs them that he had spotted some suspicious people pouring liquid from a glass bottle into the slum's water, and that those people were criminals. Hearing this made her worry as she continues to doubt Vakir's words while asking him if he knew what their motives were, taking out a scroll from his jacket. Vakir tells her that the criminals were probably those who wish for the decline of the Quo Vadis family and those who will benefit from that. Unrolling the scroll onto the table revealed marked territories of the land. Vakir points to the section marked with Leviathan and continues to explain to Dollars that firstly, the ones who will benefit most are the deadly and poisonous Leviathan clan as well as the conglomerate bourgeois family. The Leviathan clan will use the epidemic as an opportunity to collect samples from countless patients and use them as research. 
moreover once the divine Quo Vadis family falls, there is no other method better than this for the Leviathan family who are hostile towards them, there is also the bourgeois family. Valuables don't disappear during an epidemic, with the death of labor's landowners will become bankrupt, with the presence of empty fields factories and stores, the family will consume a variety of real estate and start a new business. The Kier knew for certain that the ones who spread the Red Death are the Leviathan bastards and the ones who cooperated with them so they could reap the benefits are the bourgeois merchants, the natives of the deep forest become scapegoats in order for both clans to benefit, so after explaining the reasons, Viakir concluded that they were the ones closely related to the epidemic but reminded Dollars that it was just his hypothesis. Hearing all that explanations and information made Dollars think that it was all possible while wondering how it was possible for someone to predict future incidents so accurately to exist, making her question Vakir about who he was as his shadow was revealing a strong energy. Vakir then tells them to just call him the Night Hound. Hearing that name sounded ominous to her while Pietro commented that Vakir had picked a name that suits what he was wearing well which was utterly blasphemous. Moving on to think about what Vakir said made her note that it was quite possible. She then informs Pietro that they needed to visit the slums as they needed to investigate the epidemic and to report it to her father. Pietro hears her orders and replied back that he understood. Seeing her take action made Vakir realize that he was lucky to meet the saint and that with this, things will be able to progress much faster. Dollars continues to look at Vakir and wonder what it was. Why does the man who defeated the unrivaled Sir Pietro and the Holy Knights look so small and pitiful? Staring deeper into our boy's soul with her cross pupils, Dollars could sense the smell of a beast exuding from his soul, the smell of blood oil and stell as well as violence and pent-up anger, the color of hatred, in deep whirlpool of numerous emotions within that lies immense sadness. Who is this person was the question that continued to linger in her mind. The scene then changes back to the slums where Vakir had poured the infected water into the well. We arrive at a rundown church whose lights were turned on. A group of nuns were alarmed by something as they appeared with masks covering their faces. They couldn't believe that the saint herself had arrived to their church. One of the nuns began to cry as she begged dollars to please save them from the horrific epidemic as numerous people laid on the ground covered in blankets. Seeing this sight made her realize that what the night hound had said was all true. The cure stood at the back and was still able to see what his work had done. He apologizes in his head towards the people who had gotten infected due to the lack of time he had. But he was thankful that there were at least no children who had gotten infected, making him wonder if the fear he instilled among the children at the well worked. But Vakir was thankful again that the infected civilians were at the initial stages of the disease so he had no choice but to leave the rest to the saint. Seeing the infected civilians up close made her note them as pitiful people. She held the hand of an infected person to tell them that they didn't have to worry as the godwoman's most sublime love will heal all of them. Dollars then began her prayer. The light of my light the flame of my life. My sins my soul. Witness these pitiful people who have gathered here. A teardrop started to appear on her eye which slowly dripped down from her face. As it touches the ground, a golden light started to appear and shined brightly. The effects of the prayer was intense as a holy light started to cast itself onto dollars as she prayed. The light was strong enough to be seen from the outside of the church from where everyone was. The light continued to shine upon the infected civilian whose infection soon disappears as the light began to die down. The nuns were impressed by the miracle that they had just witnessed from the saint. They couldn't believe that the infection people were all healed at once. They began to thank the saint for her work and praised their god Lumen as their savior. The cure looks intensely and noted that it was that power. He needed to bring the miracle of holy water to the forest as dollars continued to pray for everyone with tears in her eyes. Subscribe, like, comment and share to support the channel. Thank you for the support. We now turn to Dolores who was by herself in a room that was lighted by a single candle flame on her table. She appears to be writing something down. Her face was filled with a look of focus as she crosses out certain areas on a map that was laid on the table. She thought deeply about how treating patients with divine power was just a temporary measure and knew that she couldn't stop new patients from arising, but seeing the number of crosses on the map made her realize the fact that more cases are appearing, which meant that there was an infected well somewhere within the slums. She then turns her attention to a vial of green liquid that glowed slightly in the dark, looking at the bodily fluid from an infected person. She noted that it has a very short incubation period, and that it takes a very long time for an infected person to die. It's malignity which causes the infected person to be in pain for a very long time. In order to stop the infected completely, Dolores needed to focus and purify the deepest well, hoping to do so by create a single drop by concentrating her divine power. But as she lets out a deep sigh, 
Dolores understood that now wasn't the time for her to be lost in her thoughts and she needed to go and treat one more person, but a feeling of uneasiness took over her body, causing her to drop to her knees as she held onto the table for support. She recognizes the feeling as anemia, which made her wonder if this was the repercussion for using too much divine power, but she decided to swallow her fears instead and stood up to leave the room as she knew that she could still do it, if it's to alleviate the pain the patient's experience as soon as possible. As soon as she left her room, Dolores was greeted by somebody shouted out that the saint has arrived, it turns out to be the three nobles who were waiting for her with the crowd late at night, they informed Dolores that they would go with her too and not worry anymore, but she questions them about why they were here, the nobles reply that they had come here to help her as they couldn't leave such a noble lady alone in a low and dirty place, they inform her that they had brought three wagons filled with donations and emergency relief, so that people from the slums had won the jackpot today, but as they told her this, Dolores' face was filled with a dead stare, her vision of them was muddied with a purple blur as she sees them for what they were. The nobles continued to tell her that they thought the people of the slums would be skinny and live in filth but discovered that they were quite humane. One of them wonders if they may have gone overboard with the donations, as another was worried that if they give the slum people the donation, then they will lose their will of self-sufficiency. The nobles soon cut to the chase and informed the saint that it was also a gentleman's duty to protect the lady, which was why they wanted to follow along with her. Dolores then replied back to them saying that she thought they had delivered their intentions well, with a holy aura surrounding her, she tells them that she would leave it them with a smile on her face, just those words and look on her face was enough to capture the hearts of the three nobles as they blushed heavily while gripping their chests tightly. We soon returned to the tents that held the infected patients of the slums, the three noble men all held disgusted looks on their faces even though they had a mask on, they complained about the smell of the place while shouting out that one of them had stepped on trash, complaining to the others that his shoes were expensive and was limited edition. All while the clergy and doctors were trying to heal the infected patients, the noblemen then began to beg the priest to treat them first as they held themselves back from vomiting. They even argued to the priest that they believed that they were going to get infected as well, even going so far as to command the priest to move everything so that they could get out of here. All them complained as Dolores stood in the back. She knew that this would happen as it was blasphemous to come to a relief area with ulterior motives. She continues to wonder if the nobleman did not know that that the only thing they needed was empathy for the sick. Absolute and pure altruism, dogmatic sacrifice a sense to volunteer kindness and tenderness. These are the closest things to God's grace and love. As she continued to walk through the relief area, Dolores's face changes to something more serious. A dark aura began to seep out from behind the curtains of the tent that stood before her. She knew that from here onwards, it was more horrific and that the critical patients were all gathered here, the sick and the clergy everyone here will be in pain, as she made her way towards the sickest area, Dolores apologizes to everyone in her mind for not being here with them, with each step she took, she lighted the way with holy aura that brightens everything in its path, she opens the curtains to the area, knowing that she was now present with them here, but something stuns her the moment she saw what was happening in this area as a voice shouts out to quickly bring more saline, a scalpel was then seen being pointed towards the chest of one of the infected patients, the priest and nun were standing by the side, alarmed to be witnessing something that made them question if divine power was the only thing that would work on the infected patients, the clergy even questions just how many hours has our boy been with these patients by himself, as soon as there was cut made by the scalpel on the infected area, vicar places his hand over with divine power covering it, sliding his fingers along the cut made it disappear along with the infected areas of the body, the clergy sees his actions and speculates that vicar wasn't blessing the skin but was instead letting the blessing flow into the infected area, he then realized if that was what Vicar was doing, then he himself might be able to focus and use divine power. The clergy continued to be amazed as he didn't think that a method like that would work. Dolores on the other hand was still stunned by our boy as she recognizes him as the night hound. All she could think of was amazing, as she didn't expect him to be this skilled when it comes to medicine and divine power. Vicar then went on to try his best in healing the other infected patients, his face underneath the mask was filled with sweat dripping down as he focuses on healing as much as possible. In general, divine power is a cleric's prayer reaching God, which God then accepts and gives the cleric power. The amount of divine power given depends on how devoted you are to God, and the amount of divine power is proportional to the amount needed to perform a miracle. One divine power is equal to one miracle, and ten divine power can create ten miracles, however, Vicar knew of the method on how to perform 10 miracles with 1 divine power and a 100 miracles with 10 divine power. During the time of the fall, the monsters that mobbed them and the number of patients lying in front of the clerics, 
which outnumbered the monsters knew that the amount of divine power they possessed couldn't stop the disaster. The decision made by God is because of the desperation and wavering faith of the clerics, so they changed the equation to perform miracles. Take measure now, and face what happens after, perform miracles first and deal with what happens later, even if the divine power they needed to recover came with interest. It was a strange phenomenon where they used all the divine power they could muster, people called this phenomenon as advanced divine power, and because it was a time where killing monsters was regarded to be an act of faith, even if you weren't a cleric, if you killed a monster, you would be able to use advanced divine power. Because of that, Vicar who has a soul which accumulated karma from the past, can use divine power if it's within a divine region. A young girl started to cry out loud as she screams for her mother who had been infected by the virus. Vicar walks over to her and tells her that he would fix her mother soon, he informs her that she was sick but also suffering from severe malnutrition. He then hands over a single gold coin, telling the little girl to use it to get food and firewood and a nurse for her mother, but the priest spots the transaction which causes him to shout at Vicar, telling him that materialistic help was not permitted, as monetary demands were endless, so if Vicar does give that gold coin to the little girl then he might end up giving all his money to the people of the slums who kind of look like zombies the moment money was mentioned, but all Vicar answered back was with a question, why is there no end to something that's endless? This question was enough to make the priest silent as Vicar tells him that there was a limit to how much money was in his pocket, so he was just going to give it all to the people of the slum. A huge bag of gold was then placed behind Vicar as he told the priest. Vicar then turns his attention back to the infected mother who was struggling to breath. All he could say to her was that he was sorry. Dolores continued to stand still with her fist clenched near her chest. She had overheard Vicar telling the infected patient that he was sorry. Seeing Vicar made her question why this person was sorry for and why was he apologizing, she soon recalls the time that they had tea together where Vicar answered her question by stating that theology is essentially the process of understanding humans so it was inevitable, recalling that memory made Dolores wonder if Vicar had the same reason as her, seeing the divine power resonating brightly from Vicar, Dolores wonders if Vicar was apologizing because he wasn't able to treat more people, as she gazes upon the bright light that Vicar's divine powers had brought forth. Her heartbeat began to sound even louder as she turned away from him. The 16-year-old girl who was still young and inexperienced, the Saint Dolores, as she held her trembling hands together in a prayer position, she soon places them onto her chest while her face was blushed heavily. Dolores' heart had started to beat fast for the mysterious man who was in front of her. One more lady has fallen for our boy's riz. A round of applause everyone. Vicar had healed as much people as he could. He soon touches his mask and removes it revealing a sweaty face and tired look, he then takes a sip of water from his water pouch, sitting on a fence on a beautiful sunny day, but something soon catches his attention as he stops drinking to turn and see what it was, seeing that Dolores was standing beside the tree behind him, Vicar immediately puts on his mask while asking her what was wrong, but all she did was stare at our boy with a nervous look on her face, she then sits beside him, asking Vicar if it was alright for her to talk to him for a moment, Vicar paused for a second before telling her that he didn't mind, Dolores thanks him for his help as it was thanks to Vicar that they were able to treat all the casualties, but all Vicar tells her was that he just did what he needed to do. Hearing his reply made Dolores comment that she expected him to say such a thing, but an awkward silence soon arrives as neither one of them exchanged words. Dolores could only stare at Vicar in awkward silence once again, but this time, she grips her skirt tightly in her hands, telling Vicar that a strong person like him should have been born with divine power. This was when she reveals her honest thoughts to Vicar telling him that she believed she was lucky to be born with divine power but her body mind and faith weren't as strong, making her question why God would choose such a weak person like her to be the saint. She continues to tell Vicar with a sad look on her face that there were so many other people who have strong faith, even though they aren't born with divine power, making Dolores question God again on why he had granted her with the excessive title of saint. This is when our boy's Riz goes to work. Vicar tells her that the fact that she was in anguish and guilt was the reason why God had chosen her. He continues to tell her with a smile on his face that what the world's needs is a light that shines through the deepest and most ferocious places. Dolores could feel our boy's powerful Riz ability piercing her holy soul as she gazes at him in silence, but Vicar's good looks and words were enough to cause her to have tears appearing in her eyes. Her body continues to tremble from Vicar's Riz presence, asking him if she would be able to become the person who would be able to say those things. Our boy takes a moment once again before telling our future waifu that she will. The conversation between lovers ends as we explore the outcome of what happened in the slums. 
The outcome of having the Quo Vadis family's clergy gathered and praying in one area was that all processes involved in the creation of holy water ended successfully, a divine essence that's able to purify all of the infected within the slums with one drop. Three drops of the concentrated holy water were created, including reserves, the name of it was Plani de la Verge, the saint's tear, as three bottles were only made. Those same three bottles were placed on top of a cushion and positioned as a type of altar. Dolores was seen kneeling down in front of it, placing her hands together and wearing a ceremonial dress. She started to pray. She chanted the following words, Everyone behold, the woman whose son is the one and only is here, I who unfortunately had to nurture God's son, wailed at night and it lasted until the next, I'm in so much agony as my heart could not follow. Today is the most agonizing and sorrowful day for me. As Dolores continued to pray with all her soul and heart, a bright yellow light started to appear all around her, surrounding the altar that the three bottles were placed at as a pillar of yellow light shined brightly on them. The three bottles were soon placed into a case that one of the soldiers held. The soldier who held the case closes it, thanking the Dolores for her hard work and informing her that they would make sure that they store this well in the basement safe. Dolores commented that she would leave it to them. Her attention was then drawn somewhere else as she gazes outside the church with a nervous look as she knew that something else must be done now. The scene then changes to a beautiful angelic statue. A cardinal appears with a prayer bead in his hands. He stood alone in front of the angelic statue before Dolores calls out to him, calling the man that stood alone as father. She informs him that she had came here to report something about the Red Death. Her father spoke out to her, telling her to come closer while calling Dolores his fairy and daughter. She readily accepts his command and moves even closer to him while holding on to something. Her father touches her shoulder and noted that she had made a large offering this time. He smiles at her with joy as he expected it from his daughter. This man was named Humbert Humbert Loon Quo Vadis, the cardinal of the Loon Church, but for some reason Dolores did not show the same level of affection towards her father as her eyes and face remained motionless while telling her father that he was being too gracious with his words. Humbert then tells her to reveal what had happened. Dolores informs him that at first they had planned to use the saint's tear that they had created to purify all of the water that's flowing underneath Saint Mecca. Hearing this made Humbert question her on whether they had found the source of the infection, she tells him that they did and revealed to him that the source of the infection had came from an unregistered well in the slums, she added on that there were children who had testified by saying that a spirit had cursed the well, making it severely infected, they had also found the glass bottle that the criminal had used to store and spread the infection. She also tells Humbert that after investigating that area, they had found a suspicious object, as Dolores showed him the thing. Humbert was startled to see what it was. He questions her on where she had found these items to which she tells him that they were at the well. Humbert's eyes began to fill with divine holy rage as he recognizes the emblems on the items as those belonging to both the Leviathan and Bourgeois clans. He commented out loud that it seems that those clans were both getting along well but questioned on how they were able to create an artificial virus. How dare those lowly poison addicts and misers insult divinity? Shouted Humbert as his divine rage started to manifest itself as a heavy yellow aura all around him. His rage doesn't end as even the area around him started to shake heavily from his anger. His entire body was filled with divine rage as he tells Dolores to declare a holy war. Time to play some crusade music. Dolores could only stare at her father in silence, while thinking that daddy was definitely pissed, but he soon talks about the guy that calls himself Night Hound. Hearing those words catches her attention as Humbert tells her that he was suspicious, his face was filled with a different kind of hatred as he tells Dolores to catch Vicar right away and to make him confess every single thing, but our future waifu shouts back at daddy, telling him that Vicar was innocent which shocks him, he stares at her and couldn't believe what she just said as Dolores showed her own version of her pissed off face, go waifu, she continues to defend our boy by telling her father that he was someone who did his best to treat the infected, and that the reason why there weren't any casualties was because of him, she continued to shout at Humbert that there was no way that Vicar was evil, but a sense of dread was felt as Humbert sees how his daughter was acting all of a sudden, he noted that for his daughter, who had never gone against him, to say that, hearing those words causes alarms to go off in Dolor's head as she looked at him with a shocked expression on her face, Humbert then raises his hand into the air with divine power covering it, telling Dolor's that he was personally going to interrogate Vicar, Dolores could only scream out loud as Humbert shoots up a powerful ball of divine power into the air. The ball of light continued to shoot upwards into the sky before exploding into a very bright light that casted itself all over the city. He then tells Dolores that it was meaningless for her to go against him as guards were seen located right outside of where Vicar was staying at. This was when Humbert reveals to Dolores that he had already sent the paladins to go after Vicar. 
The paladins started to make their way quickly up the stairs, they then positioned themselves right outside Vikir's door like a SWAT team. One of the paladins soon kicks the door wide open as another one of them announces that the night hound was a suspect of causing the Red Death. But all that was left in the room was empty air as the paladins were shocked to see that there was no one here. Only a single window remained opened. The scene then changes back to Daddy and Dolores where another clergy member is seen running towards them. He waves his arm into the air and informs Humbert that something bad had happened. He turns to look at the clergy and asks what was wrong. The clergy member's face was filled with panic as he struggled to catch his breath, but once he did, he informs Humbert that one of the saint's tears that had been locked in the basement, had disappeared from the basement safe as it was revealed that a hole had been made in the case that kept the bottles, even our future waifu was stunned to hear this news, but she soon connects the dots as she figured out that this was the reason why Vicar came here, Vicar now stood alone on top of one of the city's tower, he held one of the saint's tear in his hand as it continued to shine brightly, he looks at it with a smile and thanks them for it. As soon as he turns his back, our boy disappears from the city in an instant. Cause he's Batman. We start off with a past memory of our young waifu Ayan, who is seen trembling as she readies her arrow against something with a fearful expression on her face. It turns out she was facing off against a Cerberus, the very same one that Vikir had killed from before. But this time, she stood against it alone with her back against a cliff while the other tribe members surrounded the beast from behind. Her fellow tribe members tried their best to grab the attention of the Cerberus by shouting at it, but it was of no use as its gaze was fixed onto Ayan the entire time. Just as the beast took a single step forward closer to our young maiden, she too takes a step back which made the ground beneath her collapse. Play the slow falling music people, as Ayan lost her footing, she fell from the cliffside and into the heavily forested area below. The sounds of tree branches being snapped at a fast rate could be heard as she made her way down before ending with a loud thud sound. Her eyes began to slowly open upon hearing various voices surrounding her. She soon sees a bunch of unfamiliar men looking at her. The group of men surrounded Ayan from where she laid with their carriages. Ayan could now be seen awake with bandages on her forehead. But a painful expression was what she wore on her face. She appears to be standing guard against something with a sword in her hand. It turns out that she had been placed into an arena where she had to fight against a someone. The crowd goes wild as a man who appears to be her opponent is smirking while clasping his fists together. The bald-headed man starts the fight by rushing towards our girl in a mad fury. Ayan continues to be fearful about what was happening while her opponent was still smiling. But our girl ain't no little bitch as she manages to cut the man on his shoulder while dodging his attack. But her cut only left a small wound as she turns to see what her attack did to the man who returns the favor by grabbing her ankle while she was still upside down. Just like how our old siblings used to wrestle with us and went too hard, so did this man as he threw our beloved waifu hard against the walls of the arena, smashing the wood into bits and pieces, rendering her unconscious as she spits out blood and tears. The crowd of a-holes started to laugh as they hide their bitch-ass faces behind a mask, Ayan's opponent remained the only one standing, and basked in the cheers of the crowd as she laid on the ground. She regains consciousness, as her eyes remained opened while tears began to flow out of them. As she continued to cry from the pain, she recalled the memories of the people from her tribe and her own mother. As the crowd continued to cheer loudly, our waifu began her redemption arc, as she places her hand heavily onto the ground. Her actions grabbed the attention of the nobles that sat behind her as she sat upright. She slowly stood up as her opponent was talking to another man as well as recalling her memories with them where they had whipped her. She smears her own blood onto her face as a form of marking, giving her the strength and courage to prevail against all odds. Tears began to flow from her eyes once again. But this time it was not because of sadness, but because of the rage and fury that was built up within herself. But she isn't the main character of this story, sadly, as she still ended up behind bars as a slave. Her face seems to have given up all hope against escaping from the clutches of her captors, as the memories of her tribesmen and mother started to fade. Her eyes remained dry, as no tears would come out anymore before slowly closing. A vial containing a red liquid was dropped near her, as Ian awakens from her slumber to see what it was. She sat against the cold steel bars of her cage in fear of the sudden appearance of another man. It turns out to be the moment that our boy Vikir had met her. Their meeting together had colored the once dull life that Ayan held before meeting Vikir as he tells her to go. We soon return to the present where she awakens from another slumber with tears in her eyes, probably due to her memories of the past events. As she laid on her mother's lap, her mother asks her if she was had a nightmare, but Ayan didn't reply and remained silent. 
This prompts her mother to reveal that Ayan kept looking for Vikir in her sleep. She finally speaks with a flustered look on her face, telling her mother that the pain she was feeling was getting worse, her chest hurts, and her body was burning up, and it made her heart feel as though it was dried up. All these symptoms made her wonder if she had contracted the Red Death. She continues to tell her mother that she couldn't have it, and that what she was feeling right now was so painful that she regretted being born. Her mother started to comfort Ian but telling her a story about how her father and her had buried a small seed in the ground. Her father had planted the seed while she was watered that seed every day. Not long after, the seed sprouted, and after several months, it became a healthy and beautiful flower. Hearing that story brought more tears to Ian's eyes, but here's a plot twist everyone. Her mother then tells her that after they cut the flowers they extracted the sap and smoked it, they had gotten high, and had some fun which was how Ian came to be. As her father had committed a bad deed, he ended up being executed by her grandfather. Such a sweet story to tell your kids everyone. Ian could only tell her that her body was getting worse after hearing the end of the story, but her mother gave her a piece of advice. You don't know what life will throw at you, you just need to live it. She continues to tell Ian to wait a little. And that when Vikir returns, after finding a way to treat the infection. But Ian replies that she didn't need to comfort her. Ian tells her that he wouldn't come back after recalling their last meeting with one another, but a member of the tribe shouts out that Vikir had returned. The announcement of Vikir's return continued on as they shouted that he had returned with the medicine. But just before Ian's mother could tell her that she was right, our waifu instantly leaps out from her lap and run towards where the shouts were coming from. This sudden reaction from her daughter kind of makes her angry as she watches her run at full speed, making her wonder if she had really contracted the Red Death like she said just now. As Ian made her way at full speed, she recalled the past where she revealed that she was very scared back then. Even when Vikir was facing off against Madame Eight Legs, she stood behind the trees and watched him, which allowed her to see how he faced his fears, which was why when he had been knocked out by Madame Eight Legs, she was the one who rescued him from death, and that he was the reason why she could stand back up again. We finally have our sweet sweet reunion, as Ian brushes past her fellow tribesmen to see Vikir standing right there in front of her. You came? questioned Vikir as he spots her in the crowd. He tells her that he had heard from the warriors earlier that Ian had gotten the Red Death, but our waifu is a woman of action, instead of words, she simply randy ortans our boy onto the ground. Watch out, watch out. Vikir simply laid on the ground with her on top of him, telling Ayan that if he didn't use his mana, then his back would have been broken. But he questions her on whether she had really contracted the Red Death, but all she tells him was that as soon as she had heard that Vikir was back, her body became lighter. Hearing that made him wonder if she was faking it to which Ian reveals that she was. With tears of joy in her eyes this time, she tells our boy welcome back. Taking a pause, Vikir tells her, I'm back. Night soon arrives as a single hut on the trees remained lighted. Everyone from the tribe were gathered around Ahul who laid in the center of the hut struggling to deal with the pains of the Red Death. Vikir kneeled in front of her with a pouch in his hand. He slowly unravels it letting out a bright divine light from the holy water that the saint had made. As he continued to hold on to the vial of holy water, its radiant light started to spread around the hut. Its holiness was enough to cure Ahul, as the red spots on her face started to fade away as the holy light touches her. Hallelujah! shouted Ahuman as he stares at Ahul's cured face with tears streaming down his. The other tribesmen couldn't believe what they were witnessing, as they could see that the light Vikir had brought was so strong that the Red Death disappeared. They rejoiced with joy as Vikir had brought the cure. Vikir then asks Ayan about how many patients they had. She tells him that including Ahul, they had about 30. Hearing that made him wonder about how many were there from the other tribes, Ayan reveals to him that the situation had gotten bad, and that many of the other tribes were on the brink of annihilation. Vikir estimated based on her answer, that there were at least around 10,000 affected. So he tells her to gather all the sick from the other tribes, Hearing his request made Ayan wonder if he had brought along with him large quantities of the cure. He informs her that there was a lot, and that this was their chance to boast about their own tribe to the others. The other tribesmen overheard their conversation and started to cheer once again, calling our boy amazing. Vikir then changes the topic to the swamp monster called Ka, the ugly monster that they had met in the forest not long ago. He then informs the tribe that he had slain the ugly fish on his way back, and wanted them to bring it back as food. Sushi time. The tribe goes wild once again, as they called him incredible and amazing, to the point that they couldn't compare to him. Feeling that there was no time, Vikir turns to tell them to gather all the other tribes around the river catchment area. We soon arrive at the beautiful river catchment area. 
The first tribe we shall call the Punk Rock Tribe had arrived, the Buff Daddy's tribe soon arrived as well, and since we save the best for last, I present to you our Mommy's Tribe. These are not the tribe names that the author wrote, because there were no names at all, so I shall write it for the author. Comment below your favorite tribe. All the tribes stood behind Vikir as he continues to hold on to the vial of holy water that radiated brightly in his hand. He took a moment to look at the vial and waters of the river before he started to pour the contents of the vial into the water itself. As soon as the first drop of holy water hit the river, it spreads all around rapidly. The effects of the holy water don't stop there as it continued to light its way across the entire stretch of the river along the forest areas. Soon enough, the clear blue waters of the river that Vikir stood across had turned into a bright divine yellow light. He then turns around to the tribe leaders to inform them that they just need to drink the water right now. Members of the tribe soon guided the infected to the edge of the river, helping them to scoop the divine water into their sick mouths. As soon as they drank the holy water, their bodies were healed from the red death instantly as they cheered in joy over being recovered. The tribe members continued to celebrate, exclaiming that their bodies felt lighter and that they were alive right now. Vikir informs Mommy that the purification is spreading from the catchment area, so the bacteria would soon disappear. She then decides to appoint Vikir as their tribe's shaman but before he could decline. A buff foot stomps the ground heavily to cut the conversation between them short. This action catches Vikir's attention as he turns to see who it was that did it. It turns out to be the buff daddy's tribe leader who stood tall and hard. He then began to shout out loud, People of the deep forest, answer me. What's the name of the hero who purified the forest? Vikir, 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 shouted the daddies, as they stomped their foot hard into the ground in unison, just like a haka ceremony. The other tribes soon joined in, shouting out what's the name of the person who saved our family, Vikir, who's the person who brought upon a bright tomorrow for the deep forest? Vikir, 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 Vikir was the name that everyone from each tribe shouted throughout the night, as Vikir stood in silence to witness their chanting, his eyes began to glow, as he knew that the wicked deed committed by the deadly poison clan had turned into a favorable situation. The Baskerville clan that mainly pioneered and subjugated the La Rouge et Le Noir mountain, and the Baskerville clan's natural enemy, the natives of the La Rouge et Le Noir mountain, if he was able to win them over and repay them, Vikir knew that it won't be completely impossible to fight against the whole Baskerville clan. He lets out a devil-like smile over the thought that he could use this chance to land a huge blow onto Hugo. Mummy then announces to everyone that a festival would start today, and so they needed to prepare for it. But Vikir lets her know that there was one more thing he needed to do. Both Ian and Mommy would alarm to understand what he meant by that, as he tells them that they needed to find the one who spread the poison in the forest. The scene then changes to someone's hideout, made from a cave whose entrance was covered wood and a skull. Someone's thoughts started to play out, he noted that a lot of time has already passed, and he thinks that everyone should have gotten infected by now, he knew that he wouldn't have struck a deal with those imperial druggies, but it was all because of that imperial brat's fault. A figure started to appear in the shadows, as he continues to think that the moment when everyone is in despair, he would cure the infection with the antidote, so the whole tribe would have no choice but to look at him with respect and reverence, it was revealed to be the asshole shaman piece of poop, he smiles over the idea that infecting Ahul was a good one, and that no one would suspect him of infecting his own granddaughter. Now this is a face that needs to be punched, one like equals to one punch everyone, as he exited his cave, he thought about how his plan was perfect, but something causes him to think otherwise as he peeks out from behind a tree. He could see that his fellow tribesmen were walking around peacefully, with no signs of red death anywhere. He wonders how they were all fine, as he was sure that they would all be gasping for air because of the red death right before they commenced the ancestral rite. He even spots his granddaughter Ahul, who was perfectly fine, which made him wonder what was going on. This sight made him run to somewhere as he called it impossible. He soon arrives at the very same river catchment we were at before. He stares deep into the waters and wondered how the fishes in the river were alive, and that the river was purified as well. He even thought about how the water had gotten even clearer. How? shouted across his mind as he tries to figure out what went on when he was hiding in his bitch hole. The river's rather clear right shaman? asked Vikir, who appears by his side with a murderous aura. Someone's gonna die. The shaman immediately turns around and calls our boy an imperial bastard, but wondered when he had arrived here. But he soon spots all the other tribesmen that were gathered behind Vikir. Their faces were not filled with joy but with a look that says someone has messed with the main character. 
Vikir looks at the shaman and recalled that the person who had spread the red death in the forest was just as he expected, it was the shaman. Before he had regressed, there was a time where stories about an old man living in the forest and his misdeeds were trending. It was a horrible story of a man who had spread an infection within his tribe due to his desire to become a hero. In turn, he couldn't cure it and killed most of his tribe's people. Based on what he recalled, Vikir concluded that it was this a-hole that stood in front of him. But the shaman still thought that there was no way Vikir knew that it was him. So he asked everyone if they had come out here to greet this old man. But our mommy appears and questions him about whether he had finished the ceremony well. The shaman stutters at first but tells her that he did, and assures that the infection would soon disappear, but she tells him about how she had heard that in the empire, a war was declared between clans due to the Red Death, this was because the infection was found to be artificially created and spread. But she noted that it was strange, between the imperial clan and the deep forest, she couldn't really see the connection and the reason why the infection was spread. The shaman grew nervous as he tells her that that was something he wouldn't know, and informs her that he came here right after performing the rite for the sake of the tribe's complete recovery. Then why did you come here instead of the village, asked Mommy, which causes the shaman to freeze with fear, gotcha boy. She turns to Vikir and noted that it was just as he said. She then slowly walks over to the shaman while telling Vikir that they should see if what he said next was right. Hearing their conversation made the shaman panic as he asked them about what they were talking about. A flashback is seen from when Vikir informs them that the shaman wanted to use this incident to become the tribe's hero. So, he would definitely have it. The cure to the Red Death. This time, the murderous aura came from Mommy, as she stares at the shaman with murder in her eyes, she calls out to him, and tells him that she wanted to see what was in his pouch, rest in peace. As Aquila the matriarch of the tribe, the name I finally remembered after all this time, asked Auman about the pouch he had. We return to a past memory where Vikir was asking Ayan about Auman's birth as he thought that it would be good for him to know more about Auman. Ayan reveals to him that Auman wasn't a native Balak, even his birth was unknown to them, but long ago, he was the existing shaman's slave and came to the Balaks. She recalls that he had killed the shaman who was plotting a coup d'etat, so Auman killed and stole his sorcerer powers. Due to his contributions, in stopping the coup, he was promoted from a slave to a shaman. After that, in order to adapt to the Balaks, Ayan heard that he did anything. Including the cleaning up of shit and pee, Auman was responsible for all the dirty work within the village. He was also used as bait for dangerous prey during hunts. This man was the definition of a true hustler. However, he was only acknowledged as a member of the tribe, only when he became old and his hair turned gray. As we return to the present, Vikir thought about what she told him, wondering that since Auman was older now, did he want all the privileges that he wasn't entitled to when he was younger? He could now see that this old man had overstepped the authority of the matriarch and tried to take over the entire forest. As Aquila asks him what he was doing, she tells him to show her his pouch right now. With an aura that kind of turns me on but at the same time makes me feel as if I'm about to shit my pants. Sweat started to drip down the old man's face as he swallowed hard. He starts to stutter in his speech, telling Aquila of course, but as he takes the pouch, he tells her that this was the flower that he saved to eat after the ceremony. But the old man becomes clumsy as the pouch seems to slip from his old wrinkly hands. There was an awkward silence between the three of them as they all watched as the pouch dropped into the water. The pouch was able to open as it dropped into the waters, revealing the so-called flower that Auman said he had brought to eat after the ceremony. Who the heck eats flour? And so, Auman started to blame his hand tremors for causing him to accidentally drop the pouch into the river. But Aquila wore an expression of disappointment, a look that our parents often give us as she tells Vikir that he was right again. She looks at him, reminded over the fact that he had told her that Auman would throw the pouch into the river. But our boy was concerned with the fact that they could no longer reveal the contents of Auman's pouch with the same method. Taking this chance, Auman tries to refute Vikir's claim of him having the antidote and making the accusation that he was the one that had spread the poison throughout the forest. Even going so far as to point a finger at Vikir, telling Aquila to punish the wicked bastard, as Vikir had framed Auman who considered himself a righteous self and whose honor as a shaman has been spoiled. She agrees with the old man, telling everyone that you couldn't frame someone without evidence. And since Auman mentioned he was innocent, Aquila was willing to help him protect his honor and pride. Auman starts to smile, thinking that as the matriarch, she couldn't punish him without any evidence. Aquila then orders for an Iliad. What she orders sends chills down the old man's spine as he heard what she said. 
An Iliad is conducted when conflicts of opinions cannot be resolved, the Balaks side with the victor of the Iliad as the loser is deemed incompetent. A Hun appears, reminding his grandfather that he had always said that tradition is important. So he reminds him that Iliad is a tradition of the Balaks, so he wanted the old man to show them how he protects their tradition. His own grandson's words cut the old man deep, so he agrees with what they want, telling Vikir that the Iliad will happen four days from now, during the night of the full moon, making it official. Flexing his beautiful hard-toned abs, Vikir walks to the old man, telling him four days my ass. He explains that he knew that the one who receives the Iliad request was the one to decide the day, according to tradition. But honestly, Vikir knew that evidence and verification were all meaningless to Auman, since cornering him into a situation where he had no choice but to request an Iliad was all a part of Vikir's plan. Vikir was on the hunt again, as he tells Auman that they should do it right now. As the sun began to set in the tribe, everyone gathers together. Even Aquila wore her equipment, as she announces that the Iliad will begin now. She continues to tell the tribe that the Iliad will proceed within the circle made by warriors. She orders them to mercilessly execute cowards who try to leave the circle. Everyone agrees with the command as they chanted in unison together. She informs them that behind her was the warrior's mountain where their ancestor's grave resides. As their ancestors are watching, she won't forgive indecency. As Vikir and Auman hid behind their respective trees, Aquila tells them that their forefathers judge what is right and wrong, so they will decide the victor. And as a Balak warrior, they needed to prove that they're right. As the warriors and Ayan hid in the trees, they started to chant Vikir's name to show their support. Seeing their reaction annoyed Auman as he bit his finger, thinking that no one was on his side. But he knew that they'll stop chanting Vikir's name once he won, since weapons weren't the only thing you can use in an Iliad, just as he spills his own blood onto the ground. A skull started to emerge from where the blood was spilled, and soon enough, Auman had three weird-looking skeletons to support him. He orders the skeletons to watch his blind spots and to notify him once they see Vikir. Seeing that his preparations were complete, Auman readies his bow and arrow. Smiling over the fact that he knew that this was impossible for Vikir who has only been here for two years, against someone like him who had spent seven years in the forest, so there was no way for him to be familiar with the terrain. Just as he wanted Vikir to show himself in order for him to shoot an arrow right through his soul, our boy appears upside down right beside Auman, without him even noticing. I'm telling you, Vikir is Batman. As Vikir hung upside down like a bat, he thought about the silent heal skill that he had gotten from killing the master of the swamp, the Magikarp gone wrong. He knew that it was a Mishusu skill that allows you to silently target your prey's opening, what he liked about it was that it gets rid of the surrounding sounds which is useful for assassins like him. Seeing dumb, dumber and dumbest, Vikir knew that Auman wasn't a shaman just by name. Seeing how he could let the dead arise, Vikir concluded that he must have been from Lokoko, a tribe of shamans. But all that didn't matter to the main character of this story. As Vikir casually drops in between the three idiots without anyone noticing at all. And just like how fast you last in bed, Vikir was done with them within seconds. Simply by swinging his sword around, he slices and dices them into pieces. Auman still doesn't sense Vikir's presence, as he thought that Vikir was probably too scared and haven't even moved at all. Ka Chow, went Vikir as he simply stabs the old man in the back, silent but deadly. Sensing nothing at all but the sharp pain in his chest, Auman coughs blood. As tears started to flood his eyes, he panics, wondering when Vikir had arrived as he couldn't even hear him step on the fallen leaves. Like a piece of trash, Vikir simply tosses the old man back onto the ground. Wiping away the blood from his sword at the same time. Seeing that the job was done, Vikir absorbs his sword back, the moment he does, Ayin comes running and calling out to him. The tribe members couldn't believe that the winner was decided in an instant. Some believed that it was because the ancestors decided that what Auman was saying wasn't worth listening to. But the old man isn't done yet, while Vikir was talking to Ayin, his body was barely still moving. He could feel that it hurts, as though his wound was burning, this made him realize that he didn't want to die. In order to survive within the Balaks, Auman had endured that shameful past, he thought it was unfair if this was his end. As he stares at Vikir with his bloodied vision, Auman wonders why he couldn't have the things that Vikir has. So he claws the ground, cursing at Vikir that he wouldn't forgive him, the bastard who took the things that should have been for him, along with those Balak bastards who looked down on him too, and the Lokoko tribe that abandoned him. All of them must pay. Vikir turns to a Hun, 
asking him about his thoughts on ending this with his own hands, as Vikir knew that if they left Aumann like that, he would continuously be in pain. But a Hun declines, showing us that he has ice in his veins. He recounted the fact that he almost lost Ahul because of the Red Death. Even if Aumann was his grandfather, he wouldn't forgive him. He considered it right for a coward to be in pain, as Aumann wasn't worth pitying. Play the final boss music as Aumann appears to still be alive as blood started to flow from his eyes that were shining brightly. While everyone was talking, he had drawn a magic circle made of his own blood. With his finger trembling, he finishes the final stroke of the blood circle. It appears to work as a purple light starts to appear on a tomb. The lid of the tomb slowly opens up, as a bright light appears from within the ancestors' graves. A dark and evil atmosphere could be seen as the skies turned purple while the forest was covered with a black deathly aura. Aquila and Ayan appeared shocked as they could feel the ominous energy coming from their ancestors' grave. Soon enough, even a Hun notices something as a cold drip of sweat makes its way down his face. Auman had started to move his body just as Vikir notices a Hun's expression and reaction to something. Even Vikir was shocked by what was happening as he knew that he had stabbed Auman in the lungs, talking about taking his breath away. The tribesmen could see that this was Auman's doing, angered that he had messed with their ancestors' graves. Aren't you afraid of the ancestors' wrath? shouted the tribesmen at Auman whose figure started to change. But as he mutters the word ancestors, he reveals his demonic face. Asking the tribe if he was the one who should be afraid of the ancestors. Vikir couldn't believe it, he immediately leaps forward, telling everyone that they needed to kill Auman right now. But an arrow filled with that deathly aura was sent flying, landing and exploding between Auman and Vikir, who manages to dodge the attack. Ayan was stunned to see that there was an arrow with a massive crater around it whereas Vikir was wondering if he was too late. A single light was seen on the mountain as Auman tells them that the ancestors were the one to decide what was right. As a lone figure stood on the mountain with a bow readied, Auman tells the tribe that it was time for the great ancestors' judgment. It's milf time. Ayan couldn't believe that one of their ancestors was back from the dead while Vikir couldn't believe that Auman had used resurrection sorcery on a Balak ancestor, as he knew that there was no way that was possible for a shaman like Auman. But seeing his weird look, Vikir questions whether Auman had turned himself into an undead as well. Auman then starts to summon even more of the undead, asking the tribe if they thought he was just a shaman living among the Balaks without any countermeasures. But he warns them that it was too early to be surprised as even more ancestors started to appear, it turns out that there wasn't only one grave here on the warrior's mountain. Using the skeletons as a ride, Auman quickly escaped using the undead car, telling the tribe to do their best fighting against their ancestors. A Hun spots the old man leaving, and immediately draws his bow and arrow while calling out to him. Asking Auman about how low he was going to go, but just as he did, something dark sped fast and cut his arrow in half. A Hun could spot where the attack came from, it was the first ancestor that had awakened, her eyes were soulless as she growled at the tribe. So we answer back with our attack as something blue and fast hits the ancestor right into her undead face. The attack came from Aquila, who ordered her tribe to get ready for battle. She informs them that the people in front of them were just Auman's puppets, and that they could send their formalities to their ancestors after they send them off. So they just needed to prioritize their survival, but her tribe seems nervous as they hesitated to go against their ancestors in combat. The battle between the living and the dead rages on as the tribe battled it out throughout the forest. But even though they had been dead for so long, the ancestors didn't hold back as they went in for the kill against the tribe, cutting them down, hunting them down like prey. They even let out a fierce zombified roar, which the tribe answers back with a headshot. One by one the dead ancestors' heads were blown off by a single hit. A lone archer from the tribe was doing the work as she tried her best to carry the tribe. As Vikir himself stabs an undead, he spots the attacks, one arrow per death knight. He could see that she was killing death knights that are on par with a high-ranked graduator. It turns out to be our mommy, the knight fox Aquila, the rumor about her protecting the forest from the Empire wasn't just a rumor. Seeing that the matriarch Aquila was here, Vikir knew that there wouldn't be a problem, so he told Ayan to follow him. Informing her that they would be following Auman, who could be seen speeding through the forest on his undead car, shouting out loud that the Balak bastards would regret kicking him out. But as he rides, he tells one of his undead that he needed it to take care of something. As the undead went to follow its orders, Auman took a second to pause and think about something. He knew that even though he had resurrected the ancestors, as long as Aquila was here, 
he couldn't act carelessly. Since she was known as a genius who has been the strongest village head in history. But he smirks at the thought of genius, as he knew that even if she was one, she wouldn't be able to handle what's about to happen. The skies continue to darken as the battle against the undead ancestors rages on, Vikir and Ayan are hiding themselves behind some trees, waiting for an opportunity, as they spotted Auman who was casting another evil spell. Vikir wonders why he had escaped to this place over here, where it was just an area with pillars, and even started to chant in a place like this. But Ayan was certain that they couldn't allow Auman to act suspiciously any further. With murder in her eyes, she tells Vikir that she was going to kill Auman right here right now. So she lets out a powerful arrow that speeds right towards Auman but as it inches even closer to the undead maniac, he smiles and whispers that he was done. A thick muscular arm appears from underneath the ground, grabbing Ayan's powerful arrow with just two of its fingers. This scene shocks the couple as they watch with a stupefied look on their faces. Auman on the other hand was celebrating as he realized that he was successful in summoning it. A new undead ancestor is being introduced as Auman recalled the legend that says that he sleeps deep within the forest alone. He continued to exclaim out loud that he was the only one that had noticed this ancestor. The undead's head that was filled with a few pieces of hair started to regrow all of it in a matter of seconds. As the ancestor kneeled onto the ground, its undead body started to regrow its flesh as it held onto a bow in its hand. It turns out that this was the divine archer Adonai, the muscle daddy of the Balak tribe. Even Vikir and Ayan remained stunned upon hearing that Auman had managed to summon the one and only Adonai, the so-called legendary archer of the Balaks, and whose entire body had finally healed. But as they stared at the Gigachad, Adonai drew his bow and arrow, aiming right at them. He sends out a terrifying demonic arrow, straight at our couple, which Vikir was able to deflect with his own demonic sword. But his face was filled with a worried expression as he only managed to deflect it just inches away from his face. He knew that it was an arrow that was created with aura and that he even managed to deflect it, but just the damage it caused was overwhelming. It turns out that he didn't deflect it all as Ayan staggered onto the ground in pain, groaning hard as a wound appears on her thigh, covered in the demonic aura. She tells Vikir that the wound made her legs feel as though they were burning. Vikir sees this and wonders if it was poison, since she came in contact with Adonai's arrow. This made him recall the legend about Adonai dueling with that monster was true, as the bow he was using was made from the remains of Madame Eight Legs's leg. Adonai doesn't know the word relax as he bombards Vikir and Ayan with an endless wave of poison arrow attacks onto them, all of which Vikir deflects, sending them flying towards various parts of the forest. Their battle of attacking and deflecting resulted in the trees and ground around them being blown away, leaving the land barren. Ayan calls out to Vikir who wore a painful expression on his face, she tells him to stop protecting her so that he could run away and leave her but our boy wasn't listening as he held his trembling arm, even Beelzebub was feeling the pain. Auman started to laugh, telling Vikir and Ayan that he wasn't going to let them live. So he orders Adonai to kill them both. He obeys the order without hesitation, sending out another powerful attack filled with aura and poison. Vikir and Ayan could only stare at the powerful attack as it made its way towards them. Just as Vikir was bracing himself for the attack, our Holy Savior appears and snatches the arrow made of aura with her bare hands. This action shocks everyone in the vicinity who witnessed it. As the arrow continued to rage within her hand, she easily suppressed it by squeezing on it hard. Before smashing it into powder, with a look on her face that screams, someone's about to get a spanking. As she stares at Auman, she tells him that they were going to have a talk. Vikir and Ayan were surprised to see that Aquila had arrived after saving their asses, she explains to them that she came here because she had sensed a powerful aura. As her hand was covered in blood, she was glad that she had come. Even the old man was surprised to see her here as he hides behind Adonai. Ayan quickly tells her mother about the poison from Adonai's arrow, telling her that she needed to treat herself right away but Aquila simply stares at her hand, covered in a black substance while thinking about the poison. Like an absolute boss, she simply flexes her arm causing many explosions to travel through it as blood spilled everywhere. Vikir was watching her with a stunned face, wondering if she had exploded the aura inside of her to expel the poison and deceased blood. He couldn't believe that there was someone who would do such a thing. After cleansing the poison from her blood, Aquila's eyes looked forward, staring at Auman before calling his name, which sent shivers down his spine. He started to blame her for all of this happening telling Aquila that it was all her fault for pushing him into a corner, but she simply tells him that she didn't care about his betrayal, and just wanted him to answer one thing. 
She looks at Adonai, asking Auman if this purple zombie-like man is actually the divine archer, Sir Adonai. Auman was happy to tell her that he is the legendary Adonai, someone whom she couldn't dare to fight against. But his words had no effect as Aquila smiles after hearing his answer. She then tells Vikir and Ayan that they had done a good job and to stay behind. She calls out to the divine archer, Sir Adonai, telling him with a smile on her face that it was an honor to meet him, even though it had to be this way. Aquila wanted to see who was the best warrior between them. The winds continued to blow heavily as the two strongest archers in history faced off against one another. They simply stared at one another, before Aquila made the first move, she immediately leapt to his side, preparing to fire five arrows directly at him all at once. The moment she fired, her arrows turned into a blue light covered by her aura, but Adonai ain't weak, he simply sidesteps her arrows, dodging them by inches before pulling back his own bow and unleashing his powerful poisonous arrow right back at her. She sees this coming and does a handstand to dodge his attack. The moment she landed on her feet, Aquila drew her next arrow and so did Adonai. A mixture of blue and purple arrow attacks rained throughout the forest, followed by explosions as they continued to battle it out against one another. A pair of feet came to a stop, it turns out to be Vikir who was carrying Ayan. He turns around, knowing that this is a fight between those who possess master grade aura which was a rare sight during the time of the fall while Ayan was concerned about her mother. Using Gara's move, Auman covers one of his eyes with his fingers, summoning a purple eye on top of a tree branch. He was using it to watch the battle and could see that going against Sir Adonai was no easy feat, even for Aquila. But his face was filled with joy, as he believes that she could never defeat Sir Adonai as he was dead and could infinitely use Hell's dimensional aura. But as he asks Aquila about whether she knew about the strength of a boundless arrow, she was thinking that she would be at a disadvantage in a range fight as a wound appears on her shoulder. She continues to monitor the situation, seeing that he had speed, power and mobility. Adonai was a perfect archer with no flaws. But as she drew another arrow, she knew that he lacked something very important. As both of their arrows were sent flying at the same time, they met each other head on. Causing a massive explosion in the middle of the forest, resulting in smoke covering the entire land. Aquila appears from within the smoke, trying to land a kick onto Adonai's face but he simply tilts his head to dodge. Before summoning a sword made out of his poisonous aura, he takes a single swing at her, cutting all the trees that were around them but still missed. Aquila wasted no time at all as she grabbed onto her own sword, throwing it at Adonai and managing to knock his sword out of his hand. Her attack doesn't end there as she kicks him hard at his knee, causing him to fall back slightly before a bright blue light is reflected in his eyes. Aquila had drawn her bow, aiming right at his face this time at point-blank range, she unleashes a devastating aura-filled arrow attack. That was powerful enough to send shockwaves into the skies. She backs away instantly after ending her attack, she looks at Adonai with a serious face as pieces of him start to break away. As he slowly starts to fade just like everyone in Avengers Infinity War after Thanos snaps his fingers, Aquila asks him if the reason he didn't want to fight was because he was dead or if it was because of his desire to not hurt his descendant. But all she knew for sure was that she needed to free him from his current state. And so, she lets out another powerful attack, intending to give Adonai some peace. Which he wanted as he simply stood still as the attack came even closer to him. But as he closes his eyes to accept his fate, a purple hand appears to stop the arrow from landing, surprising Aquila who clearly sees it. The parts of Adonai that had been blown away had started to form a demonic purple aura, which seems to be causing some pain to Adonai. Another demonic figure made of the poisonous aura started to rip itself from the hole that Adonai had. It started to reach over his hand, before fully consuming Adonai. Auman couldn't believe that he would reject the necromancy spell. With his hands in ninjastu summoning pose, Auman now sees that legends were different but he didn't tolerate things that are done half-heartedly, so he tells Sir Adonai to fight with all he has now. Until everything that is threatening him is dead. Seeing Adonai's change angered Aquila as she witnessed everything. Sir Adonai lets out a demonic roar, as he is now an undead with something crazy inside of him. He continues to scream as the demonic energy takes a hold of him, sending shrieks of evil energy throughout the air. Aquila could only stare in silence as the transformation takes hold of Adonai. Looking at his new transformation, she knew that the thing standing in front of her was no longer Sir Adonai anymore. But as he stood in the same spot, a dark shadow started to cast itself over him. A gigantic turtle-like monster was looking down, alongside two other gigantic beasts. 
Aumann could see the A-rank monsters that live in the forest with his eye spell, wondering if they were here because of the commotion that happened. Now we are about to see a magic trick, now you the three A-rank monsters, now you don't. Because in an instant, this new version of Adonai was able to snipe all three of the A-rank monsters in one shot, three headshot, triple kill. His face was showing off a wicked smile as blood and pieces of the three A-rank monsters dropped all around him. Aquila was surprised to see this as she couldn't even see the arrow at all. Bauman was laughing after seeing that, saying that this was the full power of Adonai, as he was able to kill all those monsters in one go. And so, he orders Adonai to kill the woman in front of him too. He obeys Aumann's command and starts to send arrows flying towards her, making her run for her life. As she ran to avoid the arrow, she could sense the strong murderous intent from those arrows. Every time she was hit by an attack, the madam's poison spreads and makes her body feel sluggish. As she drew her bow for a counterattack, she knew she had to finish this fight quickly. Drawing two arrows at once, she sends an attack that splits and targets the sides of Adonai. As he dodges one of them, the other arrow is sent flying directly towards him. As the arrow was just barely inches away from him, he raised a single finger, creating a small demonic shield in front of the arrow. It started to spin, grinding the arrow into pieces until there was nothing left. As Aquila stares at him, she starts to smile as her attack doesn't end there as more arrows appear in the sky. Her attacks finally work as one of the arrows pierces through his neck. Aquila quotes a phrase, the first arrow misses but the second one hits the target, however, the moment your opponent blocks the second arrow, the first missed arrow returns and penetrates the back of their head. She tells him that this was a skill where the arrow is at maximum rotation and flies in mid-air, upon reaching its peak, it returns and hits the opponent. This was Aquila's personal arrow skill that she created after hearing about Adonai's fight against an imperial knight. The arrow continues to linger in his throat before he pulls it swiftly. Much to the surprise of Aquila who expected him to die after being shot in the throat. Auman continues to laugh at her, telling her that no matter how strong she is, she had never fought against a corpse before. He continues to tell her that Sir Adonai was already dead, so he wouldn't be defeated by a single arrow to the throat. As they continued to battle it out, the effects of their battle could be seen by Ayan as she watches over her mother. Her face was filled with concern as she thought her, she could also feel that the forest was shaking, making it ominous. She hopes that her mother could wait until Vikir resolves this as she recalls him telling to hide. And that he will stop Auman's necromancy skill and kill him. As Vikir runs through the forest, he knows that Auman feared Aquila very much. So it was highly likely that he was hiding behind Adonai in order to go against Aquila. Soon enough, his red eye catches something. Vikir had finally found Auman, hiding behind a tree like the sneaky bastard he is. So our boy immediately makes his way over to the coward's side as he plans on killing him in one hit. As he closes in onto the coward, a wild ancestor appears by his side, aiming to kick Vikir. Her attack lands but not before Vikir was able to leap away safely. Auman spots him and curses at him, revealing to Vikir that he had already predicted that someone would come after him so he had already summoned his death knights. He informs Vikir that these death knights were skilled enough that they could have been buried at the warrior's grave. As Vikir stood in the same spot, all three of the death knights lunged towards him from all sides. We now turn back to Aquila who had been shot by an arrow that completely obliterated her side, causing her face to wince in pain as she finally falls and kneels in front of Adonai. Seeing her this way, Auman started to laugh like a maniac, happy to see that she had finally kneeled. He continues to rejoice over the fact that soon, the guardian of the forest, Aquila, will die. And that he will rule the forest. As this was his reward for the unfair treatment that he had received in his life. He declares that his first step is to kill all the clan members who look down on him but then the Hound of Baskerville appears, telling him in a deadly voice that what he plans on doing would be troublesome. Vikir has finally unleashed the Baskerville Sixth Technique as he slices the three Death Knights while telling Auman that the people of this forest will become his support system. Auman's mouth was left wide open as he saw that Vikir had killed three of the Death Knights, who surpassed the level of a high-ranked graduator. Making him realize that Vikir was stronger than a high-ranked graduator. As Vikir looks at the dead man, he questions Auman if he had dreamt of everything he desired at that moment. Feeling that death was close, Auman started to call out to Sir Adonai to rescue him. Adonai hears his call for help and immediately turns around, preparing to unleash a powerful attack towards Vikir's location. But Aquila isn't an NPC, so she immediately kicks him as he prepares the attack. 
causing the arrow that Adonai had just sent flying to misfire as the arrow narrowly misses Vikir. Play the funeral music as someone is about to die as our boy's face starts to change into the demonic hound, making us know why he is called the Hound of Baskerville. Auman could see death coming to him in the shape of Vikir, so he calls out to Adonai to fire again, but the moment those words left his mouth, so did his arms as they were cut off in an instant. It happened so fast that Auman took a moment before realizing what happened. Even I didn't realize that Vikir had cut off the panel as well. But his attacks don't stop as he finally cuts off Auman's head, along with the panel as well. As his head was sent flying, Auman could only show a confused face with the word huh? Written all over it. Time to celebrate as the asshole is finally dead. The members of the Balak tribe continued their battle against their own undead ancestors throughout the forest. One of the female members was knocked back, losing her own bow in the process. As she fell to the ground, a shadow was casted over her, sending fear into her soul as she looked up all afraid. An undead ancestor with a mighty blade was about to send her to the other side, with no remorse. But then the undead ancestor's arms started to disappear into a black smoke, much to the surprise of the female barbarian. Who watches on as the undead ancestor disappears right in front of her eyes? It was happening to all the undead ancestors around the remaining Balak warriors, it was as though Thanos had appeared in the Manwa and snapped his fingers with the Infinity Gauntlet on. Aquila was now breathing heavily as she stood in front of the demonic version of Adonai. His demonic aura started to disappear as well, showing the calmer side of him after Vikir had slain Auman. His hand was still trembling as he held onto his bow, made up of Madame Eight Legs' own leg. The moment Aquila places her hand on top of his, more of the demonic aura starts to scatter, revealing his original undead skin. Even though she was holding onto her wound from his attack earlier on, Aquila still held onto his hand, telling the great ancestor Sir Adonai to please rest in peace, as he slowly scattered into the wind. Auman let out a fierce roar, even when his head had been sliced off, he was still talking. He curses at the fact that he was so close and that the forest was almost his. He looks at Vikir, wondering if he had failed because of the child from the Empire. He was right. Vikir looks back at Auman, with his eyes glowing bright red, Auman was better than he thought. Not only did he become an undead himself, but he was also able to control magic on another level. And to control dozens of death knights, including Adonai. Vikir could only imagine what would happen if Auman had strived to go down the path of a shaman. The old man was still laughing like a maniac, telling Vikir that this wasn't the end to everything. As he swears to our boy that he was going to regret driving him out of the tribe. He continues to spit shit about Vikir and the Balak tribe, promising to curse everyone even if he dies, but all Auman got for a reply was a headshot, right in the center of his skull. It turns out that the final attack came from his own grandson as Vikir turns around to see that a Hun was the one to shoot the shot. The first thing he did was to apologize to Vikir, as he regretted not listening to him when he said to kill Auman. But as Vikir walked by him, he noticed something. A Hun's entire body was trembling, so to comfort him, Vikir places his hand onto his shoulder, telling a Hun that what happened wasn't his fault and that he did a good job with Auman, whose body started to scatter into the wind, just like the rest of the undead ancestors. And so, the aftermath of the deathmatch between the living Baloks and the undead Balak ancestors came to an end leaving the living descendants with mixed feelings. The members of the tribe were happy to be alive while Aquila held a somber expression on her face as she held onto the bow of the great Sir Adonai. Ian's tears were now filled with joy while Vikir finally got to rest as he told everyone that it was time for them to go back to the village. As the Balak tribe made their way to the village through the forest, they were led by Ayan who wore a nervous expression on her face as she spotted something in the distance. Their village was completely destroyed, as though pain from Naruto had used the almighty push in their village, leaving only destruction behind. Ayan was alarmed to see this sight, wadnering what happened to their home. Aquila was concerned about the people who stayed behind in the village during the Iliad. Ahul appears in front of them, holding her injured arm with bruises around her body, she tells them that it was Madame Eight Legs who did this to their village. Ayan was shocked to learn that the Madame had come to their village, while a Hun rushed to Ahul's side, worried about her and asking if she had any injuries. Vikir was looking around and could spot the damages and dead bodies that the madam had left behind. He couldn't believe that she came to the village when they were fighting Aheuma. Which made him wonder why a monster who didn't do anything until now would come here and do this all of a sudden. As she cried in a Hun's arms, Ahul points to something in the distance. 
She tells everyone that before the madam came to the village, a smoke came from Aoman's ceremonial tent. After that, the madam appeared and went on full rampage mode. Vikir was on the scene and analyzing what looks like leaves of a plant on the ground of the ceremonial tent site. The other members of the tribe could spot the corpse of the orangutan that Aoman had summoned before. Vikir picks out a piece of the plant, thinking that Aoman had burned a plant that lures bugs. He couldn't believe that Aoman would prepare for something like this. Aoman, shouted Aquila as she slams her fist against the stone wall, smashing it into pieces while others watch her. They could also see the injury that Adonai had given her, which was slowly spreading across her sides. But she ignores the pain, telling everyone that they can rebuild their village and gather their food again. She even orders the warriors who are injured to go clean up those who had passed on to the afterlife and to save the remaining survivors. Ayin on the other hand was dealing with her own problem. Get some tissues now people, because her precious Bakira, her pet wolf, had been injured and was trembling in pain while on the ground. Her leg had turned all black from poison. Ayin immediately comforts her, with tears flowing down her face, she tells Bakira that she was sorry for leaving her alone. We now talk about Madame Eight Legs, the forest's evil goddess. The horror of all tribes in the forest. Its existence is catastrophic and undeniable. The source of darkness. Vikir could only hide behind a tree while Ayin comforts Bikira. After all, the Balak had deemed the Madam's existence as a natural disaster and were not even able to take revenge. But Vikir was on a different level from them. Night soon arrives in the forest as an opening to a cave in the wall was lighted by a campfire inside. Vikir had entered the resting place of Aquila, telling her that he came to ask something, she could only reply with, What's the matter Vikir? Please tell me about Madame Eight Legs, was our boy's request to her. A nervous sweat drop drips down her face as she wonders why Vikir wanted to know about the madam. He reveals to her a document, a record of the madam that he found at the Lokoko tribe's village from before. It contains various information about the madam's poison, witness statements about the madam's fights with other monsters and even the madam's hideout. But after reading it personally, Vikir had a question in his mind. He couldn't find the reason as to why the tribes of the forest would fear her, making him question Aquila about why they hadn't tried to subjugate her altogether. His question seems hard for Aquila as she didn't reply straight away but chose to be silent. She then reveals to him that just like the Lokoko, the Baliks themselves had a record about the madam, which has been passed down since long ago. It was the record of when Sir Adonai fought against the madam. The battle of the archer god Adonai and the madam. In that battle, Sir Adonai pierced one of the madam's legs with an arrow, and it was said that he was successful in destroying that leg. But that was only the start of the despair. The destroyed legs soon grew back, becoming two more. The more they destroyed it, the more the madam's legs increased. Just like a hydra monster. The legs, which were the only things that they could damage, became stronger the more they were destroyed, and the madam's tough body couldn't be pierced with Sir Adonai's arrows. It was recorded that everyone who participated in the battle was poisoned by the madam. Aquila herself could understand how strong the madam is, just by her injury from the poison remaining on Sir Adonai's arrow. She continues to tell Vikir that the madam is the evil goddess that was created by the efforts of countless warriors in this forest. She warns Vikir that even though he might be planning to attack the madam, don't. As Aquila didn't want to lose any more of her family. Vikir knew for himself that the chances of him winning against Aquila and Adonai right now was very low. But if it's a strong monster, then things are different. Although the Madam is a rare monster right now, in the world of the Fall, back in Vikir's previous life, where demonic monsters invaded the human world, Vikir saw many demonic monsters on the same level as the Madam. He has the experience of fighting against those demonic monsters. No matter how strong the Madam is, she was still only a monster and monsters have habits and weaknesses. Vikir was determined to find out what her weaknesses are as he left Aquila's cave. As he ventures into the darkness of the forest, he wears his hood back on. With his eyes glowing bright red, he knew that he could kill the madam. We now turn to a peaceful viewing of a mountain top until something pointy pokes out of the top, dear lord, is that what I think it is, yes, it's the madam. She appears out from the mountain, spewing her green venom everywhere as it screams loudly. She then started to make her way somewhere else, Vikir could be spotted directly below her, hiding amongst the trees, in a new outfit. Vikir stares at the madam as she leaves her home, thinking that she was pretty noisy when she wakes up. After conducting a stake out at the madam's lair for several days, Vikir discovered that the madam looks for food at a designated time. 
Judging from her movements, Vikir concluded that it would take two hours for her to return. So he instantly leaps across the mountaintops to reach her lair while she was gone. With a superhero landing, Vikir had finally reached the entrance to Madame Eight Legs' lair, which was covered with spiderwebs. From the outside, it looks like a stone mountain but it's actually empty inside. Summoning his good old Beelzebub blade, Vikir started to cut a piece of the mountain that had spiderwebs on it. On close inspection of it, the cross section of the spider web is rough, so it will be difficult to cut through it with a graduator's mana. Knowing this, Vikir thought that the spider web would be good for him to use when he goes down. As he leaps down into the lair, he jumps across the bigger spider webs. He sees that the entrance was just barely enough for the madam to squeeze through, but it gradually gets wider the deeper it gets. Considering the madam's size, this is perfect for a lair. Upon landing inside, Vikir could spot various things glued to the walls of the lair. It seems to be the madam's prey, both humans and monsters have been caught, seeing as several bodies haven't been touched and have decomposed, Vikir wondered if she wanted to make an example out of them or if she brought them here for fun. Vikir concluded that the madam knew that she was the top bitch in the food chain in the forest. But looking at the dead bodies, Vikir knew that there wasn't any time for him to be interested in these things since before the madam returned, he needed to look into as many things as he could. As he explored the lair, he came across something else that was glued onto the wall. Looking at it closely, Vikir grabs it in a hurry. The thing he was holding in his hand was the madam's eggs, which explains the reason why there were so many spider demons when the world fell to ruin. He thought that it would be worthwhile to take it and analyze the egg later on, but as he thought about it, Vikir's body shuddered as the madam made an appearance from above. Madam Eight Legs' multiple eggs started to scan her lair, like the predator, hoping to find some prey but then it senses nothing at all, and started to go back outside to hunt for food instead. Vikir had hidden himself below one of the bigger spider webs the moment he had sensed her. He started to breathe heavily, thinking that the madam came back purely on instinct, he was lucky that he had the Mashusu's skill that eliminates sound, or else the Manwa would have ended here. After this, Vikir decided to finish things quickly and return home. Back in the Balak's tribe, the tribe members were busy rebuilding their village, gathering wood and building their homes. They soon started to talk about Vikir and how he hasn't left his house in several days, while others saw him visiting another tribe at dawn and even smelled something burning at his place before. The tribe members were curious about what he was doing, but knowing Vikir, they believed that he had planned and thought things through. The main problem however, is that he hasn't been meeting his barbarian waifu, Commander Ayun, who is currently standing outside of his home. With a worried expression on her face and her hands held tightly together, Ayun begins to speak to Vikir's home, telling him that she heard from her mother about how he asked about the madam. She tells him that the madam is a monster that no warrior can defeat, which made her wonder if Vikir was planning to fight it. She even tells him that she had to cut off Bikira's leg yesterday, and that she believes Bikira could never run the same as before. Tears started to flow down her face over imagining what would happen to Vikir if he follows through with his plan. But then he calls out to her, telling Ayin to come in as he had something to say. Upon entering his home, Ayin could see that Vikir was standing before a board filled with papers. With a stunned impression on her face, Ayin asks Vikir about what all these things were. He reveals that these were the records of the madam that he had gathered from all the tribes in the forest. Vikir was doing research about the web and skin that he brought from the madam's cave, along with the egg that she laid. Ayin was instantly shocked to learn that Vikir had ventured into the madam's lair, which meant that he was really going to fight her. So she tells him that if he does, she is willing to join him. But he denies her request, stating that Ayin was still limping from the injury she got from Adonai, which only made her a burden. In a serious tone, Vikir reveals to her that he was going to leave the forest soon, as there was something that he must do, so he needed to return to the Baskerville clan. Ayin was saddened to hear that as she already knew that, but Vikir activates his Riz, telling her that after he finished everything he needed to do, he was thinking of coming back here. Comment below if you believe that Ayin is the one true waifu. But in order to do that, Vikir needed to protect the place he wanted to return to, revealing a giant research plan of the madam written on the walls. As Ayin scans his work, he tells her that he had finished planning how he was going to hunt the madam, and assures her that the thing that happened to Bikira, wouldn't happen to him. Ayin couldn't believe that Vikir would use the hunt for the madam, which seems reckless to her. She started to recount the times he had helped the village when the poison spread throughout the forest, even the incident involving Auman, every time Vikir faced a problem that couldn't be solved, 
he always brought back positive results. Even though tears started to flow from her eyes, Ayun wore a bright smile on her face as she held his hand, telling him that his words always make her expect things. So as they held their hands together above a warm bright lamp, Ayun asked him if it was all right for her to look forward to the result, Vikir took a moment before telling her, of course. We now turn to a rainy forest, where Vikir was spotted facing off against a gigantic green lizard monster with bright yellow eyes. The lizard monster made the first move by striking at Vikir with its sharp claw, but our boy easily cut off its arm with a single swing of his Beelzebub sword. Vikir's eyes were drawn to its open wound after having its arm sliced off. He could see that it was true, that if its head was still attached, then it would still continue to regenerate itself. This was the final thing Vikir needed in order to hunt the madam. With his eyes glowing bright red, he tells the salamander to give him that ability, making Beelzebub scream for joy. Finally, Vikir had three skills installed inside Beelzebub, the first slot belongs to Burn Injury from Cerberus, the second slot belongs to Silent Heal from Mishusu while the third and final slot belongs to Regeneration from the Swamp Marsh Salamander. We now turn to a Hun who was wiping his sweat off his chin. He stands before a beautiful wooden house, calling it all done. The tribe members beside him couldn't believe that a Hun could build houses well, they wonder if this house was for Vikir. A Hun proudly tells them that Vikir was like a brother to him so building a house for him to live in is a brother's duty. The tribe members started to make fun of Ahun, recalling that he used to hate Vikir at first, hearing their words, Ahun shouts at them to shut up. After all, the village has finally returned to its original state, all thanks to Vikir. So they decided to go and tell Vikir about his new house, but upon reaching the place he was using, Ahun and the others couldn't find him anywhere, they felt disappointed by his sudden disappearance, as they wanted to see his reaction for the new house. Ayin was also staying near his place, but her face was filled with worry as she knew that today was that day. Looking at the forest as the winds blew hard on it, Ayin prays to the god of the forest, hoping that the god would bless the great warrior who will come face to face with disaster. We now turn to Vikir who was once again at the entrance of the madam's lair, as he looked up, he could see that the skies were showing signs of rain soon. As he stared back into the lair, he knew that the madam should probably be sleeping now and that this is the best time to hunt her. Vikir had thought of dozens of variables that could happen when hunting the madam. He had also planned out all the methods to handle those situations. As he leaps forward, now it is the time to put that plan into action. With a cool backflip into the lair, the hunt is on. It turns out that Vikir was right, the madam was sleeping peacefully as her green poison dripped down her vicious fangs while hanging upside down. Using her own spider webs, Vikir rushes down, with his Beelzebub sword summoned and eyes filled with murder. Vikir unleashes the Baskerville sixth technique, starting the hunt by cutting off one of the madam's legs. She definitely felt the pain as all her eyes awakened as she looked at her missing leg. Vikir was keeping a close eye on the situation, he could see that as per Adonai's records, the leg he cut off had doubled. The madam wasted no time at all, screeching at Vikir as she tried to stab him with her other legs. Seeing her reaction and dodging her attack, Vikir decided to go with plan A channeling the inner Beyblade inside of him, Vikir started to zig and zag, cutting the bitch up. He was so fast with his attacks that the madam couldn't even react to them at all. So she does the only thing she could, just vomit a ton of green poison everywhere. The spray and pray method. It seems to work as it stopped Vikir's attacks as he had to focus on dodging the multiple puddles of poison. Unfortunately, a single drop of the green poison manages to find its way onto his left arm. He could instantly feel the pain as he watches the madam's poison spreading instantly throughout his hand. Taking a deep breath, Vikir thought about how he didn't want to do this, but as a Giga Chad, he had no choice, so Vikir simply sliced his own hand off in a single strike. Just like Deadpool and the salamander monster, Vikir's arm started to heal, which surprised the madam. He tells her that there was no need to be surprised, since he was in the same position as her now. And so, the battle between the two titans started once again. Vikir continues to slice off every leg of hers while dodging every attack that was sent his way. He uses the spider webs and the environment to his advantage, dodging and striking with every chance he gets. But then, the madam manages to land a devastating blow to Vikir, ripping his right arm and leg to nothing. His face was filled with pain as he tumbles across the madam's leg. Luckily, he manages to prevent himself from falling completely by gripping onto the madam's leg with his remaining arm, waiting until his right side had healed from her attack. 
Once he was healed, Vikir disappeared from her leg and started his rampage attack against her once again. Once again, this was the clash between titans. Soon enough, pieces of the madam's legs were scattered across the ground along with her poison, even Vikir's own hand was spotted. This time, his left side was recovering as he started to breathe even harder. How many times have I regenerated, wondered Vikir as he notices that it takes a lot of stamina to regenerate. But on the other hand, he sees that the madam had doubled the number of her legs like nothing. But as he continued to breathe heavily, Vikir started to smile. He then leaps onto a spider web, but this time, instead of fighting the madam, he races to the entrance of the lair above. Seeing where he was going, the madam started to move her many legs, in hopes of chasing after Vikir. But then she stops in her tracks. Vikir tells the madam that he knew that he wouldn't be able to catch up to her, but it was all a part of his plan for her to double the number of legs she had. Although, the fact that she could double the number of legs she has when it gets cut makes it seem like a godlike skill, but it can become a curse if she keeps doubling the same leg as it becomes difficult to move. With a simple side step, Vikir dodges a string of webs coming his way. He already knew that she would use her web when it came to this. After looking at the madam's web, he found that it had a very critical weakness, although her web doesn't burn from normal fire. Vikir knew with a sinister smile on his face, that her web burns like wood when it comes to the purple hellfires from the underworld, and since this place was filled with gas from all the corpses. Vikir questions the madam if she knew that it was the best condition for a fire to spread, as he lands on top of a dead ox bear. You stacked up too much karma because you were drunk on power. And now, it's time for you to receive that karma. And so, Vikir stabs his Beelzebub sword covered in the hellfire straight into the dead ox bear's skull, causing it to expand with hellfire. Soon enough, a purple hellfire explosion occurs everywhere inside the lair, hopefully killing the madam once and for all. We now return to a past memory of when Vikir was preparing and studying for his upcoming battle with Madame Eight Legs. As his eyes remained focused throughout the late night, he recalled from his practical evaluation that he had a suspicion when he crossed paths with the Cerberus that was chased out of the territory. A question came across his mind, why did the barbarians need to chase away dangerous monsters from the La Rouge at Le Noir Mountain? The reason behind it was due to territorial expansion. The barbarians were chased into the La Rouge Le Noir Mountain due to the madam. With that, Vikir was able to find the madam's lair which was hidden at the back. The true reason behind why the madam used the barbarians in the forest to drive out the Cerberus and Hell monsters, was so that she could distance herself from her weakness, which was Hellfire. Vikir couldn't believe that the madam's weakness had been right under his nose this entire time. Now, we return to the moment that Vikir was aiming his sword directly at the oxbear dead corpse. As he inserted his blade deep into the dead body of the oxbear, he unleashed a small spark made up of the hellfire that the madam was afraid of. Causing a chain reaction to occur, as the gases in the dead body started to ignite from the hellfire that Vikir had brought, the purple hellfire continued to spread all throughout the cave. Using the dead bodies that the madam had kept on the walls with her web, Vikir's hellfire explosion was only made bigger. The madam could do nothing but watch in horror with her multiple eyes as the purple hellfire reached even closer to her. It was time for her to receive the karma that she had accumulated after killing so many. Even the purple hellfire turned into deathly skulls, representing her many victims as the purple hellfire finally engulfs her completely. Vikir easily made his way down the outside of the madam's lair, watching its entrance be covered in smoke and purple embers. He went on to explain that since he found the madam's weakness of hellfire, he needed to make sure that she doesn't escape from the lair which was filled with webs. He also knew that she couldn't jump out due to her many legs, and that the madam, who can't use its webs right now, will find it impossible to escape. No matter how tough it is, as long as it's alive, if it breathes in smoke, its inside will burn. Due to the high temperatures of hellfire, its outer skin will melt. As Vikir continued to watch as the lair burned throughout the night, he believed that all he needed to do right now was to wait for the madam to die. Once the fire goes out, he will just need to get the madam's ability. But then he felt an immense pressure that forced him down. Vikir immediately turns around to scan the area to see where it was coming from, he could see that the entire area was feeling the same immense pressure as he was. Soon enough, the pressure was gone and so were the flames that were covering the entrance of the lair, leaving only black smoke behind. Until something quick erupts and cuts across the mountain. Something was emerging from the sudden attack from within the mountain, much to the shock of Vikir. The madam had survived his explosion plan, 
revealing her body filled with battle wounds from the hellfire but Vikir couldn't believe that she had destroyed the entire mountain in order to escape. As she slowly made her way down from her mountain, the madam started to look for Vikir with her endless amount of eyes. Seeing that she couldn't find him at all, the madam decides to spit out a gigantic green ball of poison into the air. It explodes in the skies above, like a firework, splitting itself into smaller balls of poison aimed everywhere throughout the forest. She was going with the classic method of spray and pray. Her poison was deadly as the moment it touched the trees and branches in the forest, it melted instantly. But the madam was still feeling furious as she made loud hissing noises, unaware that our boy was hiding directly beneath her. He looks up to her from below, with nervous sweat drops appearing on his face as he breathes heavily, Vikir couldn't believe that the madam couldn't find him. He notices that it was because she couldn't use the hair on her eyes and skin because they had been burned off. And because she had overexerted herself and destroyed the mountain in the process, there was a large crack in her shell. So Vikir places another plan in motion as he uses her legs to leap onto her body. Believing that it was still possible to beat her, Vikir does a backflip, before summoning his Beelzebub sword, with his eyes focused, he needs to aim for the crack that was created when the madam destroyed the mountain. And so, he does as he planned to, landing a powerful attack using the Baskerville Sixth technique. But the madam was a tough bitch as his attack simply bounced off her body, she definitely felt the pain as she hissed even louder, Vikir immediately retreated back onto the top of a nearby tree, thinking that he needed to hit the crack a few more times. And so, he went back into focused mode, hoping to land another attack on her. But before he could, something started to happen with the madam, her eyes started to shed its skin, revealing fully healed and operationally eyes that clearly spotted Vikir right in front of her. Our boy could only stare in awe before being greeted by an attack from one of her legs. Sending him flying across the forest, leaving destruction behind. Vikir finally came to a stop after being sent flying. Looking back to where the madam was, he knew that he had made a mistake. He didn't think that she was able to regenerate by shedding parts of her skin. With both his legs blown away, it might be because he was tired, but Vikir's regeneration speed was slow right now. Our boy started to breathe even more heavily as the madam made her way towards him. But as he tried to get up right away, a voice asked him a question, so why are you fighting a monster like that? A figure appeared beside him as he laid on the ground, telling Vikir that if it's for his goal, then he should have left the forest already. Vikir's eyes started to widen as his breathing became unstable, the voice reminding him that to take revenge on Hugo, he should have only thought about killing him. Vikir finally looked up to see who it was. It was him, from the past, in the form of a ghost. The past Vikir reminds him that killing Hugo was his only desire. His past self head reappears on the ground beside him, telling Vikir that he had become dull and slow since he came to the forest. With tears of blood dripping down his eyes, Vikir's past self shouts at him to remember, remember his hatred for Hugo. And the feeling he experienced when Hugo had sliced his throat. We now turn to the original Vikir van Baskerville, who explains that his only reason for existing was to do the missions given to him by his master Hugo. No matter what the situation was, the mission was more important than his life. The moment he was born, that was what he was taught, that was how things were, and that was the only way he felt fulfilled. But sadly, he realized it too late that all those things aren't what he believed in. When he was beheaded by Hugo, that was when he knew that the life he lived had been futile and in vain. And so, we return to the present where the original Vikir reminded his current self that those were the reasons why he wanted to make Hugo feel the same thing he did. The despair from back then. The beheaded Vikir shouts at our boy, telling him that he messed everything up. The head continues to remind Vikir that killing Hugo and destroying Baskerville was the sole reason behind his existence now. Chains started to appear around Vikir's neck as he recalled his purpose of killing Hugo. Looking back at his life, he wonders if there was ever a time he had gone against Hugo's will in his past life. There was one moment in his life, the moment he thought of deserting the group as they made their way back after a mission. As the others continued to walk back, Vikir stood alone, staring at the empty forest. But then he changed his mind and followed the others back. Because he chose the path that his chain was leading him, deep down, Vikir knew that he was just another one of Hugo's well-trained bloodhounds. But the current Vikir gritted his teeth hard after being reminded of his past, he tells his past self to not tie him down, with either Hugo's commands or his sense of duty for revenge. Vikir declares loudly that he will no longer give him the right to do anything. Because the moment he was executed by Hugo, 
Vikir decided that he would no longer live like a bloodhound that hunts his prey anymore. But he regretted the decision he made. Because what he sincerely wanted right now, was something different. His past self started to fade away as the madam finally spots our boy. She lets out a horrifying scream before sending one of her legs towards Vikir, who is still laying flat on the ground with his legs missing. As he gripped the earth hard with his fingers, the thing he wanted in this life was freedom. Vikir manages to somehow leap out of the way, dodging the madam's attack. As he rolled away due to the impact of the attack, he started to think about his desires, from his revenge against Hugo, and to the place that he wants to protect and return to. With these desires in mind, Vikir's reason for fighting was reignited, as he wanted to live by his own desires this time. So he tells himself to get up and fight, in order to no longer be controlled by anyone or anything. This time, before the madam's leg could reach him, a familiar hair is seen, just as a powerful blue attack strikes the madam's leg. Knocking it away from Vikir and saving his life in the process. The attacks didn't end there as more shots were fired at the madam. Vikir looks to spot where those attacks came from with a stunned expression on his face. Up on the cliff beside the madam were the shadows of a few people. Everyone's favorite mother and daughter duo have appeared, with their bows raised together. Ayin shouts at the madam, warning her to not touch her husband candidate. She then quickly tells Vikir that they had arrived to fight alongside him. It turns out that every Balak warrior had arrived to help him. Ahun was annoyed that Vikir didn't even tell his brother about the burden he was taking on, while the other warriors began to prepare themselves for a battle against the madam. They raised their bows together, eagerly wanting to help the hero of the forest. Their simple arrows managed to land onto the madam, catching her attention. Even though they didn't do much damage, it gave Vikir enough time to regenerate his legs. As he appears on the back of the madam, he couldn't believe that she didn't listen to him when he told her not to come here. But he was glad, because thanks to Ayin, he survived. With that, Vikir manages to land another powerful blow onto the crack on the madam's body. But his attack was deflected this time as well. Even though it didn't work, Vikir was determined to try and try again. The madam wasn't going to take all of these attacks for nothing and decided to stomp the shit out of everything around her with her multiple legs. The warriors on their beasts were dodging her attacks, warning one another that the madam was going on a rampage. Ayin was glad to see this, as it meant that Vikir had her cornered, so she ordered everyone to keep fighting. Aquila on the other hand was watching the battle on the cliff. Her face was filled with fatigue as she breathed heavily. Still suffering from her wound, she had deemed the madam as a disaster, so she never even thought of killing her. As if all the cells in her body thought it was the obvious thing to do, but the young warrior Vikir showed her something. How to destroy fear, how to go against a disaster. So Aquila was determined to do this as her eyes glowed bright blue, she knew she had to do something, even if she vomited blood or her injury ruptures. For Vikir that's desperately resisting it, she needed an attack that can open up a path. Letting out a powerful blue arrow attack that destroys the cliff that she was on, Aquila manages to land a devastating blow onto the crack that was on the madam's body. This time the spider bitch was the one gasping for air. Vikir wasted no time at all and started to charge towards her once again, this time, his eyes went full bloodhound mode. Zipping through the forest like a speedster, Vikir finally reaches the madam. Unleashing another powerful Baskerville blow onto her, causing her to scream out in pain, but his rage doesn't end here. Vikir unleashes the Baskerville first technique, deeply piercing Fang. Ayin and Ahun could only stare in awe over what he did, as she realized that our boy had gone inside the madam. Deep inside the madam, Vikir started to unleash all of his Baskerville techniques from the second technique called Biting Fang, to the third technique called Slicing Fang, the fourth technique called Tearing Fang, and finally the fifth technique called the Shredding Fang. All of Vikir's moves made a huge impact as the madam started to cough up her purple blood everywhere. But the Hound of Baskerville wasn't done yet as his rage continued to rupture, vowing to no longer live the life of a bloodhound that is led by its shackles. Using the madam's eyes as a way out, Vikir unleashes the sixth technique called Crushing Fang, breaking through her eye and destroying all the chains that held him down till now. The madam bitch could definitely feel the pain as Vikir made his way throughout her body, cutting and slicing every inch of meat within his grasp before eventually making his way to the biggest eye on the spider. Vikir blasts his way out of the madam's body, scattering her blood everywhere as a hole is left in her face after he had made his exit. Ayin and her fellow tribe members were stunned to see that Vikir had escaped from the madam's body by using her own eye against her. They could finally see that the madam had collapsed. 
Within the smoke and dust caused by the madam's collapse, Vikir laid flat on the ground in front of the madam. His face was filled with pain as he gritted his teeth hard while a green substance was spreading across it. He couldn't believe that there was poison within the madam's blood itself. As he lay there in pain, Vikir couldn't help but look at the madam behind him. He could see that she was breathing heavily as though she was finding it difficult to live any longer. Vikir's eyes were tired as he thought that he needed to hurry and wash off the poison. But his tiredness won this battle as he simply closed his eyes, even with the madam's poison spreading through his body. As Vikir laid on the ground unconscious, Beelzebub activated itself. Summoning its blade with Vikir's arm, it shoots out a long pipe straight into the madam's body. The madam was alarmed to see where she was right now. It was shocking to see itself fully healed and in a different dimension, but she wasn't alone. As Beelzebub made its appearance in front of her, alongside the other creatures that Vikir had absorbed in order to gain their abilities. The Cerberus was the first to make a move, letting out a fierce roar from all three of its heads. Each head of the beast stared to chomp down hard onto various parts of the madam, preventing her from moving at all. As the Cerberus continues to hold the madam down, Beelzebub appears right above, aiming its snout right at the madam. Bon appétit, we now return to the sounds of Ayan calling out to Vikir. But as she shouts his name, the other tribe members warn her that there was still poison and that it would be too dangerous to get any closer. Vikir's vision started to appear slightly, he could barely see Ayan in front of himself, as she tells the other tribes to let go while shouting at Vikir to not die. As she still had something to say, but the voices and vision of everyone started to disappear as Vikir fell back into the darkness. Luckily, he still had some energy left as he mutters Ayan's name out loud, surprising everyone around him. With his eyes open fully this time, he looked over to them, telling Ayan that he was okay and that her voice was too loud, which made it hard for our boy to rest. Ayan's eyes were immediately filled with tears as she heard his voice while the other tribe members were happy to hear him. Ayan continues to shout loudly throughout the forest, shouting at Vikir that she was worried about him, and that he was a dummy. Our wonderful cute little Beelzebub on the other hand was overjoyed. After all, it absorbed the madam's ability, giving Vikir the power to use Madam Eight Legs Deadly Poison, a ranked S skill. The tribe members of the forest were now completely wasted, laying on the ground in a drunken state with empty plates and cups everywhere around them. Aquila and the other tribe leader were sharing drinks, toasting each other for a job well done. Vikir however, was feeling tired as hell. He looked around the area, wondering how many days it had been since they started the festival. Seeing how everyone was, he realized how these tribe members love to enjoy their festivals. We finally see Bakira, who was healthy and panting cheerfully. Vikir was visiting Bakira, asking the wolf about how it was feeling, even with one of its legs missing. As he strokes Bakira's chin, Vikir had heard about how Bakira managed to overpower another wolf even with a missing leg, and had found a partner. Hearing that, Vikir tells Bakira to rest now since he had taken revenge for him. Looking at his own hand, Vikir thought about how after killing the madam, although unskilled, he was able to use the seventh technique. But he wonders if it was due to the achievement effect that he obtained after killing the madam, or was it due to the increase in his understanding of martial arts through that life or death experience. Compared to Hugo's seventh technique which can be considered great, Vikir's version was still imperfect. So it was still difficult for him to fight Hugo, a swordmaster, head on. But still, Vikir believes that he had gotten a lot stronger in comparison to the other times, as he gripped onto his necklace made out of flowers, he rips it off, revealing his bloodhound side, Vikir knew that with the death of the madam, he had achieved his goal here, so it was time for him to return to Baskerville. After announcing his intentions, someone else hidden behind a pillar heard our boy. Deep within the forest and mountains, Vikir had gathered his things and was heading out, he thanks the matriarch for letting him leave readily as she had no reason to stop him anyways. She tells him with a smile on her face that he had become a part of their family, forever. And that being separated doesn't mean that their ties as a family are severed. She reminds Vikir that wherever and whenever he was in this world, he would always be a Balak hunting commander. And to never forget that fact, Vikir replies with thanks after hearing that from her, but he scans the crowd of tribe members, wondering if Ayan wasn't coming. It couldn't be helped since she didn't like the idea of him leaving in the first place. After speaking with Aquila, Vikir turns around and tells them that he is leaving. The tribe members started to send Vikir off with cheers of encouragement, telling him that no matter what happens, they would come to help him when he wants. Ahun goes a step further, 
calling Vic your brother, he tells him that he was going to wait for him here. Ahul was by his side, and shouted to Vikir to keep them updated. As he exited the trees and entered the light, the tribe members bid their final farewells to him, goodbye Vikir, our hero. Hearing their cheers and goodbyes brought a smile across his face, but as he took another step forward, Vikir was greeted by the sight of a golden wheat garden. Standing in the middle of it was Ayan, who was holding on to something wrapped with bandages. Looking right at her, Vikir calls out to Ayan. All she asked Vikir was whether he was really leaving. Her question left him speechless as he didn't reply right away. Taking his silence as an answer, Ayan immediately pushes the item she was carrying into his arms, telling Vikir to take it with him. Looking at the object wrapped in bandages in his hands, Ayan shyly reveals to him that it was called Anubis, it was the large bow that Adonai used, she had adjusted it so that Vikir could use it instead. Still fixated on the bow, Vikir wonders if that was the reason why he couldn't see her for a while. But our wife who wasn't done yet with the gifts, as she tames our boy by placing a collar with a broken chain around his neck. Vikir was curious about it. Ayan tells him that she made it because he kept talking about bloodhounds when he collapsed and in his sleep. She reminds Vikir that he wasn't a bloodhound. No matter what, a bloodhound wouldn't act like he does. She proudly tells Vikir that he was a wolf and that it would be strange for him to be dragged around by a chain. Vikir couldn't believe that Ayan's words would comfort him like this. But just as he was about to thank Ayan, she moves in for the kill. Holding onto Vikir's broken chain as she leans her face close to his. She tiptoes to reach him, holding his chain even tighter. The two exchange kisses as the winds blew all around them in the golden field of wheat. As soon as their lips parted away from one another, Ayan's eyes were once again filled with tears as she looked down. This time, she left Vikir behind, telling him about how she heard that this was how you say goodbye in the Empire. She even recalled that he was much smaller than her in the past, but had grown a lot since then. Be well and be careful, said Ayan as Vikir stood still. He then started to smile, telling Ayan that this was the first time he had heard that this was a way to say goodbye in the Empire. See you next time, Ayan. Those words were enough to cause her body to shake as she stopped in her tracks. Ayan then wipes her eyes with her hand, before slowly turning around. As the wind blew her beautiful hair through the air, Ayan's face was filled with tears at the corner of her eyes and a bright smile. She happily tells Vicar, see you next time. Vikir has finally left the forest after so many years, wearing a cloak, he arrives and watches over a town. Looking at it, he thought about how it's been a while since he had been here, in the Red All Castle. Considering that the morgues are here, it seems like they were still mining rubies. Which means that they've continuously worked together with the Baskervilles. Thinking of the morgue family, Vikir couldn't help but wonder if a certain fiery woman was here in this place. But he scratches that thought away, thinking about how tired he was right now. Vikir wouldn't be able to handle what'll she say to criticize him when they see each other. He finally enters Red All Town by dropping, seeing how late it was getting. Vikir decided to look for an inn to stay here for the day. But as he looks around to find the inn, he notices something else. A giant gold statue was made in the center of the town, looking at it. Vikir wondered when they had built such a thing. In order to make a statue like this, they would have needed the approval from the Morgue and Baskerville families, which made him wonder if Hugo had allowed for such a thing to be made. But as he thought about it, someone shouts at Vikir, asking him about what he was doing. A guard had appeared behind our boy, warning him to not touch the hero's statue. He tells Vikir that if he tries taking a piece of gold from the statue, then he wouldn't be forgiven. So he should just look at it from afar and never touch it. Vikir dismisses all the warnings and only asks the guard about the so-called hero he mentioned. The guard was stunned to hear this from our boy, wondering if he was a foreigner who didn't know about their legend. The guard's eyes started to shine like the stars in the sky. He was excited to recite the story of the legend to someone who didn't know about him. He even reveals that he was there when it all happened so he couldn't hold back. He starts to tell the story of the legend who had the power to kill countless barbarians with a mere sword. Not to mention his chivalry and mentality when he dove into a deadly situation, resulting in him saving the weak and beloved daughter of the Morgue family. And his sacred sacrifice to buy time for the joined forces to run away while he bravely fought against the large monster, also known as the now dead Madame Eight Legs. The guard continues to excitedly explain to Vikir that the legend's story gives off so many emotions that it made him tremble. Because of that, the Morgue family carved a gold statue of him out of gratitude. After listening to the guard this entire time, Vikir started to piece everything together, 
making him realize that the great hero who lived here just two years ago, was him. Vikir Van Baskerville. After the guard had revealed his name, Vikir immediately turned into Jojo's style face while the guard was shining even more brightly as he stared at the golden statue. After the story time, we find ourselves at the town's inn, where mugs of beer are slammed hard onto the table. The triplets of the Morgue family were drinking in the inn, talking about how they still hadn't forgotten the way their hearts skipped when they first saw Sir Vikir. They even mentioned that they thought of him as just a pretty boy when they first met. But the girls told the guards in the inn that they knew Vikir's worth the first time they saw him. Seeing the three ladies here, the guards were excited to hear the story from the heads of the fortress about Sir Vikir. The first triplet told everyone that Vikir had charisma, and that she wanted to get close to him but it wasn't that easy. Then the second triplet revealed that they had talked with Vikir a lot the first time they met, although they were disturbed by the three mutts from the Baskerville family. The last triplet recalled that the last time she saw Vikir, all the exhaustion from her body disappeared in those few moments. They continued to praise Vikir loudly in the inn, telling everyone that the gold statue in the square over there doesn't even contain half of Sir Vikir's true beauty. It turns out that our boy had been listening to them talk this entire time, but he was thinking that what they said was a lot different from how he remembered the past to be. But after listening to their stories, Vikir wondered if the outcomes accomplished by Adolf Morg and the joined forces ended up being credited to him instead? The only true part of the story the triplets told was that Vikir did fight against the madam at the end. Through the chatty triplets, Vikir was able to listen in on some unexpected information. Two years ago, after he had gone missing, Hugo Le Baskerville was furious and went to the Morgue family multiple times and caused a scene. His actions resulted in the Morgue family giving a huge compensation to the Baskerville family. But it seemed like Hugo's rage didn't end there. Taking a sip from his drink, Vikir thought that the reason was because Hugo had lost a useful bloodhound, which of course would make him angry, and that the compensation he received from the Morgue family probably wasn't good enough. We returned to the triplets who were still being delusional, thinking that if Vikir was still alive, then they would have made a great couple. The two sisters began to fight over one another over who would have won Vikir's heart but the last sister was different. With a smile on her face, she happily tells her sisters to not fight and that they could all date him together. Luckily, the triplets believed that Vikir was gone so they decided to end their own fights. Vikir decided that he couldn't listen to them anymore and started to leave. But just as he was about to pick his stuff up, one of the triplets noticed him at the bar. She immediately points her finger at Vikir's direction, shouting at him, Hey you! Suspicious looking guy, come here! Her words and actions caught everyone's attention as they stared at where she pointed at. Vikir didn't listen to her words at all as the sisters began to fight one another, claiming that the barbarians have been quiet recently, they could see that she was drunk again and making a fuss. But the triplet who shouted at Vikir was adamant that her female senses were telling her that our boy was suspicious, so she repeated her words at Vikir, telling him to hurry up and come over to their side. But he didn't listen to her commands which pissed her off. The triplet uses her spell called Binding to summon tree vines from beneath the ground, causing them to wrap themselves around Vikir's feet. But the spell fails to catch our boy as he simply jumps into the air, while doing a somersault. His quick reaction to the spell catches everyone off guard, and leaves the triplets and guards stunned. But the moment he landed back onto the ground, Vikir was surrounded by everyone. All three triplets had casted their own spells using the water, earth and wood style. While the guards pointed their spears at him, they immediately ordered Vikir to remove his hood and revealed who he was. Seeing how surrounded he was, Vikir thought that things were getting a bit crazy. So he decides to remove his hood, believing that it didn't matter since he was going to tell the Baskerville family that he was back. The moment the hood was gone, Vikir's riz was unleashed, captivating all three of the triplets, as they stared at him with heavily blushed faces. Our boy just got a triple kill. Looking at Vikir's current appearance, the words that came across their mind was haughty. But then, one of the guards beside the sisters realizes something about Vikir's face. Looking closer this time, he could see that the expression he had was kinda off but was also similar to the statue, including his red eyes and black hair. After hearing this, the triplets started to pay closer attention to Vikir's looks. And then it hit all three of them at the same time causing their faces to change into disgust once they realized that the hottie in front of them was the real-life living Vikir van Baskerville. The night soon turned into day as we turned to the triplets and Vikir on a bridge. The triplets reminded Vikir that he could have stayed in the fortress VIP room but he had declined their offer last night. Stating that the accommodation fee would have gone to waste, 
The girls started to fall for Vikir's Riz, believing that he was interested in them since he first came to see them. They also notified him that, as requested by him yesterday, they had sent valuable news through the owl. But what Vikir wanted was for them to contact the Baskerville family. The sisters tried to make an excuse that they thought his return was great news but all they did was make Vikir think of them as annoying. As Vikir started to leave, the girls asked him if he really didn't need them to escort him. He tells them it was fine since they must be busy but the girls revealed to him that they weren't. Since they didn't have any work to do here, all they did was just sleep. After hearing them say that, Vikir decided that when he heads back, the first thing he was going to do was report that the people whom the Morg family deployed were actually lazy. But before he left, Vikir turns around to ask them about Kamu Morg since he didn't see her, which made him wonder how she was. The triplets revealed to Vikir that Kamu was doing her closed-door training right now, and that she had suddenly withdrawn from her uncle Adolf's Hall of Light, then entered the Hall of Darkness and is currently putting all her efforts into magic research. Vikir couldn't believe that she had joined the Hall of Darkness, because before he regressed, Kamu Morg had a really bad relationship with the head of the Hall of Darkness, called Snake. Preparing to ride off, Vikir wondered if this was another portion of the future he had altered. He tells the triplets to pass a message to Kamu, that he wanted to see her when she has time and to leave the Hall of Darkness. The sisters couldn't believe that that was all Vikir had to say to her, even though they were in a relationship with her and would be seeing her for the first time in two years. And so, the hero of the Red All Mountain has returned, the news was spread rapidly throughout the empire. The people who had a connection with Vikir started to receive the news of his return through the newsletter spread everywhere. To the people he was working with, to the uncle of his future waifu and to the innocent saint. Finally, a man rushes into a familiar room that we have all seen before. Breathing heavily and with a piece of paper in his hand, he reports to the patriarch. Upon hearing the sudden news, a dreadful aura was unleashed by Hugo's current appearance, his eyes turned red like a bloodhound as he asked the servant if what he said was true. After getting a ton of experience and increasing his strength through his adventures in the forest, Vikir van Baskerville, has finally returned to the world. Chihuahua was delighted to see that Vikir had arrived through the main door this time, instead of the window like before. But as he stood near the window, Vikir was bothered about something. He wanted to know why there were so many people gathered outside from where they were. The local citizens of the town had gathered happily, holding banners filled with heart shapes and showering Vikir with words of praise. Our boy has now officially become some sort of K-pop idol. Chihuahua explains that the news about his return had spread throughout the empire. And that everyone came here to welcome him back. Vikir could only comment that it was annoying while holding his head as the door to the room opened suddenly. Our dear sweet angel, Pomerian had arrived, shouting at Vikir and calling him daddy. As he patted her head, he told her to call him uncle instead of daddy, but she was too excited. Holding something within her tiny hands, Pomerian tells Vikir to look at what it is. She happily announces to everyone that she had caught a mouse. Vikir looks at it and warns her that even though it was a cute rodent, since it was dead, she needed to be careful to not catch the Black Death. He then moves on to ask Chihuahua about whether the problems within Underdog City had been resolved. He reports to Vikir that thanks to Cindy, they had all been resolved successfully. He even mentions that she was an excellent worker. But as he opens the drawer of the table, he informs Vikir that there was a case that even Cindy couldn't find any leads on. Catching Vikir's attention, placing an envelope onto the table labeled F10, Chihuahua reports that in recent years, children from the slums have been going missing one after the other. The children hadn't been kidnapped since no one had contacted the parents, and they hadn't been seen on the black market. So they couldn't figure out the motive behind the abductions of the children. All the children had disappeared without a trace, so it definitely wasn't the monsters. But although there isn't any physical evidence, Chihuahua was sure that it was done by the same person. After reading the report that Chihuahua had given him, Vikir's face was immediately filled with dread as he gripped the papers tightly in his hand. The children's disappearance case of the underdog city, was exactly similar to what he was framed with in his past life. But he was confused as this event was supposed to happen several years later since he knew that this case was related to something else. But as they were discussing the case, Pomerian shouts at them to look at her. She proudly shows off the dead mouse from before, who stood healthy and alive on her arm this time. Pomerian had brought it back from the dead, leaving Vikir and Chihuahua in a state of shock and confusion as they were stunned by what was happening. So he asks her if she had really brought the mouse back to life. She happily tells them that she did with a bright smile on her face. 
Looking at her playing with the once dead mouse, Vikir thought about how he was now certain that she had brought it back to life, making him wonder if it was voodooism, which uses mana from another dimension. So then, he asks Pomerian about when she discovered that she could do such a thing. With her tiny hands, she started to count back the number of nights, and ended with three nights ago. She reveals to Vikir that simply copied what her tribe's people did. Hearing that, a nervous sweat drop drips down his face as Vikir thought about how one of the Lokoko tribe's villages found Pomerian, which made him think that they had acquired black and evil spirit magic. In the Baskerville and Morg clan, which are known for their geniuses, children need to be at least eight years old to use magic. But compared to them, our little angel, Pomerian, who is five years old, is able to use another dimension's mana which is difficult to sense. A magical genius from the Baskerville family, more specifically, a black magic genius at that. Vikir could only think of Hugo's completely enraged face once he found out about this. He believes that Hugo would call for her immediate execution, knowing that she uses black magic and has barbarian blood too. Thinking that he knew Hugo well, Vikir believed that it would be best for Pomerian and Hugo to never meet one another. As he thought about it, Chihuahua appeared near the window just as a pigeon arrived. Turns out, the pigeon was used to deliver a message on a note. Looking at it instantly brought shock to Chihuahua's face as he read it. He immediately calls out to Vikir, telling him that it was bad. Chihuahua's words started to come out in pieces as he read out the contents of the letter, revealing something from the main house. Unable to understand his words, Vikir tells Chihuahua to speak slowly and calmly. After catching his breath, Chihuahua reveals that the Patriarch was coming here in person. And so, Hugo makes his appearance. The scene changes to cups of tea placed on the table. Chihuahua stood behind Vikir as Barrymore does the same but behind Hugo. Father and son continued to simply stare at one another as time went by while the room was dead silent. Hugo was the first to speak, stating the fact that Vikir had returned. Chihuahua was glad that they had finally spoken. Looking around, Vikir thought about how sudden it was for Hugo to come here, and that luckily, he hid Pomerian in the next room so hopefully nothing happens. Hugo was glad to see that Vikir had returned, so he wanted to know what he had been up to till now. Vikir reveals to Hugo that while wandering the forest, he stayed with the barbarians and focused on recovering his injuries. During that time, he pretended to be friendly and had gotten a grasp on the barbarians, so he was able to think of a way to wipe them out. Hugo was curious to know what Vikir planned to do, so he revealed it to him. Controlling the barbarians by utilizing the Empire's industrial products. He further tells Hugo that the barbarians consider the Empire's cheap glass orbs and woolen products, and even vegetables and grains as precious items. So if they use that to their advantage, then they would be able to capture the barbarians effectively. But Hugo wasn't impressed by this, calling Vikir's idea as trading and not suppressing them. Hearing this, Vikir corrects him by stating that the barbarians will die in the process. With his eyes glowing with a mad red light, Vikir reveals that in exchange for the products, he was planning to request a monster subjugation. Hugo thought about Vikir's idea of making the barbarians subjugate the monsters, so that they can secure their own territory while killing the barbarians off. Like father, like son, the same red glow appears in Hugo's eyes as he grins widely. Calling Vikir's idea clever, which was to be expected from his son. As they continued to discuss Vikir's idea, Chihuahua couldn't help but sweat nervously while thinking that this was a conversation between a father and son who had just been reunited. Barrymore on the other hand noticed something else, Hugo was smiling. He recalled that he hadn't seen him smile at all during the two years that Vikir had disappeared in. While taking a sip of his drink, Vikir thought about how he didn't want the Balak people to suffer because of the Baskerville family. From the Baskerville's perspective, it would seem like the natives are dying as they are clearing up the monsters. But in reality, they're just returning to the place where the madam was. While stopping the battle between the two of them, the Baliks will have the time to increase their forces. Hugo, who doesn't know about the madam's existence, would think that the natives will easily agree to this. Without realizing that his enemy, the natives of the forest, are increasing their powers. But Hugo was pissed off by something all of a sudden, catching Vikir's attention. The liquid inside the cup started to boil suddenly, as Hugo unleashed a powerfully aura filled with hatred, announcing to everyone that they will not trade with the Lokoko tribe. As he reveals that he was going to annihilate that tribe, Vikir agreed to Hugo's intentions, while being taken back by his rageful aura from earlier, as he didn't expect Hugo to still have a grudge against the Lokoko tribe, 
which is more of the reason why he shouldn't let him meet Pomerian. Hugo had finally regained his composure after a while, realizing that he had only been talking about the barbarians since meeting his son that he lost contact with for a long time. He then tells Vikir to not go overboard in the front lines again. Revealing that after he had saved the morgue's daughter and went missing, the Baskervilles were able to obtain a great diplomatic benefit from the morgues. Even the Imperial family had heard about this moving story, and have come to think highly of the Baskerville knights. However, to Hugo, who saw himself as Vikir's father, had lost his son, making all of that meaningless. He continues to lecture Vikir that obtaining things in exchange for losing a child is worthless, so he shouldn't overdo it from now on. Hearing those kind words, Vikir could only think of them as a pretense. Before his regression, the night he escaped after being framed, the feeling of being stabbed in the back, literally, and the cold stares from the bloodhounds whom he shared joys and sorrows with. Vikir could tell in an instant that he was abandoned by his master. Hugo didn't even give him a chance to explain himself, so Vikir was sure that his fangs wouldn't become dull because of his pretense. As lightning strikes the land, Vikir thanks Hugo for his worries while wearing a cold look on his face. A loud wailing sound is heard as Pomerian's voice rings throughout the room, calling out for uncle. Her sudden appearance instantly casted fear into Vikir's and Chihuahua's faces as they realized. Pomerian casually runs past Hugo and Barrymore, complaining to Vikir about the rain and the loudness of the thunder and how it went bang bang. She quickly hugs Vikir, telling him about how scary it was. Vikir started to panic as he shifted his gaze from Pomerian to Hugo, knowing that he couldn't let the both of them meet. But as he stares at Hugo, his eyes widen at a shocking scene in front of them. Hugo was standing up straight with a darkened expression on his face, as he looked closely at Pomerian, his face was filled with confusion over how she looked. The master of the iron-blooded Baskerville family, one of the seven families of the Great Rock Empire, Hugo Le Baskerville. He chased the barbarians far away from the border, he is also the empire's strongest sword saint, who has killed hundreds of monsters. Once he makes a decision, he doesn't change his mind, and he is known to be a man with iron blood. But right now, the man who has iron, Hugo, his emotions had begun to fluctuate for the first time in a long time. As Pomerian continued to hold tightly onto Vikir's shirt, screaming out that the thunder was scary. Hugo could see the reflection of her daughter's face within her. As he called out the name Penelope, Pomerian finally looked up to Hugo, only to be frightened even more as she hid her face in Vikir's chest. Shouting out loud that the mustache man was scary. Seeing Hugo's reaction to Pomerian, Vikir tells him to calm down. He explained to Hugo that he had brought Pomerian here so that he could order her around. He reveals that he saw her red eyes and thought she was one of them, but after looking into it, she was from one of the tribes at the borders. So he didn't believe that she was a family member. Hearing that, Hugo started to regain his composure. He felt a bit off and agreed that he was mistaken for a moment. As there was no way that his daughter, Penelope, would be that young if she were alive. Hugo decided to leave first, informing Vikir that he was tired. A nervous sweat drop drips down Vikir's face as he tells Hugo to have a safe journey back. But deep within his mind, Vikir couldn't believe that Hugo, who possesses the soul of a swordmaster, was that shaken up, which meant that Vikir was right that something was up. Before leaving, Hugo calls out to Vikir as his son, telling him to attend tomorrow's grand banquet. Chihuahua hears that and knows that Hugo was referring to the dinner where only a select few of his closest descendants gather, it was the dream of all Baskerville members to attend that banquet. Vikir agrees to Hugo's request, and tells him that he would see him tomorrow night. But before leaving, Hugo couldn't help himself and stole one final look towards Pomerian, who was crying within Chihuahua's arms. We now turn to Vikir resting back at home, instead of sleeping on his comfortable bed, he chose the floor. Late in the night, he was still wide awake, thinking that even after taking a hot shower and laying on a soft bed, it all felt so foreign to him that he couldn't sleep. He wonders if this was the effect of living with the Balak warriors for two years, as it seems like his body won't get used to this for a while. As he thought about today's events, he found Hugo's reaction to be quite unexpected. He even thought about whether to report to him about Pomerian and the Pendant or not, but after seeing his reaction today, Vikir had made his decision. After tomorrow's grand banquet, he was going to feel Hugo out. As Pomerian might become a good trump card which will lead to Hugo's downfall. But no matter what happens, Vikir needs to make sure that Pomerian doesn't get affected. Vikir's eyes were finally closed after a while as a light breeze entered his room. Followed by a dark figure standing near the window. 
Vikir immediately sensed its presence as his eyes opened wide. The dark figure took out a blade and stood in front of Vikir's bed. But before the figure could do anything, Vikir commented out loud that it hasn't even been a day, and yet the information has already spread so fast, alarming the intruder. Our boy immediately leaps onto the bed with one arm while priming himself to kick the shit out of the intruder. Vikir manages to leg sweep the knife out of the intruder's hand, sending it flying into the nearby wall. But before he could end the intruder's life with his fingers, the intruder shouts at him to wait. Damn, let's all take a moment to look at our boy's veins. Now back to the story. The intruder continues to tell Vikir that it was a joke, looking closer to the masked figure. Vikir realizes who it was. He informs the friend that next time, come after requesting an audience, otherwise it would have been bad if he killed by mistake. The masked figure still found Vikir's strange habit of disguising his pillow as himself and sleeping on the floor, kind of weird. As the masked figure removed their mask, they commented that Vikir still hasn't changed even after coming back from the dead. Whoa, it turns out to be Cindy. After revealing herself, Vikir warns him to not make a scene but she simply sticks her tongue out as a reply. As she walked towards the bed, she asked Vikir if the reason why he sent Chihuahua after her was to check whether she had taken the $10 billion. Vikir revealed that he knew of her ability to increase the wealth of capitalist and build trust and to eventually, waste it all. Which he took account of. But as she sat down on the bed, Cindy called him rude for thinking that way about her, since she was only a financial planner who receives commissions. She even claims that without her, then Judy would have lost the $10 billion he had given her. This was when Vikir revealed that he had assigned bodyguards to Judy to prevent such a thing from happening. And amongst the bodyguards he assigned, one of them was a finance expert, whose job was to filter out the bad guys. Hearing about this, Cindy was surprised to see that those bodyguards didn't mess with her at all. Vikir tells her that it was because he ordered them not to approach her at all. Cindy couldn't believe that she had been dancing in Vikir's palm from the beginning. But as Vikir wore his shirt back on, he wanted to know if she had the information he requested. Cindy immediately unzips her outfit, telling Vikir that she had brought it. As she handed the scroll over to him, our boy was fazed by how her personality had changed since two years ago and wanted her to submit the reports in a folder instead. Since she fulfilled her mission, Vikir agreed to her request of joining on the trade with the natives. Hearing about the reward, Cindy decided that she should call Vikir, boss from now on. Looking at the report that Cindy had given, Vikir could see that it was the information regarding the people attending tomorrow's banquet, he also knew that he would have been invited to the grand banquet as long as he made a great contribution. The first report was about Hugo Le Baskerville, showing his rank as patriarch, status as marquis, and his military prestige as swordmaster. But Vikir knew almost everything about Hugo, so he decided to skip this part of the report. Moving on, something catches his attention. He could see that Boston Terrier and Great Dame were attending the banquet as well. Boston Terrier Le Baskerville, rank as the commander of the Pitbull Order Senator. Status as Count and Military Prestige as the highest ranked graduator. A side note about him is that he is Hugo Le Baskerville's half-brother. Does not like to be restrained and is quite aggressive and short-tempered. Next up is Great Dame Le Baskerville, who holds the rank of commander of the Mastiff Order Senator. Status as Count and Military Prestige as the highest ranked graduator. A side note about him is that he is also Hugo Le Baskerville's half-brother. Although he tries not to get involved with others, he is on bad terms with Count Boston Terrier. Looking at the report, Vikir wonders why these two people who don't attend internal house events would be attending this one. Cindy replies that it was probably because they wanted to meet the young legend of the Baskerville clan who came back from the dead. And they probably wanted to take Vikir into their own orders. Hearing that from her, Vikir could sense that it was going to be an exhausting day for him tomorrow. Next on the report is Osiris Le Baskerville, ranked as a member of the lower house, his status as Viscount with the military prestige as the highest ranked graduator. A side note is that he is Hugo Le Baskerville's eldest son and is currently ranked first in line for succession. Cindy reveals more information that the eldest son who is growing up to become the spitting image of Hugo ever since he was younger has obtained the swordsmanship at the level of the seven counts. He had also been evaluated to reach the level of swordmaster soon. Vikir thought about the time before he regressed, he had seen Osiris from afar a few times. He was a cold and reserved person who doesn't even greet his own subordinates, let alone his younger siblings of the direct bloodline. Knowing this, Cindy was curious about who was stronger, Osiris who's the strongest within the Baskerville clan excluding the Patriarch and the Seven Counts, 
or the main character Vikir? We all know the answer to that right, but instead of answering her, Vikir warns her to not try and grasp their combat abilities. Next on the list was someone who Vikir thought was in the middle of isolation training, but instead was coming back to attend the grand banquet. It was someone named Seth Le Baskerville, ranked as the underdog city's consul, member of the lower house, he holds the status of Shadow Count and has the military prestige mid-ranked graduator. A side note is that he is Hugo Le Baskerville's second son and is currently second in line for succession. Compared to his older brother, his talent in swordsmanship is lacking and he was rather weak from a young age. His personality isn't like the other Baskervilles. He is gentle and kind. When he was younger, he was persecuted by Hugo for being weak. The bloodhounds who were dying as though they were trash. He was the only one who cried for them. He was also the only person that Vikir respected in the Baskerville family. Vikir couldn't believe that he was able to meet him at this time. As he looked through the remaining reports, he could see a few familiar faces and immediately placed them down. Surprising Cindy who wondered why he read through the remaining reports briefly as she did her best to investigate them. Vikir tells her it's because he knew who these guys were very well. It's our favorite triplets. With his sinister bloodhound aura activated, Vikir smiles while looking at the reports of everyone. Knowing that with these people around tomorrow at the grand banquet, a lot of interesting things will definitely happen. The day has finally arrived. Vikir stood in front of a massive door, decorated with symbols as two guards stood by its side. As he slowly opened the doors to the room, he was greeted by a bright light. The people seated at the table in front of him were the ones that were inside of Cindy's report. Each person at the table took a quick look at Vikir as he announced his arrival as per the Patriarch's orders. Some were smiling with joy while others showed no emotion to his arrival. With his head down and his arm across his chest, Vikir thanks the Patriarch for inviting him to the Grand Banquet. With his eyes bright red, Hugo tells his son to come and take a seat. Soon enough, the dining room was filled with the sound of cutlery being used. Everyone who sat at the table were silently eating their food, no one spoke as the servants stood behind. The first to break the silence in the room was Boston Terrier, asking out loud if anyone else thought that the meat was a little undercooked. Hugo took note of his question, making him ask if the food wasn't to his liking. But Boston corrects Hugo, his older brother, saying that he wasn't referring to his own meal. But instead, was referring to the meat on the plate beside him. It turns out that the food he was talking about belongs to Great Dane, who gives Boston the side eye asking him if he has a problem. Sound the alarm because the two uncles are entering the ring. Boston returns with his own side eye, telling Great Dane that he was just mentioning that his meat appears to be very undercooked. Which would be cruel for his lovable nephew to eat his meat undercooked. Great Dane fires back, telling Boston that he acknowledges his lovable nature, reminding him that Vikir was also his nephew. And as his uncle, he would want his nephew to walk on the right path. Boston argued why it was considered right for Vikir to be placed in the Mastiff Order under Great Dane, while Great Dane argued that it would be far better for Vikir than him joining the slow and foolish Pitbull Order. As they continued to argue amongst themselves in front of everyone, Vikir started to wonder if the reason he was invited to the Grand Banquet was for them to recruit him. Two of the seven orders that represent Bakerville, an offer from the Pitbull Order and the Mastiff Order, if it was before Vikir had regressed, then he would have liked it as it was a great offer that guaranteed his success but right now. Our boy was different, so he viewed them simply as mutts. Damn that ice-cold stare. As Barrymore poured wine into Hugo's cup, he commented out loud that the patriarch was in a good mood, considering that his usually silent and aloof younger brothers were now showing affection to the young master. As he takes a sip of the wine, Vikir looks at Hugo while thinking that Barrymore always interprets things in a positive way and how Hugo finds it amusing when his brothers are fighting. Boston finally turns his attention to Vikir, asking about the two years he had spent in the La Rouge et Le Noir Mountains as he wanted to know how many barbarians and monsters he had killed, and to share his experience in the forest with his uncle. Even Great Dane expressed his concern about how his lovable nephew spent his time in the dangerous forest, but he was also interested about his nephew's growth. Hugo cuts in between their conversation, telling his younger brothers to let Vikir eat first and to not pester him too much. But the younger brothers were still curious about Vikir's time in the forest, asking Hugo himself if he wasn't curious himself. Seeing that they weren't listening to his command, Hugo tells them to stop. A single word from him this time was enough for the younger brothers to activate their bloodhound eyes from the fear and feeling of Hugo's immense powers. Hugo unleashes his powerful aura all around, 
reminding everyone why he was the biggest daddy of the Baskerville clan and reminding his younger brothers about how much he hated to repeat himself. Sensing that they had pushed things too far, both Boston and Great Dane immediately apologized to Hugo for their actions. Vicar, however, stood up from his seat, telling his uncles that it wasn't difficult for him to prove his achievements from the past two years in the forest. Hugo was conserved about Vicar since he had traveled quite a distance and that visiting the drill hall will make him even more fatigued. But our boy was fine. He taps his finger onto the table once, telling Hugo that skill can be displayed anywhere, at any time. As one's daily life is an extension of training, Vicar could see that Boston had poured too much wine into his glass while Great Dane's steak seems to be slightly undercooked. Closing his eyes with his finger sill on the table, Vicar unleashed his aura, just from the tip of his finger, sending it flying towards the cup of wine and the plate with steak. In an instant, the steak was cooked better while the wine was boiling. Boston and Great Dane immediately went to check on their wine and steak. Both were impressed by what Vicar had done to their wine and steak in an instant. The uncles were quick to notice that by placing his finger on the table, Vicar had used mana to cook the meat and warm the wine. They couldn't believe that he had reached the mid-ranked graduator at the age of 17, when one usually reaches that stage at 33. Hugo continued to sip his wine silently as the uncles exclaimed out loud that he must be proud to have a son who has mastered all these techniques. As they continued to praise Vicar for his new skills, our boy couldn't help but look at his side as he found something strange. Two years ago, he thought that he had revealed himself as a mid-ranked graduator when he fought the madam. But he couldn't believe that no one knew, looking at the triplets with their shining eyes staring right at him. He knew that these guys should have seen his skills two years ago making him wonder why they didn't report it to the family. As he thought about it, someone else praises Vicar for his hard work, catching his attention. It was Osiris, who told Vicar to keep up the good work. Vicar thanked him for the compliment, but was confused that Osiris had complimented him in the first place. The first successor in line for the current Baskerville family, and the one who resembles Hugo the most is now praising Vicar, which made him wonder if he was assessing him. Another person at the table spoke out loud that it was surprising to see the eldest brother complimenting his younger brother. It turns out to be Set, he explains to Vicar that this was the first time he witnessed Osiris praise someone, let alone smile so openly. Set could also see that Vicar shares the same poker face as Osiris, which made him wonder if he didn't recognize who he is. Vicar tells him that he does know. Set was overjoyed to hear that, explaining that since he had a weak body, he was always either at the medical wing or at the isolation training hall. Set continues to say that the training hall was very close to Underdog City, where Vicar was the deputy consul, he had planned to visit him to learn about his experiences in the forest. Vicar started to think about the past and how Set's bright attitude, which is unlike that of being a Baskerville, hasn't changed. During the fall, Vicar had served under Set, so there were moments when they were together. Amidst the chaos of battle, Set was the only one who comforted the fallen bloodhounds. He was even comforting Vicar, who was drenched in blood after wandering around the battlefield. Even when he was wrongly accused, Set stood by him, defending Vicar until the very end. This man was the only person that Vicar wished to see at this banquet. But something else was happening. Vicar's bloodhound senses had been activated from the start, his eyes sensing all around as he smelled a disgusting stench that reeked since before this horrific stench that only he, who was there during the fall would know. The stench of demons, right now, in this grand banquet, amongst all these powerful individuals of the Baskerville clan. Vicar could sense that there was a demon hiding amongst them. He started to look at everyone closely this time, wondering where the demon is, as the owner of the source of this disgusting stench. Vicar finally closes his eyes after scanning everyone in the room, before opening them once again. Looking at the man right beside him, Set sees his look, and asks if there was something that Vicar needed as the hands of the dead as though in the form of an aura surrounding the sick-looking man, who held a mischievous smile on his face. Vicar could see that Set was having conversations to ease the atmosphere, and even asks the servants serving Goof how they're doing. This man right here, was the same person that Vicar knew before he regressed. But he still wonders why Set had the dirty stench of demons all around him. Set then spoke out loud that he had heard about Vicar taking over as the deputy consul of Underdog City while he was gone. He continues to speak about how he even heard that the citizens who liked him had protested for Vicar to take over permanently, so when Set himself returned back to Underdog City, he was hoping that it would be great if they would work together. 
Vikir continues to stare at Set in silence, before placing his own glass of wine towards him. Telling Set that he looks forward to it, as they clink their glasses of wine together, hoping to be in each other's care, Vikir takes a peek at his own glass afterwards. He couldn't see Set's reflection in the glass at all, which meant that Set is dead and that a demon had possessed his dead body. Vikir then wondered if he should reveal this fact to everyone right here at the Grand Banquet. But he changes his mind, because if he does reveal that truth, then they would ask for Vikir to provide proper evidence first. So in order to do that, he needed to get away from this and gather more information first. As Set continues to ask Vikir about which order he was going to join, all Vikir could think of was that the smell of demons was really suffocating. Set continues to talk about how he thought that the Doberman Order's uniform was cool when he was younger but Osiris cuts him off, telling him that they haven't even finished eating yet he was already chatting away. With a slight red glow in his eyes, Osiris warns him to stop bothering Vikir with his small talk and to finish his dinner first. Set was taken aback by the sudden request from Osiris, but Vikir was glad, because thanks to him, he was free from the smell of demons. Now it was Hugo's turn to speak, he asks Vikir about the meal to which he responds that it was very good. Hugo was glad to hear that and informs Vikir that he has something he would like to discuss with him while he is at the main house, and orders him to visit the office later on. Vikir pauses to think about the sudden order but agrees to it anyway. The grand banquet had finally ended and Vikir was now roaming outside the main house. As he continued to walk by himself, Vikir felt tired after the five-hour-long dinner, and how he had to eat with all those powerful people. He had also heard about how the official paper for the academy entrance had arrived at the Baskerville clan. He concluded that that must be the reason why Hugo had summoned him to the office because of the academy entrance. But as he thought about this, a figure appeared high above, wielding a sword. All of a sudden, a huge wave of bloodhound-filled aura attacks were sent flying towards Vikir's back. Our boy was quick to notice it as the Baskerville's sixth technique, wondering if he should just overpower it. But as he gripped his own sword, he decided not to as he revealed his skill level as a mid-grade graduator. So he couldn't go beyond that. In response to the sudden attack, Vikir quickly turns around and answers back with the Baskerville's fourth technique. But it was enough to completely stop the sudden attack as it still launched towards him. So Vikir decides to take on the remaining attack by absorbing the rest of it with the River Styx's blessing in his aura. But before the sudden attack reaches him, it suddenly stops by itself leaving Vikir stunned as he gazes at the one who unleashed the attack. A huge laugh was heard from the figure standing above. It was revealed to be Boston, who was impressed by how much Vikir had grown up since there was a two-tier difference between their techniques and yet he had endured his attack. Boston immediately leaps down to Vikir, asking Dane if he was right about how his eyes didn't deceive him. Dane appears right behind Vikir, like that creepy uncle during family reunions, he tells Boston about how he couldn't believe that he had actually swung his sword in the main house, making him no different from the barbarians. Dane continues to scold Boston for attempted murder, such a barbaric thing to do, and if Hugo knew about it, then at the very least Boston would have been on probation for several months. But Boston was happy with his actions, telling Dane about how he could say such things about an uncle's love towards his nephew. He reveals that he had adjusted the attack so it would disappear right in front of Vikir so he wouldn't get hurt. Sensing that the trial was over, Vikir slowly places his sword back into its case while the uncles continue to argue with one another. After insulting each other's orders, Boston fires back with a personal attack, revealing that Dane was someone to beg to be saved when he gets a small cut on his belly. Dane retorted back that since Boston was so chunky all over, then his flesh wouldn't even get cut. The uncles decided to take action over words this time as each of them pulled out their own swords, declaring that whoever wins the duel between them, would get Vikir to join their orders. Seeing how their fight had evolved, Vikir immediately turns around to escape from them, thinking about how bothersome they were being. As he walked away from his uncles, he thought about how the attack from before wasn't that strong. The Seven Counts' strongest attack, the highest grade graduator's Baskerville sixth technique. Vikir was also the highest grade graduator but he know about the seventh technique. And if you were to add the River Styx's blessing and the demonic sword Beelzebub, then our boy was extremely confident that he could at least go up against two of the seven counts together. Nothing beats plot armor, but on the way home, he encounters the now group of triplets. Who stood in front of him this time? Instead of speaking, the triplets immediately went to their swords on their waists, drawing the blade out. Vikir sees their actions and activates his bloodhound eyes and his hand readied, 
thinking about how the triplets knew the difference between their powers. So he had no choice but to kill bloodhounds who bare their teeth without knowing their place. But what he thought would happen didn't happen at all. Instead all three of the triplets kneeled down in front of Vikir, with their swords pointed at their own feet. Looking at what they were doing, Vikir knew that their actions represented the pledge. It's a position that makes you vulnerable to a single press and your sword will penetrate through your foot. That means they're putting their life in the other person's hands. Seeing their sudden actions, Vikir could only ask them about what they were doing. All three triplets repeated the same words with the same facial expression. I want to pay off my debt. The first triplet explained that after being attacked by Vikir when he was nine, he began to fear him. The second triplet acknowledged Vikir when he hunted the Cerberus, while the last triplet was amazed with Vikir for when he had slain the troll. Finally, for their final reason was when Vikir went toe-to-toe -to -toe against the giant monster of the forest, Madame Eight Legs. That was the moment when all three of the triplets felt a sense of awe and reverence. So, on the day they had barely escaped with their lives, that was when the triplets decided then. That they will become the three spears of Vikir van Baskerville from today onwards. And so, the triplets asked Vikir to please become their master whom they, the bloodhounds, would serve forever. After revealing their true intentions, Vikir thought about the time before he regressed. These guys were the ones that had captured him when he ran away after being framed. The triplets were also known as Hugo's three spears. And Vikir knew that they were just bloodhounds who were carrying out their orders. But just because of that, his feelings towards them haven't disappeared. So he simply walks past the triplets without an answer, leaving them with a disappointed look on their faces. But before he left them completely, he told the triplets that he didn't need things like pledges and that they should discuss things like this next time since he was tired now. Vikir intended to use them as much as he wanted. He informs them that the fact that they were together, and what will happen in the future cannot be revealed. His words brought a smile to their faces as they shouted out understood. In unison together, after hearing their response, Vikir thought about how Set's body being taken over by the demons wasn't a variable he was expecting. So he needed to ask Cindy to investigate this thing quickly, because no matter what happens, he needed to kill the demon. But before that, he needed to do something else. The scene changes to show Barrymore's face filled with fear as Hugo's loud voice echoes throughout the room, asking Vikir about what he was doing right now. With a darkened expression on his face, Hugo tells Vikir to repeat himself. And so Vikir did, by asking about Miss Roxana, the first wife of Hugo who had passed. And the daughter that was born from him and Miss Roxana. Vikir wanted to know about Miss Penelope, the daughter that was taken away from Hugo and who died in the forest. Veins, hatred and bloodlust started to pour out from every inch of Hugo's face as he questioned Vikir about how he knew about his daughter's name. But our boy's face remains unfazed even after facing such a horrifying aura. Because this is the opening act to which his revenge will begin. Begin this part with the view of the main building of the Baskerville clan where the patriarch and main family stay. Hugo passes on an envelope across the table, telling Vikir about how they have received a notice from the academy. He reminds Vikir about their past promise from before, that he would enter the academy when the time comes. Reading the letter inside the envelope, Vikir could see that it was a notice from Colossio, a notice for the students of class 20. Looking at it, he was right in his thought, that this was the reason why Hugo had summoned him here. The largest educational institution that the Grand Empire Rock is facilitating, the academy called Colossio. If you manage to graduate from the academy, you would be able to start the elite course at the Imperial Palace or even a higher floor. Back in his past life, before the regression, Vikir had attended the academy as the triplet server and was in charge of handling all of their tedious tasks for them. Since he entered the academy with numerous scars on his face and had a limp, Vikir was scorned by the nobles from the academy. But in his current life, those bad memories of the academy didn't bother him now. Hugo wanted to know if the triplets, whom Vikir had asked to go with would be alright, he was also curious on whether there was anyone else beside them that he would like to take with him. Before answering Hugo's question, Vikir wanted to ask about something else. He recalled that two years ago, due to him going missing, Hugo had received a letter stating that he will obtain a huge benefit from the Morgue family, and that Vikir would be given a reward. So he asked Hugo if he was right, Hugo replies that he is and wanted to know what that something was that Vikir wanted. Vikir tells him that he wanted Hugo to share a story as the reward, which got Hugo's attention, seeing his reaction, Vikir takes it that he had permitted him to ask. So our boy, at point blank, 
asks Hugo about his dead wife and daughter, straight to his face. Vikir's question was horrifying enough to make Barrymore panic and tremble with fear as he heard what Vikir had requested from Hugo. Hugo, on the other hand, had taken a moment before asking Vikir about what he had just said to him. So our boy replies back, with no fear in his eyes, he asks Hugo about Ms. Roxana, the first wife who has passed. And the daughter that was born from Hugo and Ms. Roxana, Vikir wanted him to tell him about Miss Penelope as well. A whole mixture of emotions started to stir within the all-powerful Hugo, as his face was darkened, wondering how Vikir knew those names. He unleashed the bloodhound Red Fury eyes, scolding Vikir and wondering the reason behind his question. Hugo was going to be extremely furious if he found out that Vikir was asking out of petty curiosity. In a calm manner and with his hand across his heart, Vikir calmly tells Hugo that he needed to first hear his answer in order for him to reveal the reason behind the sudden questions. He assures Hugo, who was in an explosive angry state, that the questions were not due to mere curiosity. Hugo's thoughts about his first wife whom he met through an arranged marriage, and his eldest daughter who was kidnapped by the barbarians. That's all crucial information that Vikir needed in order to reveal Pomerian's existence to Hugo. There was also the hard-to-believe fairy tale that Barrymore had told Vikir about when he was much younger. The story about how Hugo was an affectionate family man who loved his first wife, Ms. Roxana, very much. But Vikir was sure that he couldn't let Hugo meet Pomerian based on that. This was something that he needed to check for himself. After hearing Vikir's reply to his question, Hugo continued to remain silent for some time. After some time had passed, he finally opened his mouth. Gripping his chest tightly and his face darkened to the point where you couldn't see his facial expression. The ice-cold bloodhound demon that everyone feared in the family, started to tell Vikir about how Roxana was the only darling who he loved with all his heart. And that his precious daughter, Penelope, was his most precious treasure. This sincere and lovable answer was enough to stun Vikir to the point that the artist had to draw him in another art style. Vikir couldn't believe that the word darling had actually come out from Hugo's mouth. Hugo continues on about his story, telling Vikir honestly that Roxana and him were not in an arranged marriage. He revealed the fact that Roxana was a commoner who had nothing. He could still remember the day that they first met clearly. It was love at first sight. Wow, I didn't expect Hugo to have a K-drama moment. Hearing the story from Hugo, Vikir could sense that he was going to start from the first time he met her. Hugo continues on about his past love story, revealing that his love with Roxana was very difficult. She had tried to distance herself from him because of her humble background, so Hugo decided to abandon everything and went with her. Whoa, turns out that Hugo was a hopeless romantic and gigachod. Because for her, Hugo was willing to throw away everything, not only his physical body but his soul too. Vikir interrupted Hugo as he was telling his story, he was grateful for sharing that with him but he wanted Hugo to go to the next point quickly. But Hugo interrupts Vikir, shouting at him with the word but, and continuing on with his love story, he tells Vikir that his love with Roxana was put to the test once again. In order to capture them, who were on the run, the Baskerville family had sent pursuers. For the sake of protecting Roxana, Hugo fought with his life on the line and with everything he had. They had walked a thorny path, covered with multiple attacks and dead bodies, was the path they had to walk where no one blessed their love. Hugo recalled that they had thought about giving up, but they persevered due to their love for each other. Akathut that was only the start to their harsh beginning, Hugo and Roxana managed to break through to their disagreeing parents and had gotten married. Hearing the sweet tale of Hugo's love story was enough for Barrymore to shed some tears, I feel you brother. And so, through Hugo's and Roxana's resolve, their precious daughter Penelope was born. His loving wife and daughter beside him, Hugo wanted to protect this happinesses that he obtained after through such much suffering and struggling. But this is where things start to get dark, after giving birth, Roxana's health started to deteriorate instantly, in the end, she left the world and left behind their young daughter Penelope. Thankfully, Penelope grew up to be a bright and charming child. She had inherited Hugo's strong mentality and Roxana's loving heart, and she had received love from all of the Baskervilles. Hugo was already happy enough to know that his Penelope was doing that well. But then a certain incident occurred, just the mere mention of it was enough for him to unleash his bloodhound aura and crush the corner of his seat. The incident was when Penelope, who went out for a walk, was captured by the Lokoko tribe. A bunch of questions flooded his mind as he investigated how this happened. How did those barbarians come into the middle of the Baskerville territory? How did they kidnap Penelope? 
Hugo's eyes were filled with rage as he couldn't figure it out back then. And until now, he couldn't find any trace of Penelope. Vikir's eyes started to glow as he listened closely to Hugo's story. With Penelope missing, Hugo used that as the justification to widen the Empire's region, that was when Hugo started to look for Penelope and to subjugate the barbarians. But after a while, Hugo felt that doing this alone was difficult so he increased the number of his wives through arranged marriages, and he started to mass-produce offsprings. And decades later, although stationed at the border, Hugo had created a powerful family that no one could look down on. That's how the Ironblood Baskerville family was born, Hugo's cold-blooded nest to restore the family and for the Empire's glory. But behind that cruel soul was a man that was hurt deeply due to the loss of the family that he had loved with all his heart. But so what? thought Vikir, he knew that all villains have a backstory, the evil deeds that they committed are all that remained. Vikir could only see Hugo as a heartless human being who mass-produced offspring and sent them to the battlefield. But still, he now understood how precious Roxana and Penelope were to him. And so, Hugo was done with his story, with a mad expression on his face after recalling his painful past. He now wanted to know Vikir's reason behind why he had asked about his wife and daughter. Before telling him the reason, Vikir took something out of his pocket and presented it onto the table before Hugo, telling him to take a look at it first. The moment he gazed at it, Hugo shouted out loud, recognizing what it was. He recognized the pendant as the one that he had made for Roxana, which was last seen on Penelope before her disappearance. Opening the pendant, he could see a tiny picture of his family portrait within it. Gazing at it, Hugo held his tears back or at least that's what I think. As Vikir turns to the door, he asks Hugo about what he would do if Miss Penelope's successor was alive. His question was enough to leave both old men stunned with their mouths wide open. As he walks closer to the doors, Vikir tells Hugo about Miss Penelope's daughter, revealing to Hugo that he has a granddaughter. As the doors to the room opened, a familiar sweet angel voice called out to her uncle. The moment she entered the room, Hugo's entire world was flipped upside down, and had turned from color to X-ray colors. Looking at Pomerian Kozali pulling onto Vikir's shirt, he recalls that she was the child from their previous meeting. This was when Vikir reveals to Hugo that he had lied to him, that while at the forest, there was a child that he met in the Lokoko tribe's region. And that she called the person who gave her the pendant as mommy. Hugo couldn't believe it, that this little girl had called his sweet precious daughter Penelope as mommy. His hands started to tremble as he held onto the pendant, while Pomerian still looked at him all scared. Vikir, on the other hand, was excited as his eyes glowed bright red, he wanted Hugo to be confused. He knew that Pomerian was a child whose blood is mixed with someone Hugo loves, and with something he despised. As Hugo stood in front of Pomerian, Vikir started to wonder if he could keep his composure in front of her. Looking closely at Pomerian this time, Hugo towers over her enough to cast a shadow onto the sweet little angel. He recalled that Vikir had found her in Lokoko, his eyes and demoners started to unleash the fearsome bloody bloodhound aura, questioning whether Pomerian was someone that was born from his daughter and a barbarian. Vikir tells him that it was true, his eyes were focused on Hugo completely, as he watches his shake with rage and despair. Hugo started to stretch his hand towards Pomerian, who could only stare at it as it came closer to her. Vikir was counting on this to lead to Hugo's ruin, because once he is, that is when his revenge will begin. We now turn to a sunny day in a beautiful park where the bright voice of laughter could be heard loudly in the area. Osiris, Vikir and Barrymore were standing side by side with one another as Hugo asks a question, is my beard that interesting? Is it fun pulling it? He was asking these questions to Pomerian who was playing with his beard, she even told him that Grandpapa's beard was dirty. The moment the word Grandpa left her mouth, Hugo started to ask Pomerian if she had really called him Grandpa. Osiris was the first to comment out loud that even though he hadn't lived for a long time, he had never been so surprised in his life. Barrymore, on the other hand, had lived for a long time but still he agrees with what Osiris had said. Meanwhile, Vikir was silent, he continued to look at Hugo and Pomerian, wondering what was going on. The Hugo that he knew of right now, the image he had of him in his mind, had just been brutally shattered into a million pieces. As Hugo covered his face after being called a grandpa, Tears started to flow out endlessly from his eyes, as he couldn't believe that the day he would be called a grandpa would come. Seeing Hugo's sudden reaction and crying face made Vikir stunned as he looked down. His world had started to flip as well and he wonders why the cold-hearted bloodhound known as Hugo Le Baskerville would have that kind of expression on his face. 
we now turn to when Vikir van Baskerville was 15 years old after regressing. As he stood in front of the all-powerful Hugo Le Baskerville, Vikir suddenly wondered about a certain question. Can he assassinate Hugo? The first answer to that question was impossible. When one reaches the level of Swordmaster, they obtain an unwavering mind. Because of that, Vikir couldn't even find an opening during Hugo's daily life. So he gave up on the thought of assassinating Hugo, and after many years, he found Pomerian. The daughter of Penelope, whom Hugo truly loved. The wave of emotions that would be felt when meeting Pomerian, could possibly affect the Swordmaster. With refined swordsmanship, Beelzebub and the Madam's poison, the possibility of assassinating Hugo increased as time passed. And today was supposed to be the cornerstone for Hugo's assassination. But as Vikir looks towards his target that he was planning to kill, he wonders why Hugo was laughing right now, as though he was happy. Seeing this side of Hugo, Vikir started to waver in his conviction to kill the man in front of him, while thinking why Hugo isn't confused. We return to the moment where Vikir introduced Pomerian as Penelope's daughter and Hugo's granddaughter. As the big man walked over to Pomerian, he wondered if she was truly his precious Penelope's daughter. As he stretched his hand towards Pomerian, his shadow could be seen within her eyes. Looking right at Hugo, she tells him that Penelope was her mommy's name, which causes Hugo to shudder for a moment as sweat drops appear on his face. Holding his rough hand with her tiny hands, Pomerian tells Hugo about how her mommy always said that she missed her daddy, and that she always kept looking at the necklace, all of these were things that she had remembered. Looking at Hugo with her innocent eyes, Pomerian asks him if he was her grandpa. Looking at her and hearing her question, Hugo's mind immediately turns to a past memory of when Penelope was alive and cheerful, he could hear her clear and joyful voice calling him father. The man known as the cold-hearted bloodhound of the Baskerville family, had to grit his teeth in order to hide what he was feeling. But it didn't work as he muttered out Penelope's name as he bends forward while trembling, catching Vikir's attention. The all-powerful man had finally broken down as tears started to flow endlessly from his eyes. He could only kneel in front of Pomerian, with his head down, he continued to cry out loud in front of everyone. The flashback ends as Barrymore tells Vikir thank you. He couldn't believe that he would get to see the Patriarch smiling like that right now, as it always seemed like a far-fetched dream of his. And it was all thanks to Vikir, hearing that, Vikir was confused about how the situation happened because of him. Hugo's smiling face, Pomerian being reunited with her grandpa, Barrymore seeing his dream come true, Osiris was even smiling himself. As though he was holding in his anger with his hand trembling, Vikir decides to let it go. Because right now, he didn't know that by standing before Hugo, who has so many openings. Vikir felt so helpless for some reason. The day soon turned to night as we returned to the place where Vikir was staying. He laid out flat on his bed, staring endlessly at the ceiling, pondering his thoughts about the events that had happened so far. Looking back, he started to think about the Hugo that he had remembered. In his past life where he was captured and faced Hugo, he shouted at him that he was innocent and wondered why he wasn't listening to him. Vikir wanted to know if Hugo was really going to blame him for all of the Baskerville's sins. But Hugo simply replied that he didn't want to listen to a sinner. Hugo even revealed that he knew about how Vikir was secretly communicating with a demon and had even kidnapped innocent children and offered them to the demon. But these were false accusations that Vikir tried to deny with all his might. But before he could speak of his innocence, Hugo swung his sword in a single swing, cutting off Vikir's tongue as he didn't want to be called by such a filthy thing like Vikir. He even calls Vikir trash as his bloodhound eyes glowed fiercely red. But our boy didn't give up, his eyes were still filled with anger and hatred for Hugo even after having his tongue cut off, the man who turned him into a sinner and executed him in the end. But in our present time, the young Vikir who was still laying down on his bed, was wondering why he was starting to hesitate to take revenge. As he lay there, a voice spoke out, telling him that it was rare for her to see such a lethargic expression on his face. Cindy had appeared at his window once again, dressed like Catwoman. Looking at his current state, she wonders why he had called for her, only to be just laying in bed. Vikir could only ask her about the reason why she was here. Cindy took out another report, telling Vikir that she had brought him what he requested. She slams the report right onto Vikir's face, reminding him that he had asked her to investigate Set Le Baskerville. As she sat on his bed, Cindy questions Vikir about why he looked like he lost everything. But since she was busy, she was just going to give him the report. Even after being slammed with a report on his face, Vikir remained silent. 
Sensing that something was definitely off, Cindy reports that she had just done a detailed investigation on Set La Baskerville. She found out that he has sponsored several orphanages under a fake identity. As a sponsor, it seems like he had taken responsibility for their adoption. But there was no information about the people who adopted the children, she couldn't even locate the children who were adopted too. Since Vikir mentioned that he was a demon, then the situation was bad. She knew the obvious reason behind why a demon would be kidnapping children. It was to use the children as sacrifices or food. She concluded that Set La Baskerville might be connected to Underdog City's missing children's case. Looking and reading through the report, Vikir concluded that he had missed this information. The fact that the current Set is a demon, means that the Set, whom Vikir had served in his previous life before his regression was also a demon. Vikir also figured out that the person who gave the information that Hugo was going to frame and kill him with was this a-hole. A past memory of when Set was visiting Vikir in prison was seen, he hid his face behind his hand, calling Vikir pitiful. Because in order for Hugo to frame him for all of Baskerville's sins, he was going to hasten his execution. With a creepy smile across his face, Set lies about how he was so sad that he couldn't help him. Anger immediately arose in Vikir's face as he placed the pieces together from his previous life and now. He couldn't believe it. We now turn to a young boy, asking the Sir beside him about where they were. The man holding the lantern introduces the place they were at as the young boy's new home, which startles the kid. He looked around all nervous, saying that the headmaster had mentioned that he had been adopted into a good family, but looking at what was in front of him was simply a cave. It turns out that the man was Set La Baskerville, who tells the young boy that there seems to be a misunderstanding. As his appearance started to change, Set tells the young boy that the cave isn't the house he'll be staying in, but the place he will be going to. Set's appearance had completely changed as the young boy looked at him with fear in his eyes and confusion everywhere. Set's appearance had completely transformed into a demonic being, with a single eye in the center and sharp fangs all around with tentacles. Ew just ew, the young boy could only stare and do nothing as tears filled his eyes, his last word was calling out for his mommy, as Set devoured him completely, leaving behind only blood and the shoes that the young boy wore previously. As he regains his human form, Set could only smile and mention that children sure are the tastiest. Set licks the blood off his face, smiling as though he was turned on by eating kids. After all, he couldn't help himself. It turns out that this was no longer Set La Baskerville, but actually a being who was a part of the demon's ten elite corpses, the tenth corpse, known as Andromalius. Thanks for watching the latest part from the voice of Manwa. Subscribe for more content and don't forget to comment below what you want to see in the future. Like and share for more.